Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the... Oh, sorry, Senator Cash. No, I seek leave to make a statement regarding an absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Thank you. Cash. And I advise the Senate that Senator Birmingham will be absent from the Senate today for personal reasons, and in his absence I will be the acting leader of the opposition. Thank in you, Senator Senate. Cash. I call the clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. And I call the clerk to call on business. Government business order of the day number one, Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2022, further consideration. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, uh, President. I move that this bill be now read a third time. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to aged care, health and aged care pricing and information sharing in relation to veterans and military rehabilitation and compensation and for related purposes. Government business notice of motion number one, standing in the name of the Assistant Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator McCarthy and Senators Dodson and Stewart, relating to the passing of Archie Roach. Senator McCarthy. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I move the motion. You have the call. Mr Deputy President, Archie Roach didn't just make music. He gave an enduring voice to the hurt and hope felt by a generation of Australians. It's a voice that will remain etched in the minds of many Australians and also the consciousness of this country. Roach was born at the Framingham Aboriginal Mission in Victoria. He was removed from his family at a young age as part of the Stolen Generations. He was separated from his mother, a Gunditjmara woman, and his father, a Bunjalung woman, a Bunjalung man from New South Wales. Unk passed through several foster homes before he was finally settled with the Cox family. He acknowledged this family as having taken care of him well. He learned the basics of keyboard and guitar from his foster sister, Mary Cox. Uncle was too young to understand his situation, like many other members of the Stolen Generations, and he was left to assume that biological parents of his had already passed away. But the truth about his forced removal from his family was discovered when he was a teenager in a letter from a sister he didn't know that he had. It brought news of the very recent death of his mother. The revelation further complicated issues in mental health, identity and belonging, and is understood to have contributed as to why he fell into the streets with alcohol and other issues and periods of homelessness. And it's these stories of struggle, of finding his sense of self and identity, that he dedicated his life in song and story. And while living on the streets, Uncle met Ruby Hunter, a Nurrinjeri woman from South Australia, and he credits her as his saviour and his sounding board. She was also a talented musician and a member of the Stolen Generations. And I know at one point she apparently saw Uncle in the studio audience on the Happy Hammond show when they were both kids. 
and said to her foster mum, I'm going to marry that boy one day. And so she did. They were partners in life and music for over three decades. Uncle was reluctant to make his first album, but it was dear Ruby who encouraged him to pursue the challenge. And she told him, it's not all about you, you know. How many blackfellas you reckon get to record an album? They were soulmates and they embarked on a journey of healing through music. Years later, when they were married with a family of their own, their house would remain open to disadvantaged young people in need of the support they themselves have found in each other. He brought, people, he brought people together through his storytelling and music, and I guess in some respects uh, held up a mirror to our country, a mirror that still is there and continues to be there because his songs are there and continue to be there. The last time I saw Uncle was before COVID, really, um, here in Canberra. And he performed here, and it was so good to see him. And I think then I realised uh, just how much of a journey it still had been for him since Aunty Ruby had passed away. And it took him a while to get back on his feet and back out singing after she passed. But he was there, singing strong here on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. And despite all of that, the hurt, the struggles, the pain, he was still reaching out to all of us in the audience, all of us who came to listen to him sing, reminding us that look out for others. You don't know the footsteps and the journey that other people have walked. And no matter how difficult your road, always look out for others. And that was a message I found firmly stayed with me throughout my life in knowing him. And I think of his family and his children in particular and I, and I say thank you uh, for sharing him with us, with the broader First Nations community, with Australia, with the world. And I just want to finish with the song Took the Children Away, Mr Deputy President, which resonated across Australia and internationally. Just one song, like all of his songs, telling the stories of pain, but also incredibly of hope and healing coming from the stolen generations. And he reflected in the opening of the song, this story's right, this story's true, I would not tell lies to you. Like the promises they did not keep and how they fenced us in like sheep. Said to us, come take our hand, sent us off to mission land taught us to read, to write and pray. Then they took the children away. They took the children away. Snatched from their mother's breast, said this for the best, took them away. The powerful messages and music of uncle put into words and articulated that familiar feeling of heartbreak, loss, disempowerment and also hope. I urge the Senate to play his songs, urge senators to play his songs. And let's not just feel sadness, but let's celebrate an incredible man, a wonderful family, and just give thanks to the way that he held the stories of our people and still sang with hope about the future. Thank you, Uncle. Mm -hmm. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Deputy President, my apologies. Um, before I begin, uh, I'd like to request that uh, Senator Cox and my name go on the um, condolence motion as co-sponsors. Senator McCarthy, are you happy with that? Y yes, Mr Deputy President. We spoke last night. More than happy. Yep. Thank Please you. Please continue. Thank you. Uh, 
the silence across this nation is deafening uh, from the passing of a beautiful soul, a beautiful uncle, a beautiful grandfather, father, brother, son, of Gundichamara, of Japarung, of Karei Warung, of my people. Framlingham Mission is where Uncle Archie came from. And it was tough on Framlingham Mission in those days. Our people were given rations. Our people were treated like animals on mission reserves around this country. And Uncle Archie Roach was a baby on Framlingham Mission where he was born, where he was treated like an animal because of the colour of his skin. He was disrespected by the society he lived in. He was taunted with racism most of his life. But he's fighting Gunichamara and he got through those difficult times at Framlingham Mission, where my grandmothers grew up, where my grandmothers come from, where my grandmothers were a part of Uncle Archie's care and love. He was stolen from Framlingham Mission. He was a stolen Aboriginal child in this country. He wrote songs about being stolen that everybody listens to. They love putting on Uncle Archie's music, his healing, his soulful music. The story behind the man and the song goes so much far deeper than putting on his CD or turning on the radio. His story in song was a call to this nation to stop stealing our babies. Because his babies were, almost, were also at risk of being stolen. His two beautiful sons, Amos and Eben, who I've seen grow up with beautiful love, care from community and from his beautiful parents, Uncle Archie and Aunty Ruby. They were a dynamite couple when I was growing up in Fitzroy. Everyone loved Uncle Archie and Aunty Ruby. And he'd sing in the park with the parkies with his guitar. He even sang at my 21st with Aunty Ruby because his family, he wasn't that famous when he played at my 21st, but I'll claim it. And I just hope that, you know, a condolence motion also means that people are listening to the heartache and the pain that this man endured all his life. And he turned that around, he put it into words of music and song to share with the rest of the country to learn and to heal from. Aunty Ruby was his, his backbone. And when she passed, a piece of Uncle Archie went with her. They were inseparable. I just want to pay my respects to Arnie Diane and, and Arnie Myrtle. Arnie Myrtle still lives in the public housing unit in Collingwood. Archie's sister 
still struggles with the day-to-day -day life of being black in this country. So long, Uncle Archie's family aren't immune to how this country treats First Nations people. And I know Uncle Archie was proud of me getting into the Victorian Senate and me getting in here. I know that because he told me. I know that because I'm still connected to his boys. And the intergenerational trauma from being stolen from your mother when you are four years of age never, ever ends. So the symptoms that you all call issues, Aboriginal issues, they are symptoms of colonisation. And stealing children was part of the plan to colonise this country. So we could lose our language, so we could lose our identity, so we could lose our connection to country, so we can lose our connection to totem, to song dance. I pay my respects to the absolute resilience and warrior man Uncle Archie was and still is. And next time you put on Uncle Archie's music, remember his story. And remember his story is happening today. And it'll happen tomorrow. And it'll happen the next day. Unless everyone in this chamber is willing to change that, it will continue forever. So no more stealing children. Let's ensure that Uncle Archie's legacy and fight didn't go unheard. Let's continue his legacy to ensure that no more children are stolen from their mother's arms in this country. Thank you. Senator Dodson. Deputy Speaker and uh, President, um, and let me congratulate you, and I haven't had that chance to in your esteemed position. Thank you. Uh, Archie Roach touched the lives of so many people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. I dubbed him the poet warrior of our nation for his songs, his sound and his integrity. His artistic talent would always be greater and more enduring than the efforts of any orator. His haunting lyrics are the work of a modern poet laureate. Archie was a special storyteller and a captivating performer. His voice expressed his story so powerfully. When I listen to his songs, I hear the dimensions of his life and his experiences, and I'm always moved. In that voice that transports me when I listen to in his songs to places all over, to stories, to our country and its past, to hard times, to loss, but also to hope. Such is the power of his great gift to us all. This great and powerful gift, Archie's voice telling those stories in his songs, will only grow more relevant and more powerful as time goes on. They are songs that have been the soundtrack of our lives, to key moments and memories, and have in that way become part of us and our stories. It is difficult to express how important an impact that is, and because of it, he will never be forgotten and he will never be truly gone. We will always play his music and share his songs and remember and think of Archie. 
and the great impact and lasting impact he has had on us and on our country. We all know the words, the melody, the rhythm of what may be his best work known to us. They took the children away. He himself was taken away in 1959 at the age of three from his biological parents who were living at Framlingham as Senator the Thorpe has mentioned in Victoria. <clears throat> no wonder he was able to write with such depth of feeling, such empathy and understanding the lyrics to those words of they took the children away. In a song about Melbourne-born Aboriginal man Russell Moore, who died just after a year, about a year ago, in a Florida jail. And during the Royal Commission, we tried to get Russell and the American authorities to return him to this country. We were unsuccessful in our efforts. Russell was a member of the Stolen Generation. He had served 30 years in jail before his death, having been convicted of murder, robbery and sexual assault. An, Aboriginal law an Australian lawyer, Richard Burke, who lives and practices in Florida, was a tireless advocate for Russell Moore to be transferred to his home country here in Australia. Russell Moore's birth mother, Beverly Wyman from Swan Hill, also spent many years campaigning for her son to be returned to Australia until her death in 2017. Take the children away was Archie's tribute and lament. On this day of remembrance and mourning, I want to quote just a few lines. I quote, his one true mother who'd searched in vain for her son she never thought she'd see again. She received a phone call from Florida. They found her son and more bad news from Mandarin. Hello, Russell. This is your mother calling. Please forgive me. I cannot stop the tears from falling. You come from this land and the sun above, and always remember the strength of your mother's love. They took you there when you were five, and now you're in some jail trying to survive. And if the truth be told, when all has testified, another crime committed here was genocide. Her own memories of Archie Roach, my own memories of Archie Roach are focused back in my home country in Broome. I remember sitting under a bow shed at my home with Archie. And with us was Mr Bill Johnson, the late British actor, Pete Fossilswaite. Archie and Pete had been on a journey of discovery in the Kimberley. They had camped out in the desert with the Ngura native title claimants and witnessed the senior leaders painting a huge canvas depicting their desert country. At night, the elders sang the songs of that country and its significance. A huge experience for both Pete and Archie at the time. They walked across the old Fitzroy River at Fitzroy Crossing and heard the stories of Jundamara, the famous Bunaba warrior, and his deeds against the encroaching pastoralists and the police posses out to kill him because he had shot one of them. These were the stories of the killing times in the Kimberley being told to Archie and Pete. They were travelling, their travelling took them after meeting the in Perth with Bill and his family, and learning of the brutal murder of Bill's adopted Aboriginal son, Louis St John Johnson, by British backpackers who used a vehicle instead of a horse in the killing. Bill and Pete had been friends together in England and had accidentally met in, Victoria, in uh, Perth when Pete was out here 
doing a play. We're all working on a documentary called Lian Ngan, how the two stories of our encounters with each other might become as one and free us from our ignorance, our fears and our prejudices. Trying to expose truth about events in our historical and contemporary relationships. We involve the AFL legend, Michael Long, and his reflections upon his courageous walk from Melbourne to Canberra. Michael had attended so many funerals and so many sorry days, and he put the question to Prime Minister Howard, where is the love for my people, Prime Minister? Archie had composed another, yet another song for the documentary. It was Lian Ngan. He sang it for us. Its underpinning plea was that we come together because we are already too far apart. As on many occasions when Archie sang, there was not a dry eye in that location. Again, allow me the indulgence of quoting a few lines from the lyrics of Lian Ngan. Where the forest meets the plain, where the desert meets the rain, where the rivers meet the sea, you and me, you and me, Lian Ngan. Oh, we've got to make a start, Lian Ngan, because we've been too far apart, Lian Ngan, Lian Ngan. Mend all those broken hearts. Life is sour, life is sweet, and our stories seldom meet, but I believe the time has come to be one, to be one. How tragic that Archie passed away so young, just 66 years old. Not just another premature death of an Aboriginal person, gone is a wonderful, creative spirit. Gone is a great storyteller who knew how to touch the hearts and the souls, the consciousness of our nation. And how those words of Archie and Lian Ngan have a special resonance now as we move towards implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Archie already believed the time had come to be one, to be one. The generosity embedded in the Uluru Statement is matched by the readiness of Archie Roach to understand, to stimulate, to lift us up to a better place. Kalia, my friend. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I was heartbroken to learn of the passing of Gunditjmara, Kira Warong Jabarung, Bunjalong senior elder, songman and storyteller Archie Roach. And for a moment in time, uh, time stood still on Saturday evening when I got the news. Sorry, where are you? I want to indulge the Senate with just a little bit of information and, and honour um, Senator Thorpe, Senator McCarthy, Senator Dodson's words as well. Archie Roach was born in central Victoria in a small town on the 8th of January 1956. He was the youngest of seven siblings and his mother was Nellie Austin, a Gunditjmara woman from southwest Victoria. His father was Archie Roach Senior, a Bundjalung man from the north coast of New South Wales. At only four years old, our young Uncle Archie, along with his two sisters, were forcibly removed from their parents. And as Senator Thorpe says, and I echo this, was stolen from his parents. Uncle Archie was in the child protection system by the state and into foster care with Scottish immigrants. At the age of 14, Uncle Archie found out about his First Nations heritage through a letter from his sister. Upon learning this, he left his foster family to find his real family. Uncle Archie spent years travelling and living on the streets. And while spending some time in Adelaide at the Salvation Army People's Palace, he met the wonderful and beautiful woman, Annie Ruby Hunter. Annie Ruby was also a member 
of a stolen generation. And together they forged a life of music, raised a family with many children of their own, including their son Amos, Eben, foster children Chris, Arthur and Terence. And they also supported many young people over the years. Uncle Archie's son released a statement over the weekend saying how proud they were of everything their dad achieved in his remarkable life. He was a healer and a unifying voice, force. His music brought people together. Uncle Archie was a songman, a guitarist and a writer. He had a rich and extensive career which spanned nine albums, a soundtrack, compilations, a children's storybook about stolen generations, a memoir and a poetry book. Over 25 years ago, Uncle Archie wrote and released his debut album, Charcoal Lane, which included his story, Took the Children Away. Took the Children Away shed the light on the impact for First Nations children who were forcibly removed and deliberately taken from their parents by police, governments and church missions. His song received an International Human Rights Achievement Award the first time the award has ever been bestowed on a songwriter, and well deserved. Uncle Archie was the voice of Stolen Generations, and in 2002 he wrote this. My recent bouts of illness, I'm sure, are a result of the pain being removed from my family at a young age, and more recently the loss of someone I love so dearly. But pain can also bring about change in one's life for the better. We can choose to ignore the pain until it becomes unbearable, or we can do something about it. I can relate to the words Uncle Archie sang in his song Took the Children Away through my own family's history as members of the Stolen Generation, and in fact, five generations of Stolen Generation. His music represented vibrational healing for First Nations people. And although our pain is sometimes so unsurmountable, pain that is unable to be put into words, Uncle Archie put that pain into song and into music which brought it to a whole another level. His words were part of the healing journey for lots of Stolen Generations peoples, and they have been many conversations I've had over the years with my elders. In 2008, Uncle Archie performed the Took the Children Away song in Federation Square after former Prime Minister Rudd delivered the national apology to the Stolen Generations. This song was so powerful for so many. It was the cornerstone of what is truth-telling of this nation and amplified the apology. We saw a First Nations man be able to give his own personal recollection and story that enabled the voice for so many across this nation. And this remains true right up until today. We can still see children being removed today, as Senator Thorpe has already mentioned, which is the ongoing legacy of colonialism in this country. The apology was only one part of it, and we still have so much work to do. Uncle Archie was a recognised leader in the community, and in 2014 he established the Archie Roach Foundation to nurture meaningful and life-changing opportunities for First Nations artists. The foundation seeks to walk alongside those working in the arts and young people heading down the wrong track to support them to be the best they can be. Two years ago, Uncle Archie launched the Archie Roach Stolen Generation Educational Resources, a free package for educational support materials developed by First Nations curriculum writers to teach young Australians about Indigenous Australia, cultural identity and the Stolen Generations. I want to also pay tribute to the important work Uncle Archie did in the drug and alcohol space. Uncle Archie's own personal recovery from alcohol alcoholism was his story, and he shared that story. It was a symbol of the pain and the disconnect from culture that he felt acutely. Becoming the patron of the Western Regional Alcohol and Drug Centre, Uncle Archie reflected, and he said these words. Recovering from alcoholism is a part of my story, he said. It's so important for people with alcohol and drug problems to have a service like Wayrad that can, you can access for help. Rehab, as well as music, saved my life. Speaking about the foundation, Uncle Archie also said, the foundation is a way for me to give back, to pass on what's been given to me from people I've met on my journey who have pointed me in a different direction 
to a better way of life and understanding towards freedom. I hope to be a signpost for others to walk alongside and empower them to tell their story through the arts and to point them in a deadly direction, in particular young people within the youth justice system. Together we'll fly. Uncle Archie was a once-in-a-lifetime person whose legacy touched so many. We remember and recognise his contribution, not just in regards to music, but also in regards to his contribution across First Nations communities across Australia. His contribution is in important com community conversations, and it wasn't just his music, his song, his poetry. It was merely just his presence that people felt. Rest in power, Uncle. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Senator Pocock, is she here? No? Okay. Uh, yes. Oh, you are? Sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No one moved. I, my apologies. Hello, Senator Pocock. Hello. I'm sorry. This that was Senator Cox. My apologies. <laughs> I'm sorry. I haven't got my glasses on. You caught me. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Senator Stewart. My apologies. Thank you, Acting Deputy uh, President. It is with deep sadness that I rise to speak on the passing of Uncle Archie. A nation suffered a profound loss with the passing of Gundi Jamara and Bunjalan senior elder Uncle Archie Roach. I had the privilege of speaking with his family over the weekend to offer the heartfelt condolences from my mob to his. And in doing that, I got to hear how much they loved and adored him. I want to thank his family for generously sharing such an incredible human with the world and offer again my sincerest condolences. I was very fortunate to witness one of, the last, one of his last performances earlier early this year at the Treaty Day out in Shepparton. As soon as he was on stage for his set, the entire crowd moved towards the stage so they wouldn't miss a moment of his words. A beautiful thing to bear witness to. Uncle Archie was a truth teller, activist and healer. He had a uniquely articulate way of being able to tell the difficult truths of our nation in a way that people could really hear feel and understand. His music has been described as being built on pain but driven by hope. How very true. Uncle Archie's pain was born out of being a stolen generation survivor. He gave voice to so many survivors with his music. It's heartbreaking to know that he was stolen so young that he has no memory of his mother and he never got to see her again before she passed. My heart smiles when I think of him being reunited and singing again with his great love, Aunty Ruby Hunter. And my heart sings to know that he will finally be reunited with his father and ha have unlimited moments to embrace his mother in the dreaming. There are many people who aspire to contribute to our society in a way that leaves it in a better place than when they got here. But very few really achieve this. Our country is a much better place thanks to, the wi thanks to his wisdom and music. Our country is a much better place thanks to Uncle Archie. And thank you seems so inadequate in comparison to what you gave all of us, but I've been told that you didn't like a, be you didn't like a fuss being made over you. You were happy with just a cuppa and a Monte Carlo biscuit, so I'll say thanks by having a cuppa and a bicky for you today, Uncle. May your legacy live on forever. Rest in power, Uncle Archie Roach. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Senator Pocock. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President, and I note this is not my first speech. Um, I rise today to join with so many other Australians to reflect on and honour the extraordinary legacy of Archie Roach and to add my condolences to Archie's loved ones. I was so sad to hear of Archie's passing last week. He was a proud senior elder, a remarkable singer, songwriter and a storyteller, and a loving partner, father and, and foster father. For me and my family and community, Archie's music was a gift. It provided the soundtrack to our lives, from the first album, Charcoal Lane, to his most recent album, Dancing With My Spirit, and every album and song in between. But Archie's music was much more than a soundtrack. It's a truth-telling, and it was a, culture, a cultural gift of music which cut through to tell us the truth in a way that sometimes books and academic reading and history doesn't. Seeing Uncle Archie and Auntie Ruby perform together was a is a powerful memory. It changed me. 
There are many ways to learn the truth. Art and music are so important to this, and Uncle Archie's gifts were rich and deep. He's a truth teller. His music and stories brought people across Australia to understand First Nations history and culture, including the ongoing and devastating impacts of colonisation. Through his songs, Archie provided a voice to First Nations people across the country. Of course, his song, Took the Children Away, taught us all so much and will always be with me as a heart-wrenching recollection of his deep personal experience and the history of our long stolen generations. And as, this, as my colleagues Lydia and Dorinda have talked about and others have said, such an important memory and truth-telling for our country. Archie was an inspiration to so many Australians. In an interview with The Guardian in 2019, Archie said, you can reach the darkest point in our life and come back, and come back good. This quote reflects his storytelling, which came from a place of deep colonial trauma and its legacy, but often had a message of peace and healing. Archie will be remembered by Australians for his courage, for his clarity, for his artistry in telling his own story and being a voice to the experiences of First Nations people across our country, indeed all Australians, a teacher, an artist, and as Dorinda said, a healer. Rest in peace and in power, Archie. My condolences to your family. Thank you for lending him to all of us for all of those years. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I also rise to pay tribute to the memory and the life of Uncle Archie Roach. I give my sincere condolences to his family and thank them for giving us permission to use his name so that we may preserve and continue his legacy. Unlike some of the other speakers in this motion, I did not have the privilege of knowing Uncle Archie personally, but I saw him and his late wife Ruby Hunter perform on many occasions uh, at the Woodford Folk Festival, the Blues Festival, uh, countless pubs and other festivals, uh, and for the final time, probably about 12, 18 months ago, at the Home of the Arts facility on the Gold Coast. Um, I was actually just talking with Senator McAllister. We think that one of the first times each of us saw Archie perform was at the Woodford Folk Festival, Folk Festival many years ago. Um, every one of those performances that I had the privilege of seeing was memorable, um, obviously for the music, obviously for the soul, obviously for the stories, but also for the wry humour that Uncle Archie often contributed in between songs. And that last time that my family and I saw him perform at uh, the Gold Coast was a very memorable occasion. Any of you who have had the opportunity to go to the Home of the Arts will know that there's a, an outdoor amphitheatre. Uh, and on a beautiful, I think it was a spring night, I can't exactly remember what time of year, it was a beautiful setting to be outdoors listening to Archie play some of those songs that we all knew so well. Uh, with my whole family in attendance. And that particular event was one of the first times that a major venue at the Gold Coast had uh, put on a show that contained 100% uh, First Nations performers. So Archie was the headline act, as he very much deserved, uh, but some of the other, some other emerging First Nations artists and some stars in their own right, like Jessica Malboy, also performed. So I really enjoyed the night, as did my wife, but most importantly, so did our kids. Uncle Archie's songs have touched the hearts and souls of audiences around the world. A Gunnidjmara and Bunjalung man whose voice and message has resonated across nations and generations. His beautiful voice and storytelling articulated the injustices inflicted on Australia's First Nations peoples, but also the hope uh, for a better future uh, for those peoples, something that I know all of us want to see and want to contribute to. As a member of the Stolen Generation, Uncle Archie knew of these injustices all too well. As other speakers have noted, uh, later in life he wrote the song that we all know so well, Took the Children Away. Of course, it's wrong to only focus on one song of Uncle Archie's because there were so many great songs, but probably that is the one uh, that he became best known for in the wider community. And in that song he wrote, Snatched from their mother's breast, said this is for the best. Uh, something that encapsulated the simply wrong attitude uh, that carried the day around that policy in its days. I was again reflecting on this song, and probably more than any conversation in our own home or at school, it was this song that truly taught my own children the heartbreak and sorrow of the stolen generation and caused them to ask the question we should all ask ourselves, how on earth could this possibly have happened? 
I remember the conversations with my kids, particularly my daughter, the younger of our two children, about the song, about what it was about, about what had happened uh, and about what we needed to do uh, to repair the damage and repair the heartbreak uh, that was caused to so many people as a result of that policy. Archie Roach was placed in a children's home and a series of foster homes until he finally found a family he could call home. Uncle Archie was 14 years old when he received a letter about the death of his mother. Until that day, he didn't know he had a family or who they were. Shocked and angry, he ran away from home at 15, first to Sydney, then to the streets of Adelaide and Melbourne, always searching for his family and his identity, something that has happened to too many First Nations people in our country. But it was while he was in Adelaide that he met his soulmate, the remarkable Ruby Hunter, and again, I remember in my 20s, and I'm sure you were there, Senator McAllister, uh, seeing many concerts where the two of them performed. And uh, while each was an unbelievable performer in their own right, to see the two of them on stage or on an album uh, contributing, complementing each other, bringing different tones, um, different emotions, was one of the most amazing, I think, double acts Australian music has ever seen. Um, it was such a privilege to ever get to see the two of them perform together. Uncle Archie was a pioneer of First Nations music. He was the voice of a generation. He was a singer, a poet and a truth teller. His music embodies respect for all and demonstrated an artful commitment to truth telling well before that approach was accepted by mainstream Australia. Fortunately, his legacy, his legacy will live on in his music and the footsteps he left on our country and on our hearts. Rest easy in the dreaming united with your ruby again, Vale Uncle Archie Roach. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Acting President, Acting Deputy President. I join with uh, my fellow senators in honouring the life of Archie Roach AM and in doing so I acknowledge that his family has given all of us permission um, to say his name and to celebrate his life. I want to acknowledge the other very fine contributions in the chamber today, including from uh, Indigenous sen senators, and I particularly want to acknowledge the very deep friendship that Archie Roach and Senator Dodson shared. I'm also speaking uh, uh, as the Shadow Minister representing the Shadow Minister for uh, the Arts in this place as well. And I do say that there are few Indigenous Australians who have made a greater contribution to Australian music than Archie Roach. In the words of his great friend, the, English, the late English actor Pete Thosselway, Apostlethwaite, he said, Archie, a stolen child himself, is one of the finest artists of his generation and a guiding light for the Indigenous struggle for recognition and reconciliation. He's been called the Aboriginal William Blake. His music sticks in the soul. It gets deep inside you. These songs are a reaffirmation of identity, country, beliefs and spirit. And as Archie himself says, they're about how no one listened to our recommendations on stolen kids or people dying in jails. And so it continues, but we are still watching and constantly taking note. Archie Roach, Roach's music sticks and will continue to stick in the soul of Australians. Uh, it was his music which helped him to survive the trauma of being forcibly removed from his family at the age of two. Uh, through music, he was able to forgive and heal. He said, I believe in redemption and I believe in forgiveness, uh, both important aspects of love, because I've experienced both. Archie Roach was a wonderful musician, a wonderful artist, an incredible storyteller, and also a very significant mentor, including uh, two others who had suffered from the impacts of alcohol. He died far too young at only 66 years of age, 
but his music will live on in the hearts and souls of all Australians. I offer my heartfelt condolences to all of Archie's colleagues and friends and, of course, to his entire family, especially Amos and Eben, Archie's sons, and Chris, Arthur and Terence, Archie's foster children. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator, I'm sorry, we've got a conflict here. Senator <laughs> Rice. Senator, Thank you. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, I wanted to rise to add my voice to these condolences about the loss of Uncle Archie, Gunditjmara, Jabarang, Giruang, Bunjalung man. And I wanted to just give my thanks, Uncle Archie, for your life, your inspiration, your work for First Nations justice, your work as a storyteller and a truth teller, and your work sharing those stories and those truths with so with all of Australia and so many of us that were touched by, by those stories and those truths. And I want to send my condolences to Uncle Archie's family, to his friends and to everybody who has been touched by his life and his work. His stories and his truth resonated with so many of us. For me, as a Melbourne person from Archie Roach's debut album of Charcoal Lane in 1990. His music was sort of a backdrop to our lives. Um, it was part of the soundtrack of people and communities working for First Nations justice. Um, I was actually quite a latecomer in listening to and knowing his music and getting to know what he was sharing with us. But I will, the moment I will never forget will be Federation Square on the 14th of February 2008 where the apology for the stolen generations occurred here in Canberra. I was in Federation Square and I remember it being a hot afternoon and listening to Uncle Archie singing, They Took the Children Away. It was just so moving and this huge crowd of people with Federation Square were just touched to the heart about, what, about the truths that he was singing about. And he dedicated his performance at Federation Square to the mother he was separated from and to his own children. He said, this brings a new start in life for us the way it should have been, this apology to the stolen generations. So I followed his career and his music more closely from then on. Um, a distant friend, however, actually it was who gave me a copy of his autobiography in, I think it was soon after it was published in, in 2019. It was, probably early, mid-2020, and she sent it to me and said, I just think you'd enjoy this. And this was soon after the loss of my wife, Penny. And I did. I, it just moved me so much to read his stories of resilience, everything he had been through, and yet the hope and the, the goodness that he was bringing to the world. And the quote that, my, that um, Senator um, Pocock just shared with us, just shared with us of that you can reach the darkest point in your life and come back and come back good. And that was what I think so many people got from his music and from his autobiography. And certainly for me, it was this sense of you can get through these darkest times and continue on and to be able to continue to be working with honesty and to be sharing sharing that resilience and to be working for, for justice together. And it was soon after getting that, um, a copy of that, I think it was in April last year, um, it was the last time I heard Uncle Archie, Archie perform at the Werribee Cultural Centre um, on his, uh, sharing his music with us then. And what really came home to me then was just how his work just did bring people together. And in fact, you know, there's a microcosm my whole family was there. Everybody had wanted to join together and to go to this performance in Werribee. So from my then 89-year-old mother and I think all of my siblings who came together to that, at that concert. And again, everybody was just so moved. Obviously, the legacy of his life is for us to continue doing the work that he was doing, to continue sharing those stories, to continue sharing those truths and to continue working for justice, to acknowledge the pain, the hurt, the suffering, the genocide that has been going on for our First Nations peoples for over 200 years and to commit ourselves to be 
ending that, uh, those awful practices, to, be, to stop taking the children away and to be working until our First Nations peoples have all of the rights, there is justice, there is, and that we have treaties with our First Nations peoples to continue that work that his, his songs and his life were such a, powerful, such a powerful part of. So thank you, Uncle Archie. May you rest in peace and in power. Thank you, Senator Ross. Senator Pratt. My family cried the day Archie Roach died. This is despite the fact that, unlike others here, we had never met him. But we cried because he meant so much to us as individuals and he helped us as a family know ourselves better as Australians. To know ourselves better in a way that was profoundly meaningful to us as a family and I really believe also to us as a nation. Our country is built on stories and from stories, stories that help us know who we are as a nation and as a people. And I guess the story of the stolen generation for an Australian like me was not a story I knew or understood in the same way that my colleagues here as First uh, Nations Australians know from their own lives and the lives of their um, kin and families. But for me, Archie Roach opened up the ability, the visibility of First Nations stories about mission life about racism, about dislocation, institutionalised racism. We, found, we saw that visibility and capacity to talk as an Australian people and, in my case, as a family about the experiences of First Nations people uh, as a, uh, within our country but also for our friends and family that we knew who we'd been unable to you know, easily open up a way of talking about these issues. So Archie Roach's uh, Take the Children Away story is of course a children's storybook and I've been able to teach my son in a way that he understands in a way that I was deprived of as a child in knowing our nation's history about the truth of stolen generations. His music showed us immense suffering over our 200 years of colonial history and a very personal journey of suffering and resilience through this. He did this in a way that has brought us all closer together as a nation. It's not a black armband version of history at, at all. These are stories of resilience that are a source of great pride uh, for our nation. Stories of resilience, delight and joy in lifting the visibility of uh, First Nations people's lives. You know, Archie Roach sang of boxing, country and land, homelessness, intergenerations, family, racism, colonial dispossession, removal from country, but most of all, he also spoke of love. Their First Nations stories that resonated with us all as a nation and speak to who we are. So as we move towards, um, I hope, voice, treaty and truth, I reflect on Archie Roach's words when he speaks of dark times and how you can come back good. But that is something I reflect on 
as a nation, that it doesn't make up for our nation's past wrongs, for colonial past wrongs, but that it speaks to us and who we are as a nation in coming together to recognise this history. So as we remember today, this immense titan of Australian cultural history, I reflect on one of his songs, the Jetty song. It says, oh, your face appeared before me and then I began to cry. And I'll find the page. Oh, your face appeared before me and oh, I began to cry. I remember all the stories that you told me long ago. It was time to leave the jetty. It was time to leave Loch Lomond. Oh, but you did not forget me ever since you watched me go. Ever since you watched me go. Vale Archie Roach, rest in power. We won't forget you. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. Motion is carried. The clerk. Government business order of the day number two, social security and other legislation amendment, self-employment programs and other measures bill 2022, second reading debate. Uh, uh, Senator <clears throat> McGrath, thank you. Sorry. Acting Deputy President, <laughs> Senator Coff. Um, I rise to speak in support of the Social Security and Other Legislation Amendment, Self-Employment Programs and Other Measures Bill 2022. The new employment services model, Workforce Australia, was developed by the previous coalition government over a number of years and commenced on 4 July 2022. The new model seeks to build on the success of Job Active and give job seekers the best opportunity to find employment through a tailor-made approach. The former coalition government spent a number of years working with job seekers, providers, peak bodies and employers on developing a model that works for all and supports a pathway for Australians off welfare and into work. It will eventually become a one-stop shop for Australians and Australian businesses to find work retrain and find access to other government initiatives in employment and skills. This bill will continue to realise that and will ensure the good intentions continue. The main amendments in this bill in Schedule 1 will make it clear that the family, social security and veterans entitlements laws operate in the same way in relation to self-employment assistant payments as for other NICE payments because of the name change. The new enterprise incentive scheme, known as NICE, helped almost 200,000 people start their own businesses since it commenced, many of whom may otherwise have continued to rely on social security payments or veterans entitlements payments. The program helps people move off income support by creating their own job. In turn, many of these businesses have created work for additional people. The Self-Employment Assistance Program commenced on 1 July 2022 to replace NICE assistance throughout Australia. This was, other than on Norfolk Island, where NICE will continue because we have an existing deed that does not expire until 2023. It is important that we continue this work and the bill does this. These changes are primarily in sections relating to the treatment of entitlements and clarify in legislation that the self-employment assistance payments are to be treated in the same way as for other NICE payments. For example, the Family Law Act of 1975 defines income-tested pension allowance or benefit as a pension allowance or benefit prescribed by the Family Law Regulations. And for that purpose, those regulations refer to payments made under NICE so that such payments are included within the definition. This must be changed to reflect the Self-Employment Assistance Program. 
that is appropriate, as self-employment assistance is similar to other NIS assistance, the difference being that self-employment assistance participants will have much more flexibility in choosing and accessing the support that best suits their circumstances. Schedule 1 also means that if self-employment assistance is given a different name, the family, social security and veterans entitlements laws will continue to operate in the same way, provided that the employment secretary makes a notifiable instrument giving notice of the change, without the need for a future bill. This is worthwhile because it means we can spend less of the chamber's time with bills like this and focus on other measures to support employment in Australia. The former coalition government's investment in Australia's workforce have worked to move people from unemployment and into jobs. And prior to the pandemic hitting, had reduced Australia's level of welfare dependency to the lowest level in 30 years. The former coalition government successfully brought Australians through the pandemic, bringing Australia's historic low unemployment rates with it. The unemployment rate of 3.5% is a testament to that. We were determined from when we were first elected to government in 2013 to put in place the strong economic policies and labour market programs that allow the economy to recover and support Australians into work. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the coalition's strong economic management had supported the creation of over 1.5 million jobs. The economy was growing. Australia had a record labour force participation. Unemployment rate was 5.2 per cent in March 2020, and the budget was in balance for the first time in 11 years. Our former employment services programs played an essential role in supporting economic recovery by increasing labour force participation and helping workers transition to new jobs. These programs, including Job Active, Youth Jobs Path, Transition to Work and Parents Next are working and had ensured we bounced back from COVID-19 and continued the pathway of getting more Australians into work. These programs have assisted hundreds of thousands of Australians to improve their employability and gain employment, with Job Active having supported over 2 million job placements since its introduction in 2015. To assist, to assist Australians back into work after a once-in-a-century pandemic, we built on this record and improved services for our most affected regions and our most disadvantaged job seekers. We put boots on the ground across 25 regions to support employment through our local jobs program. Employment facilitators developed local jobs plans in 25 regions in collaboration with local stakeholders, employers and training organisations. The new employment services model, known as Workforce Australia, is now in place and is providing more personalised services to better target job seeker needs, invest in those job seekers who need it and make greater use of digital technology. Workforce Australia was the biggest reform to employment services since the Howard government's reforms in the 1990s, showing our commitment to helping Australians into work and modernising one of the biggest expenditure areas of government. The Coalition is proud of this record and continue to work we can on improving employment opportunities, even if that means now from opposition. We do commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Rice. Thanks. Oh. Uh, yes, uh, Senator, Senator Rice. Thanks, Senator Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak to the Social Security and other legislation amendments, self-employment programs and other measures bill. And the Australian Greens believe that all people have the right to a livelihood, to pursue their preferred work and to have the freedom, the dignity, the economic security and equal opportunity in that work. And as such, we support the objectives of the self-employment assistance program, which is what's being addressed in this bill and of its predecessor, the new enterprise incentive scheme, to help people find meaningful employment by creating their own jobs. It's a good thing. But we believe that the government has a responsibility, a responsibility to ensure that everyone can access, exercise their right to meaningful work. And what's being done in this bill is only a small part of what needs to occur. And successive governments have failed this responsibility to ensure that everybody can exercise their right to meaningful work. And in particular, for people who currently aren't working, there is so much more that we need to be doing. 
we have got people living in poverty on income support, which is the last place you need to be to be able to be in a place to be able to get that support, to get the support that you need to be able to access work. There's no point setting up schemes to you know, be fiddling at the edges and encouraging people to start up their own small business if you are languishing in poverty, if you cannot af afford to have a roof over your head, if you can't afford to be putting, putting food on the table. These are not the conditions that enable people to find work. And in particular, we need to be com completely overhauling the systems in place that actually are a barrier in many cases for people find, to find work. And I do want to spend some time talking about those new systems, and that's Workforce Australia, where, in fact, the experience of the introduction of Workforce Australia has been that it is not doing anything to help so many people find work, people who want to be able to find work but basically find themselves um, battling a government bureaucracy, battling a system that is not supporting them to find work. And we are very disappointed that earlier this year the new Labor government began rolling out the previous government's broken and punitive employment systems, Workforce Australia. And I note, in fact, that today um, we got notice in the House that the um, employment um, minister, Tony Burke, is, is proposing that there needs to be an inquiry into Workforce Australia. I think there needs to be more than the inquiry. And certainly the inquiry, the terms of reference for this inquiry will be proposed today. And I have an inquiry that wouldn't have a reporting date until September next year. We know the problems that exist with Workforce Australia at the moment, and they need to be fixed. And under this new system, people on income support have to complete enough activities to accrue 100 points a, mo a month or have their payments cut off. And despite this being a major overhaul of the mutual obligation system, the Labor government provided little or no communication on the transition. According to a survey conducted by the Australian Unemployed Workers Union of their members on the transition, 43 um, percent of these people re receive no information from the government about these changes. And community members express to me their confusion and distress as a result of this poor communication. But uh, this wasn't the end of the issues and the pain that Workforce Australia has caused and is causing. I mean, despite Minister Burke's promise that this new system would be a, a clean slate, we have seen demerit points being carried over from the job active system, which is a complete contradiction to the promise made by the minister. We've seen the dead naming of trans people and communications with them. We've seen inaccessible um, communications to culturally and linguistically diverse communities and people with disabilities. There have been privacy issues and technical difficulty after te technical difficulty. If we are going to be serious about getting people into work, if we're going to be trying to get systems set up, we've got to do better. The Guardian recently reported that a 63-year-old woman from regional South Australia had to make a 250-kilometre round trip to meet her mutual obligations and keep her benefits under Workforce Australia. Despite living in Yorktown, she was referred to a job agent in Kadena that was a one-and-a-half-hour drive or 125 kilometres from her home. And shockingly, these appointments and the long, tiresome journey with them, they actually don't count towards the new points-based system. We've got Workforce Australia, which is causing people harm and stress. The system's already failing, and yet it's job seekers who are being held over a barrel and threatened with payment suspensions. People are terrified and they're confused. I mean, one user of the platform has said, I am panicked, frustrated and have no idea what's going on. Workforce Australia has failed people from day one. And unemployed advocates, people on income support and the Greens have been causing for a minimum three-month pause to payment cut-offs while people attempt to navigate this new, confusing system. We initially had a one-month pause um, because there was a recognition from the government that maybe the communication the system wasn't set up in terms of the transition for people. Last week, Minister Burke announced that in terms of accruing the points that there will be an extra 30-day pause acknowledging the problems with the system. Today we have got this a proposal for a House inquiry into Workforce Australia. Into Workforce Australia. I, mean, I urge the government to listen to the unemployed advocates and people on in income support and take immediate action to ensure 
that no one loses their income support payments. Because without those payments, if you've got people being cut off and living in fear of being cut off, you are not going to be having a situation where people are capable and able to be their best and to be able to be getting work, whether it's through applying for jobs or, like in the bill that we're discussing today, um, assistance to start up their own small businesses. Um, I mean, the second area that I did want to talk about in particular was the absolute um, inadequacy of income support under our job seeker payments. We are in a cost of living crisis and poor and working class people all over the country are feeling desperate. And again, if you've got people living in poverty that can't afford to put food on the table, they are in no position whatsoever to be taking up initiatives to help them find work by setting up their small business. I mean, according to an ACOS survey, more than half of people currently on income support are skipping meals, and the demand on food charities has seen a 50 per cent increase since the start of the pandemic. We have millions of people in this country who are living in poverty. We have got to address that as a core issue if we are serious about getting people into work. It doesn't, I mean, the Greens think that we need to be abolishing mutual obligations. They are not helping. And in fact, we had a real-life example of that during the COVID pandemic when mutual obligations were suspended and people's um, income support was doubled to account for the increase, um, the, the people's lack of ability to be able to find work. And what happened? The evidence is in. We actually had more people that were able to find themselves work during that period than in previous um, periods. The evidence is there. If you actually give people enough to live on and you don't make them jump through ridiculous hoops of mutual obligations, people want to get work. You then uh, have people in the situation where they are able to pick up on the incentives such are provided in, this, in, in the self-employment assistance program. I mean, anyone who has ever struggled to put food on the table or had to make a choice between paying the rent on one hand or for their medication for another um, or paying the rent on time, they know the constant and the crushing stress of living in poverty. And in this wealthy country, something is deeply broken when around 20 per cent of our population are receiving payments that aren't enough to survive on. And you've got one in six children who are living in poverty. You just think about what that means for those people's life, their, the trajectory of their life ahead of them. If you start off life living in poverty, if you start off absolutely having to scrabble, not having the opportunities that other people get. It, is, it sets you so far behind in terms of actually being able to realise your full potential. And, I mean, no parent should have to wonder whether, how they're going to feed their kids this week or buy the new, the new school uniform next term. We need a plan to end poverty. They are the sorts of initiatives that really are important, that are going to do something about getting people into work. If we actually had a plan to end poverty, because we know that huge swathes of people are struggling every day to take care of their families and to get their most basic needs met. I mean, governments are meant to serve people. Millions of Australians are hurting, and this parliament just can't ignore them. People want to be able to live their lives with dignity and without the constant fear of how they're going to keep their heads above water. It's not too much to ask. I mean, the Greens believe that a fair, socially just, democratic and sustainable society it rests on the provision of an unconditional livable income, complemented by the provision of universal social services. If everybody had a guaranteed livable income, then everybody would be in a position to really realise their potential to be able to seek work, to have the capacity to do that, to be able to undertake training programs, to be able to know that they're not going to have to be working out how they manage to survive, to scrabble from one day to the next. So rather than, you know, we're supporting this bill today, but it is a tiny piece on the edge rather than tackling the fundamental problems that we're currently facing that need absolutely serious overhaul. We need to reform the social security system to introduce a livable income guarantee. And by doing so, and by abolishing the broken and the punitive mutual obligation requirements, 
The Greens plan actually would give every Australian a fair go and stimulate the, the, the economy. And we know that the number one thing that this parliament can do to address the cost of living crisis and to help get people into work is to lift income support, as well as access to affordable housing and essential services, to lift income support so that people aren't living in, po in poverty. And so we are calling upon this government, yep, we'll support this bill today, but we are calling on this government to be doing more, to be abolishing the mutual obligations and to be lifting income support to above the poverty line so, and raising all payments to at least $88 a day, which is what is needed to keep your head above water. And by doing so, we would be really giving every Australian the opportunity to be getting into employment and to be living a full and um, a, a full and, and flourishing life. Thank you. Senator Billick. Thank you. The bill before us today makes some technical changes regarding employment programs, which I will deal later in my speech. But first off, I would like to state how annoyed I get during debates in this chamber with senators on the other side making accusations that Labor members and senators do not understand what it's like to run a business. And they obviously say this in an effort to reinforce the misguided and patently false notion that the Coalition are the friends of small business and Labor are not. This is clearly wrong, and I will challenge that notion later in my contribution. But before I do, let me tell you what I find particularly infuriating about that claim. It's actually based on complete ignorance of the background of senators on this side of the chamber, including me. When we have debates about early childhood education and care, I often mention my more than a decade as an educator. I was a family daycare educator, and like many family daycare educators, I was in charge of my own business. Also, I come from a family where my mother, for 40 years, worked as a small, owned her own small businesses for 40 years. So I really would like those on the other side, and I know there's others on this side that have had similar types of. Um, engagement with small business. I grew up in small business. I know small business. Please stop telling us we don't understand it. I understand the challenges and I understand the benefits. And in the early childhood education sector, you have all the, uh, the usual challenges of collecting fees from customers, paying the bills and promoting your business. But on top of that, You've got a whole set of regulations you've got to comply with to ensure you're delivering safe and high quality education and care from three levels of government. And you have to deal with all this administrative work on top of your core business as an educator. Not that I've got any quibbles about the regulations. It's an industry that deals with children who are vulnerable and a crucial stage in their development. But it was tough. And through the industry, I got to know many other educators all of whom were running their own family daycare businesses and facing similar challenges. So it really does get on my nerves, I have to say, when I get told that only the coalition cares about small businesses or Labor doesn't end the ch understand the challenges of running a small business. I'm happy to help anyone, I must say, who comes to my office seeking to take on the challenge of running a small business. I and my staff are often encouraging constituents to call or visit their local business enterprise centres and avail themselves of the free advice and assistance on offer there. And at this point, I'd really like to give a, a great shout out to my local enterprise centre, the Kingborough and Huon Business Enterprise Centre, of whom I've heard excellent reports from the constituents I've referred there. Their previous manager, Scott Duffy, who has served for a number of years, has just recently retired, so I wish him well on his future endeavours. And I also congratulate Kerry Muller on his promotion to manager. I was really pleased to catch up with both Scott and Kerry at an event recently where the centre was celebrating the renewal of their government contract to deliver enterprise centre services. And my office has also helped small business people to access business grants or other forms of financial assistance. I have established my office as a delivery, delivery partner in the No Interest Loan Schemes, or NILs. NILs is commonly thought of as a program low-income earners access so they can buy large household items like a car or a TV or a fridge. But one of the services NILs also offers is no interest loans to start a new micro-business, and we have helped a few NILs clients with, this business, with business ideas to lodge their application. 
That's just a few of the practical ways that I help people to establish small business or to thrive in their existing businesses. So when it comes to the bigger picture of what small business needs to need to succeed, Labor in government has a proud record of supporting small business. We recognise how vital small business is for the Australian economy, with 2.4 million small businesses throughout Australia employing 4.7 million people. And it was the Rudd-Gillard Labor government that introduced the Lost Carryback Initiative, which allows small businesses to invest in their operations and then carry back their losses to earlier years, getting a refund for tax paid on previous profits. The Rudd-Gillard government also increased the instant asset write-off from $1,000 to $6,500. This meant a small business could invest in an asset like a coffee machine or a, or a bench tool and instantly deduct it. We also introduced a measure that allowed businesses to instantly write off the first $5,000 of a motor vehicle purchase. We introduced these measures, understanding the importance of cash flow to small businesses, allowing them the opportunity to access the tax deductions from capital purchases more quickly. Um, and I've got two of my brothers are also um, have well, they're both just recently retired, but have ran their own businesses for about 30 or 40 years. Um, and uh, I've got to say, they found all of these things very advantageous to them. Shamefully, the coalition, under the leadership of Tony Abbott, stripped away this valuable assistance, returned to the original threshold of $1,000 and subjecting the small businesses to an effective $5 billion tax increase. But they must have seen the value in the measure because they increased it again in 2015, at the same time trumpeting what a great help it would be for small business. So we introduced it, they cut it, then they reintroduced it to say what heroes they are. What a backflip. But maybe they just couldn't cope with Labor getting the credit for doing something to help small business. The previous Labor government also established the Fresh Ideas for Work and Family program, a $12 million grants program to help small businesses meet the set-up costs of family-friendly working arrangements. In the current parliament, it's exciting to see that a Tasmanian colleague of mine, Julie Collins, the member for Franklin, has been appointed Minister for Small Business. My electorate office is in Miss Collins' electorate and I work very closely with her. And I'm sure any small business owners who know her as well as I do will be reassured that the portfolio is in good hands. Labor's commitments to small business in government are outlined in our Better Deal for Small Business, which we took to the last election. And this plan includes guaranteeing that the government considers the specific needs of small business during times of crisis, creating a mechanism to ensure that small businesses are paid within 30 days, making unfair contract terms illegal so that small businesses can negotiate fairer agreements with large partners, driving a genuine collaboration with small businesses and government to cut paperwork, target support and reduce the time that small businesses spend doing taxes, delivering simpler, more accessible and fairer outcomes in workplace relations by drawing on Labor's history of working with unions, workers and industry and reducing small business transaction costs at the point of sale. What I can add to that list, although it relates to business in general, is Labor's commitment to establishing Jobs and Skills Australia and tackling the skills crisis by investing in university places and free TAFE. The COVID pandemic has laid bare the depth of the skills crisis across this country. Labor in government has a proud record, not only investing in skills but also having the mechanisms to work with employers, employees and unions to identify the skills gaps. And I know about the great work of industry skills councils through my work as a union representative on two industry skills councils. Shamefully, these bodies were scrapped by the Abbott government, but I'm excited to see that this capability will, will be returning when we establish Jobs and Skills Australia. Another great Labor initiative for small business was the New Enterprise Incentive Scheme, or NICE, introduced in 1985 by the Hawke government. This initiative is particularly important to mention because it relates directly to the bill we are debating now. Through NICE, individuals can receive a package of services that helps them to establish a new business. 
And more recently, it also helped existing business owners impacted by COVID-19 to continue running their business or refocus their operations to meet new areas of demand. Since NICE was introduced, it has helped over 198,000 people. 198,000 people. There are a number of sorts of supports available through NICE, including accredited small business training, help to develop a business plan, personalised mentoring from a NICE Thank provider. Thank you, Senator It being 1.30, we'll proceed to two-minute statements, and you'll be in continuance when the debate resumes. Call Senator Bragg. Thanks very much, um, Acting Deputy President. It's uh, good to see you. And uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the ABC appointing an ombudsman, which is uh, something that has been historically resisted. Now, I'm of the view the ABC generally does a good job. I do think it has at times uh, strayed into partisanship and it has at times had a problem of being uh, able to manage internal bias. But in the main, I would say the ABC does a good job and uh, has served the nation very well. And as someone that wants the ABC to succeed, um, I have been concerned for a long time that the ABC had not been able to properly address the complaints that had been made about some of its programs and that it was a bit like uh, Dracula running the blood bank, that effectively the complaint would go to the person who had or go to the department which had been responsible for the program in some form. Um, now, having followed the process through of having a review, uh, which the board commissioned into the complaints handling, uh, the ABC has now decided that it will in fact appoint the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman was appointed, I believe, last night or, to, or this morning. And that Ombudsman's job is to ensure that the ABC's reputation is maintained and enhanced. Uh, for people who want the ABC to succeed, it's important that they do handle complaints uh, fairly and properly and swiftly. Now, we all make mistakes, uh, and it would be ridiculous to suggest that an organisation as big and as successful as the ABC wouldn't make the odd mistake. So I welcome the appointment of the Ombudsman. I think it will help the ABC, and we will be able to probe the success, transparency and governance um, around the Ombudsman over future uh, Senate estimates round. So I, I welcome this from the ABC's board. It's a very good decision, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Polly. I rise to speak on the importance of stemming the staff shortages currently plaguing the aged care sector and why the delivery of a community care Tasmania training and respite centre in Launceston will work to ease these pressures. Labor looks forward to providing $2.8 million in funding for the project, as we believe it's important now more than ever to improve service delivery of respite care education for aged care and disability workers. This funding will allow for the training alongside respite services, with an additional 55 support workers completing their certificate two and three in aged care and disability care every year. Trainees will learn on the job and will be job ready much quicker. The service is open 24-7 and will add to the capacity of care in the state in the form of 35,000 hours of day respite care per year. It will also take pressure off the Launceston General Hospital by freeing up more beds and ensuring Tasmanians can receive medical care when they need it most from well-trained carers and health professionals. Thanks to the CEO of Community Care Tasmania, Wendy Mitchell, and her team, this project is already underway, and I will work closely with the Minister for Health and Aged Care, the Hon. Mark Butler, to ensure that it is delivered on time and in full. After a decade of neglect under the Liberals, it is time to give older Australians what they deserve. This centre, along with our commitment to put a nurse on site 24-7 in all aged care homes, giving carers more time to care, 
backing a pay rise for aged care workers, implementing new food standards and increasing transparency in the sector, we will see a meaningful reform to this sector. The Albanese government has given this commitment. We will give older Australians the care and dignity they deserve. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Today I have the honour of sharing, in her own words, a statement from Melissa, a person struggling to survive on the meagre job seeker payment. I'm on JobSeeker with a reduced capacity to work due to chronic illness and disability. I live on $330 a week. It was hard to survive before inflation hit, but now it's devastating. I'm great at budgeting, but now budgeting means not buying the basics. It means rationing out food to last a fortnight. If I've budgeted well, I can eat one meal a day. If another expense comes up, I have to choose which days I need to skip food completely. I try to choose days I have no appointment so I can sleep through the hunger. In November last year, I was diagnosed with scurvy and malnutrition. Let that sink in. A country as wealthy as Australia and I'm unable to eat enough good food to get the nutrients I need to live. This has a devastating impact on my health. How could I possibly get work ready when I can't afford to live? Yet job seekers are expected to be able to find employment under these conditions. Prices are rising and job seeker isn't. I'm isolated from my community and have lost countless friends because I can't afford to grab a coffee with them. There's nothing to look forward to and I've become hopeless. It's day after day of being in survival mode. It's stressful and it's demeaning. But you have the power to change that for me and millions of others. Poverty is a political choice. Instead of punishing us for not being employed, you could take a chance that raising JobSeeker would also raise our chances for getting work ready. It's time to start fighting poverty and not the poor. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Smith. Acting Deputy President, on any given night in Australia, there are 116,000 people experiencing homelessness. According to the 2016 census, in my home state of South Australia, there are more than 6,000 people facing, experiencing homelessness every single day. Too many of those experiencing homelessness are young people and children. Homelessness is more than rough sleeping, and it's not always long term. But we know even short periods of homelessness can have long-term impacts on health, education and employment outcomes. And we also know that homelessness can happen to any of us. It can be unexpected when a lease expires, when a relationship breaks down, when employment unexpectedly ends. And we also know the fastest growing cohort of people experiencing homelessness are middle-aged women who often have little to no economic safety net in terms of their superannuation and employment. This week is National Homelessness Week and the theme is to end homelessness, we need a plan, and a plan the Albanese government has. I am deeply proud to be part of a government that will develop a national housing and homelessness plan, establish a national housing supply and affordability council to ensure the Commonwealth plays a leadership role in increasing housing supply and improving housing affordability. We're building 4,000 new social housing properties specifically allocated for women and children fleeing domestic and family violence. And we're investing $100 million in crisis and transitional housing options for women and children. We won't fix homelessness overnight, but the size of the task should never deter us from the urgency of action. I want to acknowledge all those organisations in my community working every day to support those experiencing homelessness, not just in Adelaide, but in our rural and regional areas where we know this issue is so significant too. Thank you for the work you do each and every day. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, not to take away from the very serious issues that have already been raised in this um, section of the day, I will be lightening the tone a bit. Um, I rise to encourage people not to forget the regions as they look to their um, future travel plans, because we suffered through COVID, we have suffered through drought, uh, our woes are not gone, and we need you to love our regions. And I want to give a little plug to my hometown of Daniloquin which is so much more than the ute muster, so much more than the world-famous ute on a pole that you can view as you come into town. 
We have the fabulous beach to beach river walk along the beautiful Ed Edward River. Uh, we have state forests and we're on the edge of the Barma Millawa National Park. And you can go and see the Barma choke that I speak on very regularly on my, with my water hat on. We have the Pepin Heritage Centre that tells the story of the very famous, world-renowned Australian Merino sheep, which uh, the bloodline was actually developed in and around Daniloquin. We have the Hay Plains and the majestic sunsets that you can see. In summer, we've got water skiing, river floats down the river. You don't need a boat, you just need a blow-up mattress and you can thoroughly enjoy it. I was set a challenge by our local mayor to find out how many people know someone from Daniloquin. And I have been walking around the parliament over the last couple of weeks and here in this chamber, every person I talk to knows someone from Daniloquin. Go figure, it's like, it's amazing. So as I implore you, if you don't already know someone from Daniloquin, get in the car, go for a drive and meet someone because they're good mob. Thank you, Senator Davies. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Albanese Labor government has introduced legislation to deliver 10 days paid family and do domestic violence leave for all Australian workers. This landmark legislation started with strong union women standing up, speaking out in their workplaces for safety and security. And through their action and with the election of the Albanese Labor government, we will now see this entitlement extended to all Australian workers who need it. One of these strong pioneering union women was Sharon, an ASU delegate from the Surf Coast Shire in Victoria. Sharon was in an abusive relationship when her EBA negotiations started in 2010. She fought to include paid leave for workers going through similar situations. Standing together, these ASU members became the first in the country to have paid family and domestic violence leave. This win set off a, nation, a national campaign which has run for over a decade, culminating in the legislation uh, that we introduced. And last month I spoke with Christy, an ASU member from the City of Greater Geelong Council. Through her ASU agreement, she has access to domestic violence leave already. Christy was able to use it when facing domestic violence at the hands of her ex-husband. And years later, Christy is still going through the court system to keep herself and her children safe. She told me that this leave meant she had time to reorganise her life, to keep her job and her house, and to keep her children safe and secure. Christy told me, now I want everyone to have access to it. And because of the tireless campaigning of women like Sharon and Christy in their unions across the country, they will. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, July the 19th marked nine years since a former Labor government announced that people who arrived in Australia by boat to seek asylum could not settle here and would be exiled and detained offshore. Nine years of imprisonment, brutality, deliberate cruelty, separation from families for thousands of people, nine years of murder, rape child sex abuse in a system specifically designed to punish and harm innocent people. And right now, there are over 200 people still in Papua New Guinea and Nauru, still suffering, still in exile after nine long years. And I met this morning with three people who suffered through so many years of detention, both offshore and onshore, three very brave people. Ismail, Bethlehem and my friend Danush, who I first met on Manus Island in 2016 and who is with us in this chamber today. It's good to see you, my brother. And their message was simple. The people left behind in Papua New Guinea and Nauru need emergency evacuation here to Australia. They need medical support, they need freedom, they need community support and they need permanent resettlement in a safe place. The Australian Labor Party sent them to Manus Island and Nauru in the first place and the Australian Labor Party can and must evacuate them now. 
immediately and bring them to Australia. There's much, much more that we can do for these people, but immediate, urgent evacuation is the critical and urgent necessity. Bring them here and bring them here now. Nine years is far, far too long. Let's not make them wait for a single day more. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Recently, I had the pleasure of visiting the good people on Norfolk Island. It is a beautiful part of the world, some 2,000 kilometres out in the Pacific Ocean. There's an amazing, generous community spirit with families who've been there since 1856. If something is broken, the community will come together to fix it. And there's not much on that island that can't be fixed with the community spirit and elbow grease of the locals. However, one of the challenges that they desperately need the Commonwealth's support with is the cargo crisis unfolding on the island. The supermarket shelves are running bare. They're low on stock and being so reliant on tourism, tourist operators are struggling to have enough food to ensure that they can actually serve meals to their customers. It's a worrying set of conditions given how reliant they are on tourism. Whilst I commend the government for its decision to increase the number of air freight trips, the community has told me that they are still struggling to get supplies. Major investments are needed to support a modern and safe shipping delivery system for the island, particularly as not all products can travel via air freight, such as medical oxygen cylinders. Norfolk Islanders want to help, and I hope the government will reach out and consult with locals on how to overcome these challenges. I want to thank Norfolk Islanders for their hospitality and gener generosity. I ho hope to return soon and explore more of your amazing island. I was lucky enough to, to get across to Phillip Island and see some of the amazing work that Australian parks are doing over there. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Rennick. Acting Madam Deputy President, uh, now last week the Auditor General released an audit report into the Building Better Regions Fund and tried to somehow allege that the government uh, didn't act in the best interests of, of the taxpayers in spending that money. Now I should point out that $1.2 billion was spent over five years. Now last night I read that audit report and I went through to look for what actually was spent and where it was spent wrongly. And I noticed that the Auditor General didn't mention once what project where the money was actually uh, not spent properly or wasn't in the best interests of the taxpayer. And I've got a bit of history here with the Auditor-General because last year he made the accusations, very unfair accusations, that the former coalition government had paid too much for the land at Leppington Triangle. That was completely false. In my 25 years of financial um, accounting, I've never seen a worse audit report prepared. The Auditor-General failed to comply with AASB 13, paragraphs 29, 30, it said all land must be valued at best use, regardless of zoning. Uh, the Auditor General tried to claim that the land was actually agricultural land when it was actually in the airport zone. You don't buy airports, you know, uh, you know, buy land for an airport and then put cattle on it. Uh, you tend to build, so it has to be for best use. He failed to consult with staff in the department. One of the staff in the department, who was completely innocent, mind you, had the federal police turn up on his doorstep, uh, and he basically, uh, you know in front of his children, which was very uh, intimidating to the, to the staffer. Um, so these powers shouldn't be abused and we should, should not, uh, Auditor General should not be, be political uh, in what should be an impartial uh, position. So you know, when we look at the market value, five minutes, when I heard, first heard about this, I hopped on realestate.com, looked up the suburb and six acres was going for, uh, five acres, sorry, was going for six million dollars. So you could work out in a matter of minutes that the land, we, what the former coalition had paid, was clearly the market value. Uh, and I would suggest in future that much better quality assurance be applied Thank to our you, auditing. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I often end my speeches with the words, we are one community, we are one nation, for a reason. Oneness is a fundamental teaching of Christianity. 1 Corinthians verses 12 to 14, quote, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. 
If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. The Bible reminds us that a body of people working together can achieve that which people divided never will. One nation will continue to embrace all who share this beautiful land. One nation embraced first Australians, and we embrace those who have come since. All are important. All make each of us greater than we could ever become by ourselves. Indeed, all have made us greater than we once were. As a community, we do face evil. That battle is as old as time itself. That's why humanity has evolved to consider community the basic building block of safety and prosperity. Those who seek to divide do so because they seek to destroy. Instead, together we can overcome the ravages of Mother Nature in a harsh but bountiful land. Together we can achieve abundance for all Australians, and surely if our, if our bounty is not being shared fairly, then we must correct that. Together we can defeat predatory billionaires who believe they should own everything and that we should own nothing. Together we can change the lives of first Australians in remote communities who deal with conditions that today no human being should ever have to. We can and we must start on that today. Evil is fought together, not apart. One nation will continue to hold our hand out to those who have been captured by intolerance and hate. I live in hope that one day our hand will be taken. In the end, love and courage will win. Most Australians feel the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Disabled people deserve access to this parliament. Why is this concept uh, one which every single Labor government and Liberal government uh, finds so confronting? This week, my colleague, uh, Senator David uh, Pocock and Senator uh, David Shukbridge requested an Auslan interpreter to join them in the Senate to interpret their first speeches. This request was denied. Their request was denied because uh, your rules are based on an old, ableist way of doing things. The rules that say that this parliament must deny the request to avoid setting a precedent of a stranger on the floor. To me, yet again, they have denied disabled people the opportunity for genuine inclusion in this place. The Procedures Committee is set to review these ableist rules, and it is about damn time they do so. If you think that captioning is good enough for deaf and other Auslan using people to access parliamentary feeds, then you are wrong. If you think that relegating, relegating an interpreter to another room to provide their service is good enough, you are wrong. And if you think that what you granted today, an on-screen interpreter, is good enough when an in-person interpreter was requested, then you are wrong. And let me also add that if you think this allowance is a one-off, then you are wrong. Why should anyone who is travelling to the parliament be denied access in their own language? Auslan interpreting should be offered during every sitting, every speech, every time. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Dean Smith. Surprise, surprise. Just when we elected the Labor government, guess what happened? What? They took the first opportunity to turn their back on Western Australia. Surprise, surprise. Not only did Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, say he would govern for all of Australia, he undercooked Western Australia's representation in the Federal Cabinet, and now he wants to abolish the Northern Australia Joint Committee of this Parliament. Disgraceful indeed. He wants to silence the voice of the Pilbara region, silence the voice of towns like Port Hedland and Caratha and Tov Price. He wants to silence the Kimberley region, towns like the Derby and Broome and Kununurra, and all of those many communities in between, including Indigenous communities. Northern Australia represents 53 per cent of this continental landmass—1.3 million people. 200,000 of them are Indigenous, and Anthony Albanese, supported by West Australian Labor senators, right. wants to abolish this committee. This is outrageous. On a very serious note, even the deepest critics of the work of the committee would have to admit that the work that it did on the Jorgen Gorge inquiry in the last parliament 
was landmark, was a testimony to the strong bipartisanship, tripartisanship of this parliament in responding to very, very important issues that were not just West Australian issues, that were not just national issues, that were issues that the whole international community took notice of. And what does Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, want to do? Supported by West Australian Labor senators, he wants to abolish the Northern Australia Committee. Shame, 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 shame. And if that is not unbelievable enough, it's the West Australian Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Thank the you, member Senator for Dean Smith. Uh, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Yesterday I, ha I had the honour to present some remarkable Australian organisations and councils with Australian Road Safety Awards. The awards organised for the, by the formidable Australian Road Safety Foundation are in their 11th year. I'd like to take some time to congratulate the winners again. The Community Programs Award was awarded to Road Sense Australia's Traffic Offender Intervention Program. The program is a, a behavioural therapy-based approach to road safety education. The Schools Program Award was awarded to the South Burnett Regional Council for their school safety program. The program is an initiative to improve regional road safety outcomes around schools. The Indigenous Programs Award was awarded to the PCYC Queensland Breaking the Cycle, Changing Gears program. The Learner Driver Mentor program is working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to gain, help gain their licence. The Innovation Award was awarded to Youth Safe Learner Driver Mentor online, online Training. The training is for volunteer learner driver mentors. The Technology Award was awarded to eDriving and Innovation Groups mentor by e, Mentored by eDriving. The program helps organisations across the world. The Local Government Programs Award and the Founders Award was awarded to the City of Gold Coast for their Gold Coast Road Safety Plan 2021-2026. The plan is to reduce crashes, save lives and prevent serious trauma. The State Government Program, uh, Programs Award went to the Logan, Logan City Council's tyre deflation device tri trial. Recognition awards went to the Maribyrnong City Council's Holistic Road Safety Program and the Royal Perth Hospital for their party program. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Madam Deputy President. I rise to condemn Labor's decision to block the delivery of the Coalition's $1.3 billion modern manufacturing initiative, including a $12 million grant for Carbon Revolution, one of Geelong's most successful advanced manufacturers. It's extremely disappointing that the Labor government has taken this decision on the basis that it, conducts, it is conducting a value for money review. On 10 May, I was very proud to join the former Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction, Mr Taylor, to announce a $12 million grant for Carbon Revolution's $33 million project to expand its advanced manufacturing of carbon fibre wheels to the global electric vehicle market. This was funded by the Coalition's Modern Manufacturing Initiative, Manufacturing Integration Stream Recycling and Clean Energy. Not only will this project enable Carbon Revolution to produce an additional 75,000 carbon fibre wheels per annum at 60 per cent lower cost, su supporting state-of-the-art clean energy technology and 332 jobs, it will also position Australia as a leader in the production and export of carbon fibre wheels. This is a heartless attack by Labor's razor gang, and it demonstrates a callous disregard for Australian manufacturing and the investment certainty that Australian manufacturers need at this time. I particularly condemn the member for Corangamite and the member for Corio, who have absolutely not said a word about this. Not a word. You can object as much as you like. Not a word Order. standing up for manufacturing in Geelong. It's an absolute disgrace, Senator and I call on the Labor government to reverse this Order. shocking decision. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Grogan. Um, I rise to um, make a reflection on 
an experience I had a couple of weeks ago in visiting the Townde Aboriginal College in Port Adelaide. Um, it's a college that was set up in 1973 to recognise uh, the Aboriginal Plain, the Adelaide Plains people and the important work that they've been doing. It's a college that helps support Aboriginal people make decisions and make pathways into meaningful careers. It has for many, many years been seen as the Aboriginal hub, the cultural hub within, um, within, the, within Adelaide and has hosted some of the most important discussions and supported so many important initiatives over that time since 1973. Unfortunately, in recent times, their funding has been under a great deal of threat and they lost their block funding. So they've now built a new pathway forward for themselves, the new business plan to stand on their feet. One of the key things they do, which is so important, is teach the Ghana language, both to Aboriginal people coming up through that college. Thank you, Senator Grogan. The time for two minute statements has expired. It's time for question time. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The, the, I'm out of practice. Stop interjecting. Um, the, the Prime Minister said in April, and I quote, I'll say this very clearly, they, Australians, will be better off under a Labor government, end quote. Minister. With inflation rising by 1.8 per cent to 6.1 per cent for the year to June quarter and Labor's policy to reduce power bills by $275 already dumped, is it not true that Australians can buy less when they shop for groceries and pay off less of their mortgages? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I welcome the opportunity to talk about Labor's economic plan to deal with the, to deal with uh, the Minister, resume your seat. I'm going to wait for quiet, and then the minister can continue. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I welcome the opportunity to talk about Labor's economic plan to deal with the economic challenges that we inherited after nine years of failed policies and wrong priorities. And that is the truth, uh, President. Order. These are the circumstances we inherited. Before the Senator election, McGrath. inflation was rising, interest rates were increasing, yep. supply chain disruption was occurring yep. because there had been yep. no investment in skills. Yep. The energy market, the, the energy market Minister was Gallagher, in resume your seat. <clears throat> uh, Senator Cash. Uh, senators, interjections across the chamber are disorderly on both sides. Uh, Senator Henderson, I'm calling the chamber to order. It's not a debating point, it's a request. Minister Gallagher. Thank you very much, President. We inherited an energy market in crisis, increasing power prices that were actively hidden by the member for Hume on the eve of Senator an election McGrath. being called, actually changed the code so that that information couldn't be made public. That is what we inherited, and Labor's economic plan is going to deal with all of these challenges. So, In, in answer to your questions about will households uh, be better off, they will be better off with our investment in childcare. Oh, I hate hearing about these uh, things. Thank you. Senator Rustin. Uh, on a point of order, um, the, uh, the minister just repeated an accusation that was made uh, on, on, on uh, misleading the Senate. Uh, um, Senator the, Rustin, the... please resume your seat. That is a debating point. Minister Wong, thank you. I'm going to call uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you very much. Households will be better off with the policies that Labor are implementing. Cheaper childcare. I can go through them again and I'll do it all through question time. Every single question I'll give Order. you the same answer. Cost of living relief for families. Cheaper childcare to reduce costs for more than $1.2 million Senator families. McGrath. Cheaper medicines. Taking the speed limit off the economy with better training for our workforce, for free TAFE places, for investing in cleaner Minister and cheaper Gallagher, energy. Your seat. I need to be able to hear the minister's response, and I'm finding it difficult when there, is, there are so many loud interjections. I would ask senators to be quiet, particularly those on my left. Minister Gallagher. 
creating a future made in Australia with the National Reconstruction Fund, growing the care economy, upgrading the NBN, and I know I'll have further opportunity to expand on Thank this. Thank you, um, Minister. Um, Senator Brockman, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. The Prime Minister has said, my government has a policy of doing what we can do to assist cost of living pressures. My question is this. What will the government do now, prior to the October budget, for Australians who are having to do more with less? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, we will do what we said we'd do, and what we've already done is provide support for people affected by floods. We've extended the hospital right. funding and pandemic leave. We've yep. successfully argued for a minimum wage case. We've announced yeah, the job and skills yeah. government. We've what begun what the what review what into the Reserve Bank. We've begun the audit of rorts and waste, going through the budget line by line to see what you were all Minister, up to. Minister, We've begun all that. Minister We've Gallagher, resume your seat. As senators on both sides of the chamber, I am not able to hear the minister's answer. I would ask you, Senator Brown, I would ask you to be silent. Minister Gallagher, please continue. Thank you. We've introduced the climate change legislation that will kickstart more investment in, the, in renewables and grow jobs and opportunities. And in relation to the budget, we are going through your budget that we inherited line by line because after nine years of Order. wrong policies, failed policies and Minister wrong priorities. Gallagher, your seat. Uh, Minister Watt. Uh, thank you on my right. You need to be quiet and allow the minister the opportunity to answer the question. Just because you don't like the answer, there is no need for any senators on either side to be disorderly. Please continue, Minister Gallagher. We are working to repair the budget and put downward pressure on one trillion dollars of Liberal debt. Uh, Senator Brockman, second supplementary. Minister, the price of groceries is increasing. Power prices are increasing. Mortgage repayments are increasing. Does this government have any policies at all that will address these issues right now, or will the minister admit that Australians are not better off? Another broken Labor promise. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, Australian households will be better off from a government that's actually focused on improving improve, or introducing policies that deal with these issues over the longer term, rather than this. What we had after you, uh, under you, which was nine years of political short-term fixes to get you through a news cycle, not actually to deal with the significant challenges Minister in the economy. Gallagher. I'll finish there. Thank you. Uh, Senator Grogan. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the minister outline the current state of the Australian energy market and its consequences for Australians? Minister Wong. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you to Senator Grogan for the question and for your interest in how this is affecting Australians and Australian families. And the reality is that Australians are feeling the pain in their hip pocket because of nine years of denial, exactly. nine years of chaos, nine years of failed energy policies, as well as the significant international factors. Uh, international factors. Uh, that, have been, uh, that we Minister are experiencing, Wong. and you don't like it, do you? Minister you don't Wong. like it, do you? You don't Minister like the facts. Wong. Interjections and yelling out at the top of your voice is absolutely inappropriate and disorderly. To the point, order, order. To the point when I tried to establish quiet, none of you could hear me. Now it is disorderly. It's your question time. That's your opportunity that to ask questions that's being uh, interfered with. But the level of noise has to be reduced, Minister Wong. 
you. Yes, the impact from the former government's lack of energy policy is being felt across the economy by Australian families and businesses. Skyrocketing wholesale electricity prices, putting pressure on budgets. They promised a gas-led recovery, and you had a gas crisis. And renewables, the cheapest form of energy, Minister declined Wong. under you. Minister Wong. Minister Wong, please resume. Uh, the fact is, the lack of policy certainty, the lack of any policy framework, the chaos, you know what it did? It stifled investment. It stifled investment. It slowed the uptake of renewables. And instead of being well placed to deal with this challenge, Australians were left vulnerable by a government that had 22 energy policies. Your seat. Seriously. It's not only disorderly, it's disrespectful. And I will keep sitting the minister down for as long as it takes, because it's your time that's being wasted. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Calling out like that is completely disorderly. Minister Wong. Thank you. Well, they might not like to recall how a market operates, but let me tell you this. Your chaos stifled investment. Right. Three, nine years, 22 energy policies. You took oh, four Minister gigawatts Wong. out of the— Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Hen— I'll call you when it's quiet. Minister, oh, Senator Henderson. Uh, Madam President, thank you. Could I ask if you could ask the senator to direct her comments through the chair? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Wong. President, they took four gigawatts of capacity out of the system. They put one in, and then they wonder why that has contributed to the price increases that Australians are experiencing. Then they come in here, Madam Mr. President. They come here and they say, "Oh, oh, it's really bad." Well, maybe you should have thought of that in the nine years you were in government. The nine years you were in government, Australians Thank are paying you, the Minister price. Thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Uh, Second, a first supplementary thank you. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry. Uh, uh, Madam President, um, Senator Wong has continued to refer to you uh, in her contribution. Could I ask you to again remind her that she's to refer, that she's to um, make her comments through the chair and not directed at the chair? Thank you. Uh, Senator Henderson, it is quite appropriate for anyone in the chamber to refer to me as president. Uh, uh, Senator the coalition. Henderson, that's not a point so of order. Thank you. Please use the yeah, yeah. uh, Senator, Senator Henderson, I'm not accepting that it's a point of order, so please resume your seat. Senator, thank you, Senator Henderson. First supplementary, Senator Grogan. Um, Can the minister now uh, outline— Senator Grogan, so please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. I just um, respectfully ask that you review um, your, your sure. order I'll then review it if and that come it. back to the Absolutely. chamber tomorrow. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Resume your seat. Minister Wong. On the point of order, well, we can get the president all the time to keep reviewing. I think the president thought that you were talking about the president. I understood, and now I think it is clarified, that you feel sensitive about me calling you you. So I am supposed to call you the opposition, league, correct? I will attempt to do so, Thank President. You, and it is, it is correct. It is correct that it is consistent with the standing orders. I would make the point that everybody who stood here in the nine years I've been here has used the word you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Grogan. Uh, thank you for that first answer. Can the minister now outline what action the Albanese government is taking to secure Australia's energy future? Our minister Wong. Thank you. Well, we are getting on with the job. We're working with industry to invest in the technology our nation needs to secure supply to power the future and drive down emissions. I mean, it is extraordinary, President, that a party that pretends to understand markets refuses to take responsibility of the mess they've made of the market. And the mess they've made of the market is one primary reason, one primary Order. reason why we see price increases. Order. And you're right, their only response to price increases was to hide them. Was to hide them. That's been their only response. 
We are giving AEMO more powers to address projected gas shortages and other challenges in the electricity Minister market. Wong. We progress. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Minister Wong, please continue. We are progressing our capacity market with states to ensure we have reliable supplies and supply, and through the National Energy Transition Agreement, we are delivering energy policy to support investment and, importantly, we are implementing the Powering Australian Plan that Australians voted for. Thank you, the Minister Stra Wong. The time has expired. Um, order. Order. Um, Senator Grogan, please resume your seat. Did you have a Senate? Um, I'm we're not up to you yet. Um, I thought you were calling a point of order. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Um, can the minister outline what the impact of hiding this information from Australians is on the state of the energy market? Minister Wong. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. On a point of order, um, standing order 193.3, um, the, uh, the questioner and several ministers on the other side have continuously referred to an action by the previous minister um, and suggested that he tried to hide uh, and, and a number of other assertions along that. Um, that is an adverse reflection on somebody in the other place and suggesting that he did. Uh, the minister would, uh, did not do that. Um, the matter Sen that uh, Senator Rustin, uh, it's not a reflection on the minister. Please resume your seat. I'm, it's not a point of order. Uh, I've asked no because you're debating the you're you're debating the point. It is not a point of order. Please resume your seat. Do you have a point of order, Senator Scar? The lines. No, and if it's on the same matter, I've ruled on it. So well, I'm President, not gonna... it's a it's a different matter, okay. and that is imputation of an improper motive. No, I'm sorry, which is different from imputation. a personal reflection. I don't accept the point of order. Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, well, uh, on a uh, on the point of order, if I may, uh, Minister. Uh, President. <laughs> sorry, President. Uh, I think we, the word was hiding, not lied. Oh, okay. Dear me. Okay. Senator, well, under the Senator, Senator, sorry. Senator Cash. Thank you, President. And after listening carefully to the various comments that have been made, uh, I would request that, given there does seem to be some confusion, you do review the Hansard, what was said, and then come back to the chamber tomorrow with a ruling. Thank you, um, Senate. Order, Senator. Senator Cash, I did hear the words that Senator Rustin uh, referred to, which was hiding. Uh, I took advice from the clerk, uh, but um, if it satisfies the Senate, I'm more than happy to review uh, the Hansard. Thank you, Senator Rustin. I'm not entertaining any further points of order on this matter, so if it's a new point of order, I'm happy to hear it. In relation to the request that's before you at the moment in terms of reviewing uh, the particular um, information, that I would seek for you to also review comments that have been made by others, including Senator Gallagher and Senator Watt, um, on the same matter. Um, Senator Rustin, you're well aware that you can't take a retrospective point of order. I've agreed to review the Hansard and come back to the Senate. Um, I Minister Wong. The point of order and ask them to withdraw. Our uh, order, so. Senator um, Wong, please ask, Thank you. Uh, continue with the question asked by the second supplementary asked S by Senator Wong. Thank Brogan. you. Well, uh, transparency when it comes to markets is important. Transparency when it comes to elections is important. And what we what we know what we know is that the member for Hume, the former industry minister. Uh, saw a 19.7 per cent increase to the default market offer and amended the industry code for Senator electricity McGrath. retailers on 6 uh, April. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Rustin. On a point of order, um, in relation to um, the, uh, making an, uh, a reflection on somebody in the other place for an action that they did not take. Um, that is a debating point, Senator Rustin, but to be perfectly honest, there were so many interjections, particularly from the right, I was struggling to hear Minister Wong. And once again, I would ask Senator McGrath, Senator McGrath, from the left. Um, Minister Wong, please continue. The member for Hume amended the industry code for electricity retailers four days before the election um, was called 
to delay the re release of increases. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Minister Wong. Senator Rustin. On a point of order, in terms of reflecting on a member in the other place, the minister, in responding to the question, is making an accusation of inappropriate behaviour by the member for Hume, which she has no evidence of. Rustin, once again, that is a debating point. Minister Wong, please continue. Thank you. Uh, and the, the effect of the actions of the member for Hume delayed the release of increases in the default market offer for New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia until after the election. Until after, and no amount of point of order or interjection can hide the fact that what is occurring in the energy market is as a consequence of your chaos, and your only response was to try and hide it until after the election. So don't come in here and go on about electricity prices. We know who the guilty Thank party you, is. Thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Minister, last week the Federal Court fined the CFMMEU and two officials in our home state of Queensland more than $150,000 for entry breaches, thuggish behaviour and disgusting homophobic slurs on the $5.4 billion Queensland Cross River Rail project. Will the minister, will the minister guarantee that by abolishing the Australian Building and Construction Commission, this disgraceful and disgusting behaviour will not become even more prevalent on construction sites in Queensland and across this nation. Thank you, Good Senator question. Scar. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Scar, for the question. As Senator Scar knows, I have the utmost respect for our judiciary and our judicial institutions, and it's not for me to uh, criticise any decisions that they have made. Uh, however, 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 the, uh, I remind what, what I note. What I note. What I note. You're right there. Uh, Senator Watt. What I note. What I note is that in the second week of the sittings of this parliament, the, the shadow minister for employment and workplace relations has been ruled out of asking questions about the ABCC or anything to do with Senator it because Watt, of her own uh, record Watt, in that portfolio. Minister Watt. Senator Cash. The order is pretty obvious. It is in relation to relevance. The question that was asked by Senator Carr was in relation to the imposition. Scar was in relation to the imposition of a fine on the CFMEU, mm -hmm. as he has stated, for certain behaviour, including disgusting yes, homophobic we don't need to repeat flirts. The question, Senator the Carr. Question is Senator very Cash. narrow in terms of. Will the minister guarantee that by abolishing the ABCC, mm -hmm. this type of behaviour will not become more prevalent? Thank you, uh, Senator Cash. I have listened carefully to Minister Watt. Uh, the question was broadly about um, decisions of the court, behaviours of union, and so on and so forth. I do believe that the minister is being relevant, and I will listen carefully to the rest of his, uh, the rest of his answer. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, of course, this government thinks that it is unacceptable behaviour in any workplace to see thuggish behaviour, to see homophobic slurs, uh, whether that be on a construction work site or, frankly, in a parliamentary workplace. And maybe people could all reflect on that as well. Uh, but the comments made by uh, judges in the particular case that Senator Scar was referring to are not the only comments that we've heard made by the judiciary about the ABCC. To take one example. Justice North in the federal court blasted the ABCC for wasting time and taxpayers' money on prosecuting two CFMMEU officials Senator for having McGrath. a cup of tea with a mate. Justice North criticised the ABCC, saying this is a, quote, minuscule, insignificant Senator affair. Watt. Uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, Minister Watt, please continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Ka Senator. Senator Scar. Catching. I know. Uh, President, at point of order relevance, uh, Senator Watt is 
providing other judicial comments in relation to the ABCC. He's not dealing specifically with my question in relation to whether or not the abolition of the ABCC— yep. Thank you, Senator Scar. There is no need to repeat the question. And, and once again, uh, Minister Watt— Minister Watt is being relevant. He is talking about behaviour of uh, a whole range of people, including unions. He's condemned the behaviour, and I would ask him to continue. Thank you, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. As I was saying, there have been numerous cases in which the ABCC has been criticised by judges. Uh, we, in ABCC against Parker, Justice Kerr criticised the ABCC for over-egging its case, being a battleship uh, in Minister full steam Watt, which had difficulty turning. Please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, every time your voice gets very loud, I am simply going to sit down whoever has got the call. And that means that time is being wasted uh, by your actions in this question time. Thank you, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. I was reflecting on the irony of certain opposition members asking questions about thuggish behaviour when they continue to disrespect your ruling. The, it, so, as I say, there are numerous cases in which judges over time. Uh, Minister Watt, your time has expired. Senator Scar, first supplementary. Minister, the judge noted in his judgment that he had previously described the CFMMEU as the quote greatest recidivist offender in Australian corporate history, end quote, and that no other penalty than the maximum penalty was appropriate. Will the minister specifically, specifically condemn the homophobic slurs and thuggish behaviour of the CFME officials that led to this fine? Specifically condemn those CFMEU officials Thank you, Senator for the Scar, conduct? The time for asking the question has expired. Minister Watt. Well, I think we're already at tedious repetition in question three for the day. I have already said that there is no place for thuggish behaviour, homophobic behaviour or any other uh, outrageous behaviour in a Order. workplace. Order. Say. I mean, I've got a whole list of comments from the judiciary about the ABB, ABCC, which I can run through if you want me to. Uh, I didn't finish what Justice North had to say uh, about Minister the ABCC. Watt, please resume your Thank seat. you. Uh, Senator Brockman. We're on direct relevance. The minister is clearly indicating he is about to go off a very narrow, very direct question. He is flagging it in advance. Uh, thank you, Senator You should bring Brockman. him back to the question. Thank you, Senator Brockman. I believe the minister is being relevant. He has referred to the union in question, and I will listen carefully to the remainder of his comments. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Here's a bit more about what Justice North had to say about the ABCC. For goodness sake, I don't know minister what this Watt, inspectorate is doing. Minister resume your seat. Senator Brockman, I'm not going to entertain a point of order because it's the same point of order you just made. Please resume your seat. I indicated that I would listen to the minister's answer. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. All I can do is repeat the comments that I've made twice already in answer to the primary question and the first su supplementary, which is that there is no place for thuggish behaviour, homophobic slurs in any workplace, intimidation. Uh, that is not appropriate on a construction website, uh, work site. It is not appropriate in a parliamentary website. Hello, Senator McGrath. Uh, and thank it is not you, appropriate Minister. in any Your other work site. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Scar, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. The judge also noted that the penalty would still be insufficient to deter the CFMMEU as they regard such a sum as chump change. Will the government commit to at least doubling the fines available to the courts for such matters, including the disgraceful matters considered in this case, as the coalition government promised to do in April this year? Will you commit to that? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Watt. Well, thank you, Senator Scar, for reminding us of something that your government had nine years available to do and didn't actually do until its dying days in, uh, in, in government. Uh, and thank you again for reminding us that Senator Cash apparently has been ruled out from asking any questions in the portfolio that she's the shadow minister in. The, the, it, it is interesting that we continue to see members of the opposition uh, talk up the ABCC when Senator its record McGrath. was about prosecuting trivial matters, uh, going after unions, going after workers, rather than actually doing anything to minister improve Watt? the lot of workers or in the industry. In I will just wait for quiet, uh, Senator Scar, before I come to you, Senator Scar. A point of order, President. It was a very specific supplementary question about whether or not the government would double the fines or not. Yes or no answer. It should be perfectly able to be delivered on that sort of question. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Wong. Point of order. I mean, th these are getting spurious. Uh, the minister responded on the subject matter, which was fines. Uh, and if the opposition wished to chew up question time by taking ongoing points of order on spurious grounds, it's a matter for them. But I put to you, President, that there is no point of order in the point of order that's just made. No. Thank you, uh, Minister Wong. Uh, Thank you, um, Senator Scar. The minister is being relevant. I can't direct him. Uh, he may not be giving the answer you require, and I can't direct him to directly answer your question, but he is being relevant to the subject matter of the question. Minister, w uh, minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. Senator Scar knows very well the policy we took to the election in relation to the ABCC, and that was to abolish it. And the reason we intend to abolish it is that it has been a gross waste of taxpayers' money prosecuting minor issues involving workplaces, workers and unions, and it has done nothing whatsoever to deal with the labour productivity issues that exist in the industry. For all the opposition's uh, talk about the ABCC, productivity you, has Minister fallen Watt, on construction your time websites. Has expired. A Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, in just a minute or two, the RBA will announce a further increase in interest rates. Last week, the Treasurer said that these interest rate, cut, interest rate increases will result in higher unemployment and further cuts to real wages. Workers, renters and recent home buyers are being smashed to try and bring down inflation that is being driven by supply shocks and corporate profiteering. Minister, is the government seriously suggesting that there is no alternative? In 2022, is there really no better way for government bodies to respond to the current bout of inflation in a way that would cause less pain for Australians? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank uh, Senator McKim for the questions, uh, well, question and the two that will follow. Um, the government supports the independence of the Reserve Bank and its responsibility around um, setting monetary policy. Uh, we are in a highly inflationary environment, uh, and that is placing pressure on interest rates, um, which are rising, and we have seen those rises over the last few months, uh, and the decision will be made public uh, probably right now while I'm on my feet. Um, and we, uh, in terms of uh, our approach to that, accepting that the RBA has responsibility for monetary policy and to um, keep or to target inflation within that two to three per, uh, percent band, uh, and then the government has responsibility for fiscal policy. Uh, and well, thank you, Senator Rennick. Minister, well, if you're so smart, Senator why Rennick. are you sitting over there on the back bench? <laughs> you know. Um, it's even more important. The government's view is it's even more important that we are implementing the policies we took to the election, which is uh, accepting that there are some parts of the inflation problem that are being driven by international um, effects. That there are things that we should be doing here to make those sensible investments into the productive side of the economy to deal with some of those supply constraints that over the longer term will grow the economy and put downward pressure on the cost of living. That is the plan we took to the election. That is the plan we are going to implement. And we accept that these interest rate rises are difficult on households and we constantly look at ways that we can manage some of those impacts on households in the future, including as we approach uh, the, budget the budget process in October, uh, accepting that we are going through the budget line by line to make sure that every Thank dollar you, spent Minister is Gallagher. quality. A, second sup a first supplementary, um, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I note, uh, Minister, the announcement is that interest rates are up by 50 basis points. Uh, profits are at record highs and wages' share of national income is at record lows. The European Central Bank has identified that corporate profits are surging on the back of the recent increase in inflation. Will you finally accept that corporate profiteering is contributing to inflation in Australia? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And, uh, I understand that this is the strong view of um, the Greens' political party, and it's one that they have been arguing. Um, I do, uh, and I have said, and I said last week, that 
our priority when it comes to tax reform, which is what Senator McKim alludes to, uh, is to focus on multinational tax reform and ensuring that multinationals pay their fair share of tax, and that will contribute uh, to budget repair. Um, and we do want to we do want to get wages moving. We do think there's a social licence attached uh, to uh, some of the companies that have been doing pretty well in the last uh, few months. Uh, but our focus is on repairing the budget, making those sensible investments into the economy, dealing with some of those supply constraints, getting wages moving, investing for the long-term productive side of the economy. That is what we said we'd do before the election. That's what we're doing after. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Two weeks ago, Minister, the Prime Minister warned the RBA against overreaching. Corporates the corporate super profit taxes would help rein in inflation and lessen the likelihood of the RBA overreaching. Why won't the government introduce corporate super profits taxes to rein in inflation and help fund cost of living relief such as free childcare and dental and mental health into Medicare? Thank you, Senator McKim. Um, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, to my first point is the Prime Minister didn't warn. Uh, the Reserve Bank. Uh, I think the Prime Minister referred to the difficult balance that the Reserve Bank uh, has to navigate in this inflationary environment and the decisions they take about um, increasing interest rates that were occurring in this environment, I would like to say, was occurring before the election. Uh, and these uh, interest rates, while they're hard on households, uh, when you've got inflation at uh, the levels that we've got it, uh, you will see rising interest rates. In, re in, in respect to the second part of Senator McKim's question, this is asking, will the Labor government implement the Green political party's um, commitments that they took to the election or made after that? And the answer to that, as I said last week, is we are implementing we are implementing the policies that we took to the election, uh, and that's what we said we'd do before, and it's what we're doing after. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Senator Billick. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on the Reserve Bank's decision moments ago in relation to interest rate? Um, thank you, President. I, I thank Senator Billick uh, for the question, and it's an important question that affects uh, all of us, and many Australians, particularly those with mortgages, but also those with savings accounts. The Independent Reserve Bank has made its decision today to increase interest rates by another 50 basis points, bringing the cash rate to 1.85%. Now, Australians knew that this was coming, but it doesn't make it any easier to handle. The cycle of rate rises commenced before the election in response to the inflationary pressures that emerged before the election. Average homeowners owing $330,000 will have to find about $90 a month more for repayments, on top of the $220 extra in repayments since early May. For Australians with a typical $500,000 mortgage, it's an extra $140 a month, in addition to the extra $335 they've had to find since early May. Now, this won't come as a surprise to many, but it, is a, it's, um, it will still be a shock to many households. Families will have to make more hard decisions about how to balance the household budget in the face of pressures like higher grocery prices and how higher power prices, which the member for Hume kept hidden from them prior to the election. As a government, we are focusing on um, the economic plan we took to the election campaign that it makes the sensible investments into childcare, into skills, into digital services, using the National Reconstruction Fund, making uh, childcare cheaper and lowering the price of energy through uh, the Powering Australia plan. These are the commitments that we made in the election. These are the commitments we will do, uh, and we will monitor all of these um, in their lead up to the October budget uh, and the decisions we take about there, which will be primarily about fixing the waste and rorts um, of the previous government and implementing the election commitments that we took. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Senator Billick, first supplementary. Thank you. And thank you for that answer, Minister. Can the Minister update the Senate on how this decision might impact Australians with savings accounts? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President, and I thank Senator Billick for the supplementary. Obviously, higher interest rates primarily 
affect mortgage holders, but there's also an impact on savers as well. As the Treasurer pointed out earlier today, he's found, in, he's found it disappointing uh, that higher interest rates weren't necessarily being passed on to savers and that he would raise this directly with the banks. And I'm sure that those opposite would support that approach. The Treasurer has said that savers have been the principal victims of interest rates when they've been incredibly low and that they should be the beneficiaries of rising interest rates. He said they've been doing it for tough for some time now and it's time that they got a bit of relief and the government certainly supports that approach. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Second supplementary, Senator Billick. Thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government's plans will support Australians during this challenging economic period? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Billick for the supplementary. Australians knew that the problems like high and rising inflation have been made worse by a decade of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities and those opposite. The Albanese government's economic plan is a direct response to the economic challenges that we face right now. Responsible cost of living relief, cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, addressing the supply side inflationary challenges and taking the speed limit off the economy like investing in skills and productivity cleaner and cheaper energy get that one senator henderson getting wages moving again and beginning the very difficult work of budget repair so that the trillion dollars of liberal debt doesn't grow bigger and bigger for generations to come thank you minister uh, senator david pocock thank you president my question is to, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Farrell. This week is National Homelessness Week, which draws attention to the over 100,000 people who experience homelessness tonight and every night this week. In places like the ACT, the dangers of homelessness, especially for rough sleepers, are particularly acute in winter. Could the Minister provide an update on progress in the development of the promised national housing strategy? Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and uh, I thank uh, <coughs> Senator uh, Pocock for his uh, question, uh, which is um, obviously a um, very serious issue, uh, not uh, just in the ACT, uh, which he uh, referred to, but ac across the country. And uh, of course, um, what uh, the Labor Party uh, has inherited after uh, nine years of neglect on this, uh, on this uh, subject matter, of course, is a very serious uh, situation. Um, and, of course, the decision today by the Reserve Bank to increase uh, interest rates uh, certainly uh, hasn't made uh, that, uh, that issue any easier to, uh, to deal with. Um, I'm quite... Th Thanks for that uh, um, intervention. Minister uh, thanks Farrell, for that. direct your questions to the chair, please. I'm quite capable of answering the question uh, without any support, particularly from you. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but look, 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 Order. look there's, a, there's a serious issue here. Senator Pocock has raised a serious uh, issue, and I'd like, I'd like to. Well, I have been answering it. I have Minister been answering Farrell, it. please um, direct your questions to the Sorry. president, not across the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, but what we've seen is uh, a legacy of inaction on the part of the uh, previous government, um, and uh, it's the intention of this government to. Um oh, I beg your pardon, Senator Lambie. Point of relevance. Um, that's nice to go and blame the government for the last all that time you've chewed up. But I think that, uh, with all due respect to Senator Pocock, if you could just answer his question, that would be wonderful. Thank, Thank you. You can go and play all the games you like. Thank you, like Senator Lambie. Um, I'll remind uh, the minister of the question. Are you seeking a point of order, Senator Pocock? I'd repeat the question. No, the question doesn't need to be repeated. Okay. Thank you. Minister Farrell. Now, in stark contrast to what uh, the opposition uh, did in, uh, in its time in government, Australia, Australia, Australia has finally uh, got a government Thank in Canberra. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thanks. Uh, my last question was an update on the progress in the development of the promised national housing strategy. 
The first supplementary is about the commitment to build 30,000 new social and affordable homes over the next year. Noting the urgency of this task, when can we expect to see enabling legislation introduced and construction to actually start? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Pocock for his first uh, supplementary uh, question. Um, I, I think um, we should start by sort of pointing out that uh, one of the first things that the Albanese government did uh, when they came to power was, for the first time, uh, incorporate uh, <coughs> into cabinet the position of uh, housing and uh, homelessness. So, you're asking a question about what, what are we planning to do. Well, I'd start by, um, by suggesting that uh, the decision to put um, the, uh, that portfolio into cabinet is, is, um, is a very good start in dealing with these uh, serious issues. Um, now, we've got a very uh, significant and a very strong reform agenda. You have mentioned some of the projects that we're uh, planning to, uh, to implement. Um, well, we've been, in, we've been in government two months. Thank you, two Minister months. Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Order. <laughs> Order. Will the government consider wiping the historic $100 million ACT housing debt, as it has previously done for Tasmania and South Australia? to immediately free up funds that can be invested in building more social housing. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank, um, thank Senator Pocock for his uh, supplementary, uh, supplementary question. Um, that particular issue, of course, is not uh, an issue uh, in the uh, purview of the uh, Minister for, uh, for Housing. Of course, it's um, an issue uh, for the, uh, for the uh, Treasurer uh, to deal with. Um, um, but, but I'm very happy to have a chat to him about that issue, and I'll come back to you with a response. Thank you. Senator Nampajinka Price. <coughs> Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Gallagher. Last night on the ABC's Q&A program, the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney, stated that Labor plans to ingrain a body likened to ATSIC in the Constitution. Given the failure of ATSIC to improve the outcomes, opportunities and hopes of Indigenous people in areas of health, education and employment, and the fact Labor supported the abolition of ATSIC, why is the Minister for Indigenous Australians using ATSIC as the basis for the Labor Party's model. Thank you, Senator. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, um, President. I thank Senator Price for the, um, the question. and I would begin by acknowledging the huge amount of work uh, that the Mi Minister for Indigenous Affairs, assisted uh, by Senator Malandiri McCarthy and Senator Dodson, have done uh, in uh, supporting the Prime Minister and the announcement he made uh, on Saturday about uh, progressing a referendum and, and a voice, uh, treaty and truth. Um, this is a period of time, and certainly we, we discussed it this morning in our party room, of enormous pride uh, to get behind and build momentum uh, to amend the constitution with a referendum. Um. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator, uh, Senator Catch. <laughs> I'm sorry, Madam President. With all due respect to Senator Gallagher, Senator Nambajimba Price's question was very, very clear. It was in relation to comments made by the Minister on ATSIC and why the Minister for Indigenous Australians is using ATSIC as the basis for the Labor Party's model. It wasn't about the work that had been done to date. It wasn't about right, anything you, yet Senator that Cash. Senator Gallagher uh, is Senator referring Watt. to. <coughs> it was the voice. The minister is relevant. Uh, order. Order. Senator Nampajinka's... The minister is relevant. Thank you. And I'd ask the senator to withdraw. Minister Wong, please that is a reflection on the... On Um, 
Thank you. Senator Brockman? I, I wish to just add on the point of order. I, I'm, I, I've just reviewed the question and it had no mention Thank of the voice. Thank had you. No Senator mention Brockman, of the voice, Madam President. Senator Brockman, please resume your seat. I'm about to rule on the uh, point of order. I listen very carefully. Order. I listened very carefully to the question. It was broad-ranging. It did talk about Q&A. It talked about ATSIC. It talked about the health and welfare of First Nations peoples in this country. Um, I've listened carefully to uh, Minister Gallagher, who's um, still got a minute 15 to go. And uh, if she is not addressing the question, I will draw it to her attention. Uh, thank you, Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Madam President. And I didn't see. Um the minister's comments, but I, I know the minister well and have had many conversations with her about this, as I have with many of my colleagues on this uh, side of the chamber. Um, and the point, I think, of uh, the discussions that we've been having since the Prime Minister's uh, address on Saturday was really about progressing um, constitutional recognition for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that has been worked on for many, many years. Um, and Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Cash. Uh, President, with all due respect, yet again the question was very, very clear. It was in relation to comments about ATSIC and why the Minister for Indigenous Australians is using ATSIC as the basis for the Labor Party model. I would put it to you, and, and I may have to request that you do have a look at your rulings, the mere mention of a word in a question does not enable thank the you, minister to refer Senator, to that particular thank you. word as thank the answer. You, Senator Cash. I'll take advice from the clerk. Um, Senator Cash and other senators have drawn have drawn uh, Minister Gallagher back to a part of the question, and I will invite the senator to continue. I will invite the minister to continue answering the question. Well, thank you. As I said, I didn't hear the comments that the minister made, but I understand the approach that she and, and Senator Dodson, as the special envoy, are bringing, and, and Senator uh, Malandiri McCarthy, as assistant minister, are bringing to this discussion. As the prime minister has said, there will be further consultation and deliberation with First Nations people and the community more broadly as we work towards the referendum. But we have been talking about this for 15 years. We want the debate around it to be respectful. We want pe to bring people together on the journey and we want to get the outcome in the end. And that is what Minister Burney and all of us are working towards. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Nampajinka Price, first supplementary. Thank you. Again, on last night's ABC Q&A program, the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney, stated that there will be extensive consultation conducted before legislation is drafted and that the general public will get to decide what the voice will be. Earlier on the same day, the Prime Minister outlined that the Australian Parliament would decide what the voice will look like after the referendum. On behalf of all Australians, can the minister please clarify who is correct, the Prime Minister or Minister Burney? Thank you, Senator. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. And again, I think the approach that the Prime Minister has made is around consulting and consulting widely. That work uh, needs to be undertaken. Um, minister Burney will be leading that along with Senator Dodson. Uh, and obviously there will be a, a, a mechanism for the voice, uh, but we are not uh, determining that ourselves for too long. Um, 
policies have been imposed rather than developed, and that is the work that needs to be done now. There is no point, uh, and we won't play the game of dividing people based on certain quotes that I haven't, haven't heard. This is, a, this is a process where we would like to work together to reach across the chamber, to hear different views, to have that fed back in. We understand there isn't unanimous agreement even in this parliament, let alone outside the parliament. So let's work together to deliver a magnificent outcome for this country. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Senator Nambajinka Price, second supplementary. Thank you. Domestic, family and sexual violence is now in the Northern Territory 64 per cent higher than 2016. How will The Voice practically change this statistic? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. And I think this is the debate about whether it's uh, an argument about symbolism versus practicality and practical implementation of policies. We would say that we need both, um, that you have um, recognition of the oldest continuous culture in, in the planet, recognised in our constitution, but at the same time that you implement uh, and improve through consulting rather than imposing and bringing people together the policies that are designed to support First Nations people, that we do both and that they are interlinked. That is the whole point. That is the whole point. It's not one or the other. There is a universal agreement that we need to see improvements for First Nations people in a whole range of areas, in health, in education, in jobs, in economic security, housing, uh, community safety, all of that. But that doesn't mean Thank we you, should Minister walk away Gallagher, from this opportunity. Order. S Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Order. Senator Thorpe, when I call you to order, I expect you to stop shouting out. Senator Lambie or Senator Tyrrell? I've got Senator Lambie, thank you. Yeah, sorry, Madam President. Um, my question is for Minister representing the Minister of Financial Services, Senator Gallagher. Minister, right now superannuation managers can only spend their members' money to support their members' financial wellbeing. I would have thought that's just basic common sense, but somehow Labor doesn't agree. Don't you care if directors spend Australians' retirement money on stuff they don't need? We know they'll go back to paying for flashy corporate retreats and news websites like they were doing before we changed the laws. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Uh, President, I missed the first part of the question. So could I, sorry, <laughs> Senator Lambie, I really couldn't hear it. Senator Lambie, please repeat the first part of your question. Thank you, uh, thank you um, Madam President. Minister, right now superannuation managers can only spend their members' money to support their members' financial wellbeing. I would have thought that's just basic common sense, but somehow Labor doesn't agree. Don't you care if directors spend Australians' retirement money on stuff they don't need? We know they'll go back to paying for flashy corporate retreats and news websites like they were doing before we changed the laws. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Madam President. I, I will have to come back uh, to Senator Lambie on that question. I'm sorry. I, I would want detail before I provide an answer to the chamber. I don't want to be incorrect and have to come back and correct the record, but my apologies. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Um, thank you, Madam President. Everybody knows super managers make, make donations to political parties and industry groups which I bet many members do not know and which I do not like, but at least they have to tell members who they're donating to and how much they're giving them. Why is Labor proposing to change that? Aren't you guys supposed to be about transparency? That's what you sold during your election. Or do you only care about transparency when you're trying to win elections? Thank you, Senator Lambie. A Minister no, Gallagher. we are a big supporter of transparency. Um, Madam President, and we'll be a lot more transparent than those opposite have ever been in a whole range of areas. As to the detail, I will come back to Senator Lambie with an answer. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Order! Order! I don't believe Senator Lambie has been interjecting when you've answered que asked questions, and I would ask you to give her that same respect. Second supplementary, Senator Lambie. Um, thank you, Madam President. Labor says the changes are about reducing complexity, 
for directors, but directors still have to tell members how much they spend on donations, just not where the donation money is going to. Won't that mean they'll have to keep those records anyway? Isn't this really just about hiding super money going to Labor and the unions? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Um, well, the answer to that is no. Thank you. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Senator, uh, order. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, uh, President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Skills and Training, Senator Watt. According to the OECD, Australia is experiencing the second most severe labour shortage in the developed world. Can the minister update the Senate on the government's progress in implementing the, its commitment to hold a Jobs and Skills Summit and outline what measures the Albanese government has already taken to address skills shortage? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. I think I know this is an issue you've worked on for many years, particularly in your committee roles. As every employer and worker in Australia knows, our country is facing a skill shortage crisis. This is the workplace legacy of a decade of training cuts and inaction from an incompetent coalition government. And projections are that nine out of every ten new jobs over the next five years will need a post-school qualification, heightening the need for Order. greater investment in our training system. The failure of the former government, which they are really upset to be reminded of, to invest in skills is one of the key causes of our economy's capacity constraints and the higher inflation that's resulted. And that's why the Albanese Labor government is taking action right now. The Jobs and Skills Summit in September is part of delivering on our election promise to bring people together, something the last government was incapable of doing, and find common ground on some of our tough economic challenges. Of course, as Senator Gallagher has pointed out, we have inherited a budget with a trillion dollars in debt. So the government will ensure that any measures taken will provide a good economic return. Australians voted in May for a government that looks ahead and makes real plans for the future, so we can shape our future instead of just reacting to events and missing opportunities, something that we had to endure nearly 10 years of from those opposite. We know a lot of Australians are doing it tough, so a key focus of the summit will be how we can improve lives and livelihoods, raising incomes, creating good jobs and getting Australians the skills they need for the jobs of tomorrow. The summit will bring Australians together, including employers, unions, civil society and governments, to address our shared economic challenges. We need all sorts of skills in our country, whether they be traditional or new skills, and it's this government's actions, including the Jobs and Skills Summit, which will be good for jobs. Thank you, Minister good... Watt. Your time has expired. Um, Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. And I have to say that's the most satisfying answer I've received in the entire time I've been in this chamber. <laughs> can, can, the minister, can the minister advise the Senate uh, why it is O'Neill, important to hold Senator this job? Senator O'Neill, please resume your seat. You need to be able to answer your question uh, with, it, with quiet. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, um, Senator Watt. Can the minister advise the Senate why it is important to hold this Jobs and Skills Summit? Minister Watt. Senator O'Neill, I aim to please with my answers and I'll try and please you with this new one as well. The Albanese government took office at a time of rising inflation and interest rates, falling real wages and a trillion dollars of debt, uh, which is now more expensive to service. Now, it really does take some effort for a government to deliver at the same time falling wages and a skill shortage, because of course economic theory, orthodox economic theory, would suggest that if you have a skill shortage, rate wage wages would go, would go up. But at a time of skill shortages in this country, this ex-government ex sent them down. We know a lot of Australians are doing it tough, so a key focus of the Jobs and Skills Summit will be how we improve lives and livelihoods, raising incomes, creating good jobs, and getting Australians the skills they need Senator for McGrath. the jobs of tomorrow. Delivering the skills that our employers, our workers and our economy needs is a key step towards growing our economic capacity and dampening inflationary pressures. That's why the Albanese you, government Minister is hitting Watt, the ground running on this. Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Minister, and it's nice to get an answer full of hope and opportunity. 
Minister, what are the risks to the current skills shortage crisis if we don't have a government committed to investing in and reforming the skills and, sc and training sector? Minister Watt. Thank you again, Senator O'Neill. Well, unfortunately, after a decade of training cuts and inaction, we are now experiencing a coalition-led skill shortage crisis. A situation made worse by the previous government's decision to abandon migrant Minister workers Watt, during pandemic. Your seat. Minister Watt. Thank you, Madam President. I remember by week two it was starting to sink in for me as well, so I can understand the reaction that we've had this week. This situation of curse was made worse by the previous government's decision to abandon migrant workers during pandemic lockdowns, heightening the skill shortages that we saw across industries. And it's also true that the previous government failed to make an agreement with the state and territory governments on skills funding. Not one state or territory government signed up to the previous government's approach, whether they were Liberal or co Labor or Coalition. So it's no surprise when the previous government neglected TAFEs, the lifeblood of the vocational education and training system, and failed to do the work needed for our skills sector. Unlike the former government, we're hitting the ground running, we're taking responsibility. Minister Watt, and we're your time has expired. Please resume your seat. Minister Wong. That was the last Order. one, Elizabeth. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Uh, and while I'm on my free feet, if I may, uh, yesterday in question time, in response to a question from Senator Thorpe, I undertook to get some further information, if it were available, about the process of design for Makarata Commission. I have written to Senator Thorpe. There is uh, little additional to add to the answer, but given I gave the undertaking, I seek leave to ta I table them my response to Senator Thorpe. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Deputy President, I rise to take note of answers from Senator Gallagher. Uh, Deputy President, once again we've seen today from the Labor Party a severe lack of economic literacy. We've seen again, following on the theme this week, that they have no idea as to how to tackle the cost of living crisis in this country. We have seen severe impacts on the price of groceries. Obviously, we have seen huge increases to the cost of fuel. Uh, we have seen massive increases to people's mortgage repayments. And Labor is basically saying, well, wait till the budget, wait till October. We we're not going to do anything about it till October. You know, we're, we're a fiscally responsible government, honestly, but you know, we don't have anything to do now to help Australians. We're going to wait till October. So I think quite rightly the Australian people would be watching closely. They'd be watching this government very closely, and they would be starting to worry that they're actually is no plan, that there is no plan to tackle the inflationary pressures in our economy. There is no plan to tackle the cost of living pressures faced by Australian families, uh, particularly uh, in my constituency, the, everything outside the city I love to talk about uh, in regional areas, the cost of fuel alone, the cost of fuel alone is such a significant pressure. Families who now have to make a decision as to whether to continue the Saturday morning football, the Saturday morning football, because the cost of driving the car to practice and then to the game on the weekend is simply too much for the household budget. This is not necessarily something that will affect those in this place. Certainly won't affect the union officials who are advising this government, but it does affect families out there, whether it's in suburbia, whether it's in outer metro Australia, whether it's in regional Australia. 
These pressures are very real. And 6.1 per cent is the, is the headline number, but everyone out there who does the weekly grocery shopping knows that the costs pressures, particularly on groceries, are seemingly much higher than that. Uh, you, you are seeing extraordinary pressure uh, on household budgets in terms of balancing the books, making sure people can get through the week, making sure they can do those extra things that they want to for their kids. And we see again today that we have a government with no plan, no strategy to help Australian families now. Wait till October is the answer. We're responsible. Well, you will be responsible. You'll be responsible for an awful lot of economic pain unless you get these settings right. As the Leader of the Opposition, uh, the Hon. Peter Dutton, in the other place said, Australia, the Australian economy needs a very finely balanced response. The government needs to provide a very finely balanced response. We have to protect Australian families for cost of living pressures and a wage price spiral. This government needs to be able to deal with both sides of the issue, and it is a test of leadership for this Prime Minister. And instead, we have Jim Chalmers talking about putting a union rep on the board of the RBA. How is that, how is that going to help? How, how is that going to help? How is that going to help the Australian families who are struggling to make ends meet, Senator O'Neill? How is that going to help the Australian families who are make, struggling to make ends meet? Now, I, those opposite, those opposite care Order more right. about putting a union official on the board of the RBA than they do about balancing families' budgets. And the interjections from those opposite just shows that. Just shows that that you care, you don't arc up until I mention the union rep on the RBA, and then you arc up, don't you? I mean, you, goodness Senator gracious. Senator Steele. Mr President, thank you so much. You know, I sat here and thought today, how many gifts from heaven can fall in my lap today? Well, Senator Brockman, you damn beauty. Thank you so much, dear Lord. I'm coming back. You want to talk about the price of in cost, uh, the increasing costs of, of living? Don't go, don't go. Come back, send the I've got respect for you. It's just that you do mix with some strange people. I'll give you four words: Josh Frydenberg. I'll give you another two: Scott Morrison. You want to talk about the cost of living? I'll tell you what happened. Let's cast our mind back to uh, uh, mid-May when those two geniuses of the Liberal Party thought it was a fantastic idea, anything it took to win a vote. So how can we con people that, 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 that they should vote for us again, even though we've been absolutely incompetent and done five-eighths of nothing? Oh, uh, no, Fawcett, Senator Fawcett, uh, you're better me, than Senator this. Uh, Senator started. Fawcett has a point of order. Po point of order, Deputy President. My good friend Senator Still would understand Standing Order 193, subpara 3, that imputations of improper motives are not in order. I'd ask you to reflect on your comments, Senator Still, and restrain yourself where you sail close to the standing orders. Oh, for, you, for you, Mr Acting Deputy President, it would be my privilege. For my good friend Senator Fawcett, there's my second gift from heaven. Lord, this is getting better. I'm coming back. And when they thought that it was a great idea in the dark of night to slash the diesel fuel credits from the transport industry, from the road transport industry and from the agricultural industry. Now, anyone with half a peanut in their head would understand where I'm going on this one. So our truckies and our agriculture industry get 17.8 cents, and Senator Brockman, I wish you were still here, 17.8 cents per litre to claim back every three months in their bass. Guess what happened? There was not a 22 per cent reduction in, in diesel costs because they stole the 17.8 diesel fuel credits from the road transport industry and the agricultural industry. And I'll tell you what happened. All they got, the truckies, was a four cent a litre reprieve or reprisal, whatever the word is. But I've got to tell you, in the last 12 months, I know because I sit at the bowels of fueling up trucks in my part-time. It's a fun thing. You should 
paid. The whole lot of you should try it. When I watch diesel go from $1.50 a litre to $2.40 a litre, don't worry about the rip-off of the 17.8 cents. There's all that cost of diesel going too. So what actually happens in the real world, a lot of the big boys, the big operators, they have the ability, because when they negotiate their contracts, they have what are called fuel levies. I'm not going to insult your intelligence, Senators, because you are the three smartest ones on that side. I'll give you that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The majority of the transport—no, three. Let's leave it at three, Matt. You and I, mates. Let's keep it that way. Now, the majority of the transport industry—so there's about 70 per cent of the road transport industry that is mum and dad businesses, small to medium enterprise, so, so, so to speak. Who, who, who have no ability to negotiate the fuel levy, and you wonder why? Oh, gee whiz! I can't believe. Can I ask for an extension of time, please, Mr. Acting Deputy President? I'll go for an hour on this. That's underwater with a gold full of marbles. Who do not have the ability to put the cost back onto their costs? So you wonder why we see ten cents a litre? Uh, uh, sorry, ten, <laughs> ten dollar iceberg lettuces. The cost of transport, road transport and agriculture has gone through the roof. Scott Morrison, Josh Frydenberg, and you know the worst part about this? Not one of you said a darn thing. You know darn well it was the wrong thing. You knew it was just so uh, criminal to allow your previous Prime Minister and Treasurer to try and con the people of Australia. But the worst part is it did me another favour. Another, another prize of present fell in my lap because they absolutely disrespected the road transport industry. And the only thing that saved them is the, is, is, is the, the complete incompetence of the Australian Trucking Association, which I do rightfully call it the Canberra branch of the National Party. They don't represent the transport industry, but they weren't going to say anything to their nat and lib mates. Well, I've got to tell you, thank goodness that everyone else rose their voices. Kid you not, you brag about saving 22 cents a litre for the average family car, and for some families that would make a difference, absolutely. But for the $13 extra that they saved on the Hyundai that got fueled up once a week, put another nearly $30 in the cost of groceries at Woolworths, Coles and other stores, and you think that's good mathematics? And the good burgers of Australia woke up to you, because I couldn't wait to tell every single Australian who was listening what Josh Frydenberg and Scott Morrison pulled over over their eyes, while sadly the rest of you just sat there like lemmings going over the edge of the cliff. Well, guess what? It's still a major problem. The trucking industry and the agriculture industry is not the Commonwealth or the, the Bank of Australia. You've paid for your sins. But well, I'll tell you what, some of you, and not you three good ones over there, the rest of you and that side over there, how you look in the mirror or how they look in the mirror at night and think that they've been a great representative of their communities. See how we go when the small family businesses come to you in tears because their business has gone Thank you, what? Senator Stirl. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to take note of answers by Senator Gallagher and supported by her ministerial counterpart, uh, Senator Watt. Uh, with your Scottish surname, I'll start off with this. Um, the concept of history being written is often attributed to Winston Churchill, but in actual fact, uh, it is traced back to the 1746 of the Battle of Culloden in Scotland, where one of the clan leaders lamented he didn't know how many members of his clan died on the battlefield because it's the victor who writes the history and counts the dead. And can I say, Deputy President, today we have seen a lot of that in this place. Almost every second sentence in the answers that have been provided is about what was inherited or the former government and talking about the need to recreate and reinvest in things that are claimed to have uh, been a failure. The test that the Treasurer, who Senator Gallagher represents, uh, held out for himself about the success of their government was what happens to power prices, what happens with apprentices and manufacturing and what happens with wages. And so there's been a lot of talk about training and manufacturing and skills uh, in this question time. I think it's really important to place on the record the fact that last year, in the last full year of the coalition government under Prime Minister Scott Morrison, there was a record $6.4 billion in skills and investment. We actually had the most apprentices in training since record began in 1963. Let me just repeat that. The most apprentices in training since records began in 1963. And part of the reason for that 
is because of the strategic investments that the Morrison government made in areas of manufacturing. And so we had the Modern Manufacturing Initiative and Fund, which sought to identify those areas which were critical to Australia's security and Australia's future. Now that went to important areas such as defence, space, medical goods, supply chain resilience, critical minerals, the things that the world has identified, particularly during the period of COVID, are critical to a nation's security. And we have seen not only the government funding that has gone into those programs, but co-investment from industry, which has led to some of the great outcomes in terms of the numbers of people in training, but has also led to things like the unemployment rate being down at 3.9 per cent and decreasing. So to go to Senator Gallagher and her representing the Treasurer and the test that he has set, where he said the test is what happens with manufacturing and apprentices, unlike the coalition who worked with industry to invest in more productive capacity, which led them to invest, to employ people, to train people around apprentices, we see a talk fest. The plan from the Labor government is a talk fest. That's what their plan is on skills. And when it comes to manufacturing, for those who read The Australian on the 24th of July, there was quite a substantive article expressing concerns which I have heard on the ground from people within both the space and the defence sector, that the razor gang within the Albanese government, as they seek to find savings ahead of the budget, have actually put a pause on the modern manufacturing grants, which means that companies who have invested, who have employed, who have started to train people, are now expressing concern to me and were expressing concern to the journalist who wrote the article that these projects which underpin Australia's sovereignty, our security, our supply chain resilience are now in doubt. So manufacturing has actually been stalled by the Albanese government. And so as the Australian public consider these first couple of months of the government, they should compare the positive investment that led to new jobs, new innovation, training for our children and future generations versus a talk fest and a razor gang that has put all of those investments at doubt. And the Australian public, I think, in time will realise that those people who have chosen to rewrite history in actual fact have no real plan to create a future. Senator O'Neill. Deputy President, and uh, I rise with pleasure to refute some of the nonsense that we have heard in the contributions from those who are speaking for the opposition today. And they may rail at the answers that they're receiving, but the reality is they're on the end of a bit of truth-telling. After nine years of deception and a a thimble and pea tricks that have populated this government's action, Australian people know it's hurting. I talk to people in the retail sector very, very frequently. People are now finding it really hard when they get to the checkout to make ends meet. And that is because when we came into government, and with not only a trillion dollars in debt, this government has left this country in a state where we found we have rising inflation, rising interest rates, supply chain disruption, as Senator Gallagher indicated, no investment in skills and an energy market that is in crisis. That's the reality of what nine years of the former government delivered. And yet they come in here and act as if they gave Australians a great experience and they left us all fine. It's a joke. It's like when, you, when you've got kids and they're about seven or eight and, they, and you say, oh, go in and tidy up your room, you know, and they just stuff everything under the doona cover and pull the lid over the top and pretend it's not there. Well, that's the equivalent of the 23rd energy policy of, of a Minister Hume. Right, he had 22 goes at trying to deliver some policies. No market certainty. No wonder smart people weren't putting their money behind this government because they couldn't tell which way they were going to turn any day. They had no solution. So he brings out the doona and puts it over four days before the election. Can't tell the truth. 
throw the doona over it just so the Australian people don't know that there's been a 19 per cent increase in energy, because they'll never figure it out. The contempt for the Australian people that is manifest in the questions that are being asked by this opposition and by their responses, which absolutely fail in a court that looks at fact. And that's what Australian families are faced with, the fact that inflation delivered by the policies of this government is making it harder for them, the fact that they had to pay through the nose for training, the fact that this government didn't tell them the truth on so many occasions, so many occasions, so contemptuous of the Australian people were the former government that Minister Taylor thought it was okay to cover up a massive increase in the cost of energy that was going to flow through into the, the economies of each of the families of this country. And that is why they lost the election. Because in the end, you can only put the doona over it for so long. And the adults have to come in. Maturity has to enter. Proper conversations have to be had. Now, this afternoon, those in the opposition have characterised the skills and training uh, forum that's going to be held, a national forum to deal with the fact that we haven't got enough workers for our small businesses to actually operate effectively. They want to call it a talk fest. They don't know anything about talking. If they actually had talked properly into the Australian people, they would have come up with policies that wouldn't have landed us with the situation that we find ourselves in, with rising inflation with a trillion dollars in debt, with supply chain disruption. All of that is because of their failure to have authentic conversations, real conversations about what mattered to this country. So it's a bit rich when they come in here and start trying to run a line that there's no plan. There's plenty of plan. There was a plan that we took to the election. There's a plan enlivened the vision of Australians for a better future for themselves and their children, for small businesses, for people who want to get training, for people who want to employ people who get training. We have a plan and we've begun to implement it already with the legislation that's been brought into this place. Now, those opposite don't like it and they are attempting in this first period of our being in this place to rewrite history, to absolve themselves of the sins of their failures in public policy. And nowhere is that more evident than in the hip pocket pain of every business, of every household that is suffering the consequences of years and years of neglect in dealing with the energy reality of Australia. They thank should you, not be you, attended Senator to. They failed the nation. They're on the correct side of the chamber. Senator Scar. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Gallagher uh, to my friend Senator Brockman. Um, in relation to Senator Stirl's contribution, I'd, I'd like to make some preliminary comments. And I think uh, it is important that everyone is aware of the fact, uh, including those who join us in the gallery, that Senator Stirl does an outstanding job uh, delivering uh, household items, furniture to those in need in remote places of, uh, of Western Australia. Um, and I commend Senator Stirl on it. And to the extent, mate, that the prices have gone up on diesel. I'm happy to kick in. So, um, so I'd just like to make those comments in relation to Senator Stirl. Uh, but the rea reality is, the reality is, there are cost of living pressures which are being faced by Australians all over this country. And the question is, what is going to happen? What is going to happen when those Australians go to fill up their cars? after the diesel fuel excise rebate was cut by, by half. What is going to happen to those Australian when the, Australians when the fuel excise uh, being cut in half is reversed, comes to an end, comes to an end in September? What are they going to do? And we are starting to hear stories now, and I heard more stories today, of parents, especially in some of our more challenged socioeconomic areas, who are now making choices are now making choices. Do I use that petrol in my car to do the shopping to go to work, or do I use it to take my son or daughter to sport 
or participate in all sorts of events that every child in this country has a right to expect they should have an opportunity to participate in. So the question is, what is the government going to do? What is the government going to do to practically, to practically take action to confront those cost of living, uh, cost of living pressures? The reality is that in the last budget, 2022-23, brought down by the former government, on page nine under budget priorities, page nine under budget priorities was addressing cost of living pressures and managing current changes through, and I quote, a temporary and targeted cost of living package, including a $420 cost of living tax offset for low and middle income earners. That's what we did in government. That's what we did in government. What is the new government going to do? What is their plan? A $250 cost of living payment for eligible Australian pensioners, welfare recipients, veterans and concession cardholders. $250 in the pocket of all those pensioners and welfare recipients. That was the former government's plan. That's what we did in government. What is the new government going to do? What is their plan? These are reasonable questions that should be asked in this place. What is your plan? Again, I know I've talked about the 50 per cent reduction in petrol and diesel excise, an excise equivalent customs duty for six months that will deliver an average benefit of around $300 to households with at least one vehicle. That was our plan, introduced and delivered, delivered at every petrol bowser across this state, across this country. What is the government's plan? What are they going to do when that policy runs out? within the six-month period in September. What are they going to do? Because Australians all over this country are going to be confronted with that additional 22 cents a litre every time they go to fill up their car. What is the government's plan? We do not know. There is no plan. And these are legitimate answers which are being asked by the opposition, as is our responsibility as an opposition in this place. And then there's the question. There's the question today. Just today, interest rates have gone up. The cash rate is now at 1.85 per cent. 1.85 per cent. It isn't since 1994, 1994 during the Hawke-Keating years, that we've had four consecutive interest rate increases. In four consecutive months, you've got to go all the way back to 1994. Was the last time that happened? What is the government's plan to address cost of living pressures? because Australians are being hit from all sides. They're being hit from all sides in terms of fuel prices, grocery prices, rental, uh, rents are increasing, uh, interest rates. They're being hit from all sides, all sides. I mean, certainly um, during my time in this place, I haven't seen this sort of uh, conflation of all these factors occurring at the same time, hitting Australians in their back pocket. What is the government going to do? What is your plan? Thank you, Senator Scar. I'll put the question on the motion moved by Senator Brockman. Those for the question say aye, against no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, to you uh, Deputy President. I uh, move that the Senate uh, take note of the response given by uh, Senator Gallagher to the question I asked. Uh, in question time, and uh, the question, of course, was focused around um, interest rates. And uh, as we've just heard, uh, the Reserve Bank has just lifted rates again by uh, by 50 basis points. And interestingly, uh, we heard last month the governor of the Reserve Bank uh, basically jawboning down wages, uh, saying he didn't want to see um, wages over. Uh, a particular level, but uh, no matter how hard I listened and many other Australians listened, what we didn't hear was the Governor of the Reserve Bank jawboning down um, corporate profits. Uh, that's something that we didn't hear, but we did hear him jawboning down wages. Now, um, the problem that we've got uh, is that uh, we haven't heard uh, anything of that nature from the Governor of the Reserve Bank, but we also uh, haven't heard anything of that nature from this government, and uh, we didn't hear uh, the Treasurer, Dr Chalmers, in his statement to the House 
last week, uh, neglected to mention the role that corporate profiteering is happen having on um, putting upwards pressure on inflation in this country. And despite being asked uh, repeatedly by me in this place, the, the finance minister, uh, the minister representing the treasurer, uh, Senator Gallagher, uh, has also not acknowledged uh, the role that corporate profiteering is playing on um, putting upwards pressure on interest rates. And I want to be clear that the Greens do acknowledge uh, some of the supply side uh, issues that, uh, that are contributing to inflation. Um, uh, that includes um, things like um, supply chain issues, pandemic, um, war, uh, climate change, although we don't give this government a free pass on climate change because, let us not forget, they are one of the most fossil fuel addicted governments in the world. But we do acknowledge those supply side shocks, but we want to hear the government start to acknowledge the role that corporate profiteering is playing. Um, there's been a class war underway in this country for 40 years since Hawke and Keating turbocharged neoliberalism in the mid 1980s, and it is absolutely unarguable that the rich, the billionaire class, are winning that war. You only have to look at what happened during the first two years of the pandemic. Billionaires stupendously and obscenely increased their wealth as corporate profits went through the roof. And it's this corporate profiteering that is helping, pushing, helping to push the price of things up. It's the perfect but terrible storm for working people because wages are going backwards in real terms. Workers' pay packets are shrinking in real terms just as everything else is getting more expensive. And now you've got the RBA coming in over the top, jacking up rates. And who's going to feel the pain? Not the billionaires, not the super wealthy, not the corporations or most of their shareholders, not on your life. It's not those people, it's not the politicians, all of us in here earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Because remember, Labor's promised we're all going to get a big fat tax cut with the stage three income tax cuts. And we're going to get looked after $240 billion of expenditure that Labor is committed to that will deliver nothing, literally nothing, to someone on the minimum wage. But we'll all get a big fat real pay rise. The people that are going to get hurt are the people who can't afford to buy political outcomes. Recent home buyers who paid the highest price in history for their new homes, lulled by a reserve bank who told them there'd be no interest rate rises for another two years. It's renters, many of whom are already stretched to or beyond breaking point, who will have to suck up again another rent rise, rise to pay off their landlord, landlord's mortgage. There is a better way. Introduce a corporate super profits tax address some of that corporate profiteering, help tackle inflation, but use the revenue to help tackle the cost of living crisis. Put dental into Medicare. Put mental health into Medicare. Provide free childcare. Start looking after the environment that ultimately sustains us all. By treating housing as a human right and not as an investment class, we can ensure that no one has to worry about the basic right of shelter in this country, and we could help people who are so terribly feeling the pain at the moment. Thank you, Senator McKimmett. I put the motion. Those of the questions say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given another day? Senator Gallagher, Minister Gallagher. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the Public Sector Superannuation Salary Legislation Amendment Bill 2022, allowing it to be considered during this period of sittings. I also table a statement of reasons justifying the need for the bill to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no Sorry, objection, leave is granted. Minister Gallagher? Any other That's notice? It. Okay, thank you. 
Are there any motion? Um, beg your pardon. Are there any mo notices of motion to be given? Oh, we've done that. Sorry. Uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? No. I'll call the clerk. Uh, President, postponement notifications have been lodged um, in respect of general business notice of motion number 10, postponed from today to the next day of sitting. Thank you. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. And I will move to general business notice of motion number 11, standing in the name of the leader of the Nationals in the Senate. No, I shall move somewhere else then. <laughs> I'll move to number 12 and come back to you. I'll beg your pardon, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I had um, handed in a postponement, but uh, perhaps you hadn't got it yet. Uh, so just to be clear, I'm uh, postponing item 13 uh, to the next day of sitting. I think it might be whizzing along as we speak. We'll take that, we'll take that as postponed. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, we'll move to general business notice of motion number 12, standing in the name of Senator Dodson. Senator Dodson, I'll come back to you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, I ask the general motion, uh, general business notice of motion number 12, propose, proposing a reference to the Joint Standing Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs be taken as formal and I move the motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll just ask you to move the motion, Senator Dodson. I move the motion. So the question, uh, uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, President. I seek leave to move uh, an, amem an amendment uh, which has been circulated. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Thorpe. I move the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dodson. A short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Dodson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, look, this is a uh, reference to a new committee. The committee hasn't yet had a meeting. Um, it's a complicated subject, and the committee, I think, ought to be accorded uh, some uh, courtesy as to the timelines, the workload, and the capacity to do its work of diligence and to report back to this uh, chamber at a time that it feels it can undertake the task and deliver the report that it will be so crucial to the future directions of our, of our, of our nation. Thank, Thank you, you Senator Dodson. Uh, Senator Rustin. Short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator um, Rustin. Thank you, President. Um, whilst we have some sympathy um, with Senator Thorpe's desire to have a reporting date on this particular um, referral, um, we also understand um, the importance of allowing a new committee to be newly formed to have the opportunity to explore the timelines that it may require in order to uh, fully and respectfully um, administer the requirements of that referral. So um, we won't be supporting um, Senator Thorpe's um, amendment to this particular referral, but we do um, put on the record that it would be our desire for timelines for reporting back of referrals to committees to be something that are considered in referrals um, so that we have an understanding of the duration of particular referrals. But in uh, recognition of the newness of this committee, Senator Johnson, we will support your um, motion unamended. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Thorpe. Leave to make us a one-minute statement. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted for one minute. Senator Thorpe. Uh, this inquiry started last year when I introduced the private senator's bill. I understand that it's not uh, within the system that you use here in parliament that a amendment happens to a private senator's bill, so I'll make that point. Uh, it's out of the ordinary, which I keep hearing every day. We've got to stick to the agenda. This is a little bit outside the agenda, so I think that's been an interesting process. Uh, as I said, this committee, this hearing and inquiry started last year. It's already received a number of submissions. 
uh, and people uh, have waited long enough to have our rights adhered to in this country. So a reporting date was important, but uh, I hope this isn't pushed out as part of a delay process. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. So the question is that the amendment is moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the, aye. the noes have it. The noes have it. So the question now is that the motion uh, unamended is moved by Senator Dodson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 11. Uh, Senator Askew. I ask that general business notice of motion number 11 be taken as a formal motion that was moved by Senator McKenzie. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. Move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Askew, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, some senators may have been expecting a ballot. We have had to postpone that till later in the afternoon. So we'll now move to the MPI. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 36 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Chandler proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you, Senators. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussions. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly and I call Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam President. I am pleased to speak on this matter of public importance on the topic of health, which is consistently the top priority for Australians and Tasmanians when it comes to the delivery of government services. In rural and regional areas around Australia, particularly in my state of Tasmania, one of the constant challenges for small communities is their ability to uh, attract and retain general practitioners. We see this problem regularly affecting communities, particularly in the electorate of Lyons. Communities like Ooze, which has been desperately trying to find GP providers to deliver primary care to that community. And indeed, we see the same problem occur regularly around Lyons when a GP in a local practice retires or moves on. When you speak to residents, medical practices and councils in any part of Lyons, whether it's Deloraine or New Norfolk, Brighton, Oatlands, the Tasman Peninsula, this is raised as a concern more often than any other topic. Communities right across Tasmania have experienced the difficulty in finding GPs to live and work in their communities. And of course, in regional areas, there is often an older and less mobile population who can't simply get in the car and drive to Hobart or drive to Launceston every time they need to see a doctor. They want to be able to have that service more closer to home. This is a long-standing challenge, Madam President, and there are no simple solutions. We all understand that in this place. But in the context of that challenge for regional Tasmania, it was disappointing that the government's main election tactic in Lyons was to spread misinformation about pensioners being forced onto the cashless debit card, misinformation that they continue to spread even after independent fact checks declared it false during the election campaign. And when it came to specific health policies, they flew down to Tasmania, re-announced the failed Kevin Rudd GP super clinic policy only for major cities, jumped on the plane and left again. The Australian Medical Association had a particularly interesting reaction to this GP super clinic policy at the time, and I do want to quote the AMA president. These centres will do little to relieve the hospital logjam, will further fragment care and will unfairly compete with general practices nearby, which, without this government funding, will not be able to keep their doors open after hours. The president went further. The plan acknowledges costs faced by general practices in opening after hours, but instead of enabling thousands of practices across the country to improve their offering to patients, it focuses on only 50 practices, using a model reminiscent of the failed Rudd-era GP super clinics. 
So this government policy will unfairly compete with the very general practices which are already having difficulties recruiting and retaining doctors in our regional and rural areas. And instead of recognising the great need in those areas of Tasmania, those areas in our regions, the super clinics are to be located only in Hobart, Launceston and Burnie. The recent decision of the Albanese government to include urban areas in the distribution priority model further exacerbates the difficulty in attracting doctors to rural parts of Tasmania. We now have a situation where incentives designed to attract GPs to move to rural and regional areas can now be used for GPs in urban areas, like Sydney. Medical practices and organisations in Tasmania have made it clear that if GPs have a choice between living in a state capital or moving to regional Tasmania, where they are desperately needed by those communities, then the likely outcome is that doctors will choose the capital city and it will be regional residents that miss out. If GPs who previously had an incentive to work in rural and regional parts of Tasmania can now get the same incentive for working in an urban area like Sydney or Brisbane, then that doesn't help. It doesn't fix the rural workforce issues. It just makes it worse. There is clearly no plan from the Labor government for rural and regional health workforces. They made plenty of noise during the campaign about their party being more focused on health. But just like their commitments that they'd reduce the cost of living and power prices for Australians as soon as they get into government, well, we're all starting to find out, Madam President, that those promises were completely hollow and those promises were completely meaningless. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Green. Oh, thank you, Madam President. And I'm very pleased to speak on this incredibly important issue. And I don't know if Senator Chandler is a fan of RuPaul's Drag Race. It doesn't really seem like her kind of show. But there's a saying on that show that I want to repeat right now. The cheek, the nerve, the gall, the audacity and the gumption. How dare those opposite come in here and talk about the GP crisis? How dare they come in here and talk about primary health care? How dare they come in here and lecture this government about how hard it is for people to see a GP in rural and regional areas? Because we know, after nine years of neglect, they created this problem, they made it worse, they refused to acknowledge it and they refused to do anything about it. It is absolutely disgraceful that they are now standing here and demanding plans, talking about action, when they did absolutely nothing for nine years. This government cares about people in rural and regional areas, and we care deeply, deeply about fixing the GP crisis. And I can tell you that uh, in my conversations um, with people in regional Queensland, it is well known, very well known, that people in Emerald have to wait 12 weeks to see a GP under the, under the former government. That means there are people right now who made an appointment when the last government was in power who are still waiting right now to get that appointment. The Labor government has been in power for 10 weeks. People in Emerald have to wait 12 weeks to see a GP. But when they were in government, the former government, they refused to do anything about this. What they did do was they cut Medicare, they froze the Medicare rebate, they drove primary health care into the ground, they refused to acknowledge that this was even an issue. When we moved a Senate motion to establish an inquiry to look into this issue, they voted against it. This is an issue that has been created by the former government and it is an issue that the Labor government will fix. It is an issue that the Labor government cares deeply about and has a plan to fix. But it is absolutely appalling for those opposite to come in here and talk about this issue. And I thank, I thank Senator Chandler for raising it. I can't think of another MPI that's more like a Dorothy Dixer ever, ever being received by the floor of this chamber. We've been meeting with doctors and practice managers all across the country and admin staff who are answering phones, and they tell us that they are incredibly hard working and they are just overwhelmed. That is the situation that was left behind. In these conversations that I have had with these people working in the industry, I can tell that they are desperate 
and I know the community is absolutely desperate. When you can't see a GP, where do you go? You end up in an emergency department at your local hospital, and we saw this time and time again through the COVID crisis, a complete denial from those opposite that, that the um, lack of GP access had anything to do with emergency departments being full. They refused to even acknowledge that it was an issue. The former government failed to improve the dire situation facing rural and regional areas. In fact, they contributed to actually making it worse. The lack of doctors and other medical professionals in, this, in these communities across Australia is not a new problem. It has been around for a very long time, and a series of government decisions by the former government during the pandemic meant that we had a spotlight put on this issue. Thank goodness, finally. But people were left with no healthcare options in their community. We wanted to see practical, positive solutions on the table to make sure Australians have access to quality healthcare regardless of where they live. And we were noisy during the campaign and we were noisy in opposition because we know that this government refused to acknowledge that there was even a crisis on their hands. This side of the chamber believes that if you have a Medicare card, you should be able to use it. But that is not the present situation for people living in rural and regional areas. I want to acknowledge that many people individual residents, GPs, peak bodies, academics and others who took time to engage with the Senate committee process, whether it be through a written submission or providing evidence at a public hearing, we heard your call. We listened. The Labor senators on that committee listened to the evidence that was being given. And here is what our government will do. I can assure you, I can assure the Senate that the Albanese government is committed to investing in general practice and strengthening Medicare with almost a $1 billion investment. Our Strengthening Medicare Task Force will identify the best ways to boost affordability, improve access and deliver better support for patients with ongoing and chronic illness, backed by $750 million in the Strengthening Medicare Fund. We made this commitment before the election and we've moved quickly. The Minister for Health has already appointed members to the task force and they are getting straight to work. We are working with the experts. We are making sure that the experts are around the table and we are taking their advice. We are listening, something that those opposite failed to do. The task force brings together Australia's health policy leaders, health professionals and includes consumer, rural and regional and importantly, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representatives. On top of that, we're working tirelessly to ensure that doctors have the resources to invest in their GP practices. We're making sure that $220 million of the Strengthening Medicare GP Grants Program is available to GPs to invest in their businesses. We're also investing $146 million to attract and retain more healthcare workers to rural and regional Australia through improving training and incentive programs and supporting developing innovative models of multi multiply disciplinary care. And our 50 Medicare urgent clinics across the country will be bulk billed and take pressure off the hospital system. And those opposite can trot out whatever quotes they want from anybody but you know what really matters? This is a policy that people in rural and regional Australia voted for. They care about these clinics. They want these clinics in their community. Because when you have a sick child, when you have a sick baby, and the only place that you can take that child is to an emergency department, well, that is an indication that the primary health care system is not working. And it wasn't working under the previous government. This is an incredibly serious issue, and it's why we are taking it so seriously. It's why we are investing in our healthcare system. It's also why we have made sure that there's a distribution priority area classification system to recognise 700 areas that either, either full or partial DPA classification is required for. We have not wasted any time, Madam President. Our government has moved quickly and decisively when it comes to improving this crisis. We have been listening to Australians, something that the opposite stopped doing years ago. We know that it is hard to see a GP. We know the cost of medicines have been high, which is why healthcare is high on our agenda. And we'll reduce the cost of medicines to improve cost of living, make it easier for people to access medicines under our government. 
Finally, can I say, on a local level in my hometown of Cairns, we are investing in uh, rural GP uh, places at the J James Cook University. We know that this is a problem that cannot be fixed overnight. But if you train local doctors in rural and regional areas, something the former government refused to do, then we can make sure that we have a generation of doctors who stay in the regions because they've been trained in the regions. This is a commitment that we made on a local level, but it shows that this government is planning on doing the hard work, the hard long-term work, to fix this issue. I have to say, coming back to the mover of this MPI, never ever in my life have I seen the most hypocrisy than this MPI, moved by a government that refused to do anything when it came to rural and regional GPs access, who voted against the Senate inquiry, who cut <coughs> Medicare telehealth appointments, cut them so that people in rural and regional areas could not access telehealth, froze the Medicare rebate, drove primary health care into the ground, and even refused to acknowledge that this was a crisis because they voted against a Senate inquiry seeking to look into this issue. The evidence of what the former government did is on the table, and the plans from the Albanese Labor government are clear. It is what the people in Australia voted for. It was the thing that got people to change their mind. It was the thing that made them change the government. Because they know, well, I take that interjection. If you've been sitting here during my contribution, you can look it back up on Hansard if you like. But I can tell you that we're doing more than your government ever did. We're acknowledging that there's an issue. We're investing in strengthening Medicare. We're making sure that GPs have access to funding. And we are making sure that if you have a Medicare card under an Anthony Albanese Labor government, you can actually use it. Because for nine years, people in rural and regional areas have not been able to do that. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. There is no doubt that the shortage of healthcare workers, including GPs, in rural and regional Australia is at absolutely crisis point. We have got a massive problem, which is absolutely a sign of failure of the previous government. The previous government have led to a situation where the crisis point is so obvious. Anybody in rural and regional Australia that talks to you about access to GPs, access to healthcare practitioners, will tell you that it is hugely, hugely a problem. The question that I find really juicy that we need to be talking about today is what we do about it. What are going to be the measures put in place by this new government to actually seriously address that problem? I chaired the Senate inquiry of the Community Affairs References Committee into the provision of general practitioners in outer metropolitan, rural and regional Australia, and we travelled quite widely across regional Australia. And I'm hoping that that inquiry will be re-referred to the Community Affairs Committee so that we can continue our investigations. It was eye-opening during these hearings to hear countless health practitioners share their concerns about the lack of access to timely and affordable health care, particularly GPs in the bush, and to hear the consequences on people's health. Um, one doctor from coastal New South Wales told us that we're at breaking point trying to service the needs of our community with a depleting number of very tired and very stressed doctors. We've got doctors in rural areas working 80 or more hours a week. We have got people waiting for weeks to see their GPs. And then you've got allied health practitioners who are people not able you know, just zero accessibility for allied health practitioners. We've got a massive problem. I mean, the recommendations from our committee were that we recommended that the government um, investigate substantially increasing the Medicare rebates for all levels of general practice consultations, as well as, well as other general practice funding options, and that we review the primary care components of the medical education curriculum with a view to ensuring that general practice is a core component of the, of the curriculum. These were consensus recommendations of this committee. But fundamentally, what we need to be doing is to be properly funding and properly supporting health care across the board. And that means actually putting the money into healthcare, and it means doing things like putting dental care and mental care 
intermediate care. And it means actually spending the money, and it means raising the money. It means actually saying, yes, we should have a corporate super, super profits tax. We should have a tax on billionaires. We should scrap the stage three tax cuts, which are going to cost the budget bottom line over $200 billion over the next 10 years, and put that money into services such as health care and education, income support, the services that the people of Australia Senator really Rice, need. Senator time has expired. Senator Rustin. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Um, I rise today, um, first of all, to acknowledge the extraordinary effort of our medical workforce, um, particularly over the last two and a half years, as they have single handedly battled the front line response to the COVID pandemic. And there is nowhere where these particular health workers have worked harder, longer, more diligently than in rural, regional and particularly remote Australia. And I think all Australians owe a huge debt of gratitude to all of our healthcare workers across the whole country. And uh, I would like to add the weight of um, our parties um, of the coalition to the amazing efforts and thank them very much for what they did on behalf of all Australians. Um, but you know, the opposition absolutely acknowledges um, that there are huge challenges out there at the moment in our health workforce, exacerbated significantly by the challenges that have been put forward by COVID, but because of the changing nature and landscape of rural and regional Australia. Um, and that's why um, in government we invested very, very heavily um, in making sure that we started to put in place the things that needed to be done to make sure that we could continue the rebuild on a strong rural, regional and remote workforce. Um, and we acknowledge that there's still a long way to go, and we hope that those opposite that are now in government will continue to make sure that they prioritise rural, regional and remote health um, as one of the priorities of the new government, because it was something that we prioritised as the previous government. And despite the fact that we still find ourselves with, with great challenges, um, not the least of which is uh, the fact that we no longer have access to um, an external workforce from, from overseas because of our borders um, having not been open for such a long period of time and the lack of, I suppose, response to, um, to seeing our borders reopen and the encouragement of, Australia, of uh, people coming to Australia. Uh, we're still waiting for the job summit before that apparently is going to happen. But you know, in government, we invested a um, billion dollars specifically into our rural and regional health sector. Um, and including um, making sure through our stronger he uh, rural health strategy uh, that we were encouraging more professionals, more health professionals to move into rural and regional Australia. Uh, and since we put this in place, um, over 5,000, so in, in the space of five years, over 5,000 GPs, <laughs> nurses and other allied health workers um, were uh, recruited to work in rural, regional and remote Australia in support of those people that choose to live outside of our capital cities and making sure that they have access to appropriate health services. Um, just in this last budget, we uh, added another $300 million to the previous investments, um, things like making sure that we were getting access to MRIs um, in rural and regional Australia so that people who live there didn't have to travel to capital cities in order to be able to get this really important treatment that is, uh, is able to be accessed through this particular technology. Um, we also made sure um, that we were continuing to invest heavily in making sure that there were Commonwealth-funded places for uh, medical students training to be GPs um, to make sure that uh, in rural and regional locations, because we know that people who train in rural and regional locations are much more likely to stay in those locations uh, and support their communities once they have finished their studies. Um, we established two new university departments of rural health um, at Edith Cowan University and the Goldfields um, at uh, Curtin University uh, in Western Australia. Um, we also invested through um, the Charles Sturt University, through the Rural Clinical School, uh, and we also committed additional funding to the Rural Health Medical Training Program. Um, another thing that we committed to, understanding that the health outcomes in rural and regional Australia are often challenged by the tyranny of distance, was to continue to invest in Australia's favourite, I think, when it comes to um, rural and regional health services, the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Uh, which means that we have over 10 years invested nearly $1 billion in the RFDS, uh, as well as other fl um, flight services that have supported so many sick Australians through Care Flight um, and Little Wings. So we stand by our track record. 
um, of supporting rural and regional Australia, but we also understand that rural and regional Australia continues to suffer under some very significant um, pressures for workforce. Um, and some of those have been exacerbated by some of the actions of the incoming government, um, which did not need to happen. Uh, just as an example, one of the first things that the, the Labor government uh, chose to do was to cut almost 70 telehealth services that had been put in place um, to enable access um, by telephone to your GP, uh, recognising at the time they were put in um, that people often either couldn't get to a GP or there was health reasons why they didn't want to interact in the broader community. So a telephone was one of the ways in which they could interact. In removing the telephone consultations without proper reason or rationale or advice, well, if there is it, we haven't seen it, um, we have now excluded um, disproportionately people who live in rural and regional areas. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, many people who live in rural and regional areas um, do not have video conferencing opportunities, so they can't video into their doctor. Their telephone line was the lifeline that they had to their health services during COVID, and 70 of these services have been cut, particularly for the most chronically um, uh, people in the most chronic need of health support. Uh, and we um, condemn the decision to do that without proper advice. Um, but as I said, if there is advice, it's not something that has been. Um, provided for transparency as to why that decision was made at a time it was made, particularly when we were entering into a new co a wave of the COVID pandemic, when once again Australians were needing the support protections and measures uh, that the COVID measures had put in place. Um, we also um, would say that one of the great revolutions of the COVID pandemic was telehealth. Um, during the first two years of the pandemic, over 100 million consultations took place over telehealth, absolutely transforming Australia's healthcare system and something that has been disproportionately of benefit to people that live in rural and regional Australia because they often are a very long way away from the services that they would have to uh, access if they had to do so in person. Another issue that um, has been raised significantly around rural and regional um, health uh, has been around the distribution priority area classifications. Previously, this was put in place because we knew um, of the difficulty of attracting overseas doctors to go to rural and regional areas. So, by putting in place a mechanism that prioritised rural and regional areas for access to this particular workforce, um, we sought to try and encourage more people to go to the regions uh, and, in doing so, ex uh, to alleviate some of the pressure that was on our health system because of a lack of doctors. Um, the decision by this government to expand those um, areas, those uh, DPA areas, um, means that the um, possibly unintended, but certainly a consequence of that, is going to be those outer metropolitan areas and other areas or the larger regional centres that now have got access to, um, to the DPA um, cl and priority classification uh, are likely to be sucking the doctors out of those further out regional and rural communities um, who are least able to be able to um, have those health services um, or those GPs removed from them. So um, these kind of decisions impact immensely on rural and regional Australia. And another issue that I would put on the record of uh, that I think where this, this government before us has got no regard for what happens in rural and regional Australia is around their urgent care clinics that were supposed to be prioritised into areas that had very low numbers. Um, of GPs uh, and, and access to GPs for, for the people that lived in those communities. During the election campaign, um, one of the areas um, that the, the GPs uh, were uh, the, an urgent care clinic was, um, was uh, nominated to be located was McNamara. Now, McNamara is an inner city Melbourne electorate. Not only is it an inner city uh, Melbourne electorate, it actually has the ratio of doctors to patients three times higher than the average in rural and regional Australia. So you would have to question the logic behind the uh, rationale by the, those opposite to support uh, with incentives to get more GPs into areas where there are low numbers of GPs when they're actually prioritising their own marginal electorates from an onslaught from the Greens by actually putting urgent care clinics into an electorate that already has three times the average number of GPs of many of our rural and regional settings. So um, I would say that um, our, the motion before us today, the failure of the government to outline any meaningful plans 
Um, the only plans that they've outlined so far have had a detrimental effect on rural and regional workforce, particularly um, our GPs. And, um, the only things that we have before us are strengthening Medicare. Well, what does that mean? We've got a billion dollars put against it. We have no idea where that billion dollars is going to go. But if our urgent care clinics are any indication of the kind of activities that that $1 billion is going to be spent on, I wouldn't be holding my breath that it's going to go to be rural and regional Australia. I'd be suggesting we're seeing it spent in metropolitan areas. I hope it's not, and I absolutely plead with those opposite. Rural, regional Thank and remote Senator Australia Rastin, need your, your help. Your time has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This is not my first speech. What it is is my first opportunity to put on record how frustrating I find this. Maybe I'm the only one who is sick of, to the gills of it, but we're spending an hour making speeches about how big a problem the rural GP shortage is. Couldn't we spend an hour actually doing something about it? It's hard to put into words how disconnected this all feels. The Liberals are getting up and saying this problem is all Labor's fault. Labor is getting up and saying it's the Liberals' fault. Does it matter? This isn't about you. The big parties are every problem as the fault of the other side. Nobody ever stands up and says, this is our mess, this is our problem to fix. Everybody here thinks they're cleaners, sent in to tidy up after somebody else. And the next page. It's painful to watch. When regional communities lose doctors, they don't survive for long. If you're sick and you need a doctor and there isn't one where you are, you leave. You go where you need to go. And if you need to see them again, you leave again. Sooner or later, you move closer to where you need to be. That's when you leave for good. That's what we're seeing in Tasmania. It's happening in Rosebury. It's happening in Ooze. It's even happening in Dover. The song's the same all across Tasmania. Doctors are leaving, and nobody is replacing them. Communities are crying for help. People are flying to the mainland because that's the only way they're going to see someone quickly. What are you supposed to do if you can't afford a return airfare? What if you're too sick to get on a plane in the first place? And all we hear from the major parties is arguments over whose fault it is. The Titanic is sinking all around you, and you're arguing over who's supposed to be on the lookout for icebergs. We've got a well-meaning policy to attract GPs to rural and regional areas, but it's obviously not working because it doesn't push GPs to work in areas where they're needed the most. And the slack is falling on local councils to pick up. Local councils are paying doctors to work there. They're paying to upgrade medical centres. They're offering free houses to GPs. They're paying for their office equipment, their cars, their fuel, even their phone bills. Not every council can afford to do this. And if you can't afford to complete, compete with the larger councils, if you can't afford to offer the same benefits to GPs, you just don't get a doctor. You go without, and that's not good enough. This is not good enough. How are we supposed to pat ourselves on the back and say, job done, move on, when only wealthy communities can afford a GP? There's a word for that, and that's failure. It's a failure of everyone here on every side of the debate, major party, minor party, independent, until it's fixed for everyone. It's at the feet of everyone to fix it. I want to start fixing it. I'm open to how we do it. Maybe we can offer full scholarships to young people in areas that need GPs the most, so long as they commit to returning home when they graduate with a medical degree. Maybe we can let pharmacists do more in high-need areas to take some of the burden off existing GPs. Maybe the way we classify the needs of communities has to change. In rural Tassie, about four in five doctors have been trained overseas. When we try to attract new doctors, we're competing with the rest of the world. Maybe the federal government needs to get into our corner and help us win the race for the talent. If you've got ideas, if you want to work with me, my door's open. We can do it quietly. You can even take the credit. I don't care. Senator Lambie doesn't care. Just work with us. My office might be on the other side of the building, but it's not impossible to find. Knock on my door. I'll open it. I want to have a chat. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this very important, very important MPI brought before the chamber by Senator Chandler. Uh, from day one, the Albanese Labor government proved that they do not care about regional Australia. They do not care 
about regional Australia, and they have proven this time and again, and we're only two months in to this government. Let me give you the clearest example of this. Last week, the Albanese Labor government decided to axe the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia and the Office of Northern Australia. They abandoned Northern Australia on day one of parliament, one of our key, of course, regional areas across Australia is in the north. And they made their view on the importance of rural and regional Australia very clear, and that is that they do not care about rural and regional Australia. And now, by their failure to act, by their failure to outline any meaningful plan to address rural and regional workforce shortages in the health sector, they continue to fail our rural and regional communities. Now, our rural, rural and regional communities face significant challenges and inequalities. There is still a great divide between the city and the country. As my colleague in the other place, the member for Clare, Mr G, said only yesterday, there is a divide in income opportunities and outcomes. And if you live in a country area, your income will not be as high as if you lived in the city. There is a divide in educational opportunities between the city and the country. And there is a divide, of course, in health outcomes. What do we know? The cold, hard, hard truth is that the further you live away from the city, the younger you will die. The average life expectancy in the country is lower than in the city, and this has been noted by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare that life expectancy decreases with remoteness. They've also noted that potentially avoidable hospitalisations can be uh, 2.5 times higher in remote areas than in cities. Australians living in remote communities face higher levels of difficulty in accessing medical services, including GPs. And while some of the reasons for this are, of course, outside of the control of health care, uh, the health care sector, access to health services plays an important part. Madam Acting Deputy President, this is about to get much, much more difficult for our rural and regional Australians. We know that the availability of medical practitioners, particularly GPs in regional, rural and remote locations, has a direct impact on the health outcomes in regional and rural and remote Australia. And this is why we have distribution uh, priority areas, to help identify areas in regional, uh, rural, rural and remote communities with unmet needs which are lacking those important access of services by GPs. There are benefits of having DPA status. It ensures that these areas which are lacking access to GP services are looked after by bringing in trained medical practitioners from overseas and participants in the bonded medical uh, program and requiring them to set up in these areas to help reduce that division between the city and the country. The DPA is crucial. It's crucial, crucial to the rural health care system and it's the backbone of these communities. And now, despite strong opposition from rural doctors, the Albanese Labor government is pushing ahead with their ill-informed plan, as described, by their, uh, as, as described indeed by the Rural Doctors Association of Australia, to expand distribution priority areas to inc include peri-urban and outer metro areas. Now, Labor have now expanded DPAs to include large regional centres and outer metro areas. They are taking away from our rural and regional communities, abandoning patients in rural and regional communities who will be left with no access, no access, no access to, uh, the, uh, to services that are close to their homes. No access at all. Uh, they're taking from Peter to pay Paul, robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's how the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners described it, because they know that there is an extreme risk that rural and regional communities will lose doctors as they take up positions that are closer to the cities. I mean, you can't blame them, really, if you're not providing those incentives and that direct support that is available to ensure that we are attracting good doctors in these remote and regional settings. Uh, this is an unintended and unwanted consequence of this of this ill-informed decision made by an Albanese Labor government that, that despite what they've been told by those working in our rural and regional health care sector, they're persisting with this policy. What they should be doing is looking to encourage more of our medical students and our future doctors to choose general practice as their career, whether this is through cutting red tape, making it easier and more attractive, 
uh, career pathways for our students, whether it, uh, whatever it is, solving the GP shortage in rural and regional uh, Australia uh, will not happen by taking away from our rural and regional communities. Now, in the brief time that I have remaining in this MPI, I just want to give a shout out to the More Than Mining campaign. Now, this is a particular program that is uh, or initiative that's been driven primarily by the mining industry communities or communities that have resource sector uh, jobs uh, that are close by. They're, they're advocating for uh, a, a change to how we treat the fringe benefit tax. Uh, now, one of the big issues in attracting staff in these areas uh, is, is housing and access to affordable housing, uh, particularly housing in a market that's uh, cyclical because of the boom and bust cycle. And I just, in this moment here, the remaining time of my MPI, the 30 seconds that I've got left, I just want to give a shout out to those that have been advocating for this program. I remain committed to this. I think it's something that they've got some innovative ideas, whether it's precisely the solution that they've come up with or quite possibly a variation of that. I think it's something that uh, we should look closely at in enabling people that are choosing to put their roots down in, in regional communities to be able to get tax uh, benefit in choosing to purchase homes and rent homes in these places, to increase the, the, the pool of homes that are available, to increase the stock that's available could be a good way of actually attracting staff into these areas. And I want to commend the More Than Mining campaign and the communities that have been supporting it. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I thank Senator Chandler for bringing this matter to the attention of the Senate, although I am compelled to point out that the shortage of general practitioners in rural and regional Australia is a problem the coalition failed to address during the nine years it was in power. This crisis is not only risking the health and well-being of Australians who live in rural and regional areas, it is costing taxpayers and the economy a great deal of money. In June this year, the Courier Mail newspaper revealed Queensland taxpayers were funding pay packages of up to $1 million a year each to fly in locum doctors to plug gaps in health services delivery across the state. They have been recruited in desperation with regional hospitals in Queensland sometimes being forced to turn patients away for the lack of a doctor. Rural generalists have been offered $2,700 per day to work in Wide Bay. Radiologists have been offered up to $4,000 per day to work at locums on the Sunshine Coast. The total outlay for these fly-in locums was $118 million last year, and this cost is rising. $34 million was spent by the Queensland Government on locums in the first quarter of this year, and it's not working. When you're sick, you have the right to see a doctor there and then, not after you've recovered. But waiting times for GP appointments in regional Queensland have blown out to months. People are travelling long distances in order to see a doctor more quickly. The town of Mara in Queens, central Queensland hasn't had a permanent GP since December and went without a doctor for more than a week back in March. Local residents were forced to resort to telehealth appointments or else drive 65 kilometres to Biloela to see a doctor. It's no wonder doctors are leaving regional areas. The workload is horrendous and many are burnt out or exhausted. And it's not just doctors. There are shortages of a wide range of health practitioners, nurses, midwives, pharmacists, dentists, optometrists, psychologists and occupational therapists are all in short supply. Then there's aged and palliative care. The lack of these services in regional Queensland is appalling. There is not a single hospice in Queensland located north of the Sunshine Coast. This is why I fought tooth and nail for $8 million to build the Fitzroy Community Hospice in Rockhampton, and I hope the Albanese government doesn't cut out that funding. Why we must do more to encourage and incentivise Australians to study medicine and to practice in the country. Importing doctors is not the solution. Up to 12,000 foreign doctors are in Australia and, and have applied to work here but cannot pass the standards required, and many cannot even speak English, which risks misdiagnosis and adverse medical outcomes if they are to ever be allowed to work here. It's also worth noting here the impact of COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Many are not allowed to treat patients because they have not taken the wonder jab. It, 
Isn't it amazing that bureaucrats think they know more than doctors about the safety and efficiency of the wonder jab? This all adds up to a potential disaster in the making. On average, Australians living in rural and regional areas have lower life expectancy and experience higher levels of disease and injury compared to people living in our cities. Rural and regional Australia should be prioritised, not neglected. One Nation has been calling for practical solutions to be implemented, such as tightening the obligations on medical graduates under the bonded medical program. At the moment, graduates have 18 years to complete an obligatory three years of practice in a regional area in exchange for a Commonwealth-supported place in a medical course. It should be reduced to seven years. And the government needs to consider ways to recover taxpayers' contribution to graduate studies is their, um, they don't, don't meet the regional obligation. Australian, all Australians should be able to afford and access quality medical care regardless of where they live. The taxpayers have funded this and there was a scheme put out and these, these students have taken up. They said, yes, we will go and work in rural and regional areas. have given 18 years to do that and they haven't taken it up. Only 500 have actually done it out of, out of thousands. Why are we funding these students? Why hasn't the government chased it up and says, well, you made an obligation. The taxpayers have funded you now. Why haven't you done your duty? I'm calling on this government now to look at that obligation reduce it to seven years, make sure that doctors are actually given the jobs in rural and regional areas to look after all Australians as well. Thank Bye -bye. you. Before I call Senator Pratt, Senator Thorpe, I'll ask you to stop yelling across the chamber. Oh, Senator Thorpe! Senator Thorpe! I have asked you, I have asked you to stop yelling across the chamber. Senator Thorpe, please respect the, the um, request of the chair. Senator Pratt. Well, when I read the MPI this morning and its topic, I was completely astonished. For a representative of a party that, while in power, dismantled and starved our rural and regional health workforce and funding and employment opportunities, to bring on an MPI on this topic, to my mind, was extraordinary. And I'm, I'll go into the detail and unpack that. Perhaps, perhaps you were, um, uh, you know, taking more uh, credit in, you know, looking at your own policies in a blinkered way without really seeing what was going on. We saw years of neglect, years of, neglect uh, of our Medicare system by the coalition. In my own home state of WA, uh, if you look at rural and regional Western Australia, per head of population, the spending on Medicare per head of population is proportionately so much lower than anyone in a metropolitan area. People do not have access in rural and regional Western Australia to the health professionals, uh, such as doctors and specialists. Uh, that they uh, should be able to go and see. Uh, and so the lack of access to health professions uh, is actually very much reflected in the per head spending uh, on, uh, on Medicare around regional WA when compared to the Perth metropolitan area. So I wonder really what's going on in the heads of those opposite. While in your time in government you ripped billions of dollars out of primary care and caused gap skis to rocket, we'll, and so we will clean up that mess left by the Liberal Party. But this is not going to be easy. The last government arbitrarily axed the ability of a long list of communities to recruit overseas trained doctors to fill gaps in general practice, as well as those in outer suburbs and in the regions. There's a dire need not only in regional WA, uh, but also in Perth communities. Uh, in Western Australia uh, last year, a well-known paediatrician died, a paediatrician who had a high caseload. As a result of that, the waiting list to get 
in to see a paediatrician blew out for everyone by more than a year. It wouldn't matter if you were a high needs family or child or not, you could not get in to see a paediatrician for more than a year. This is the legacy of the historical underfunding of Senator, our medical centre. Senator Pratt, can you resume your seat for a moment? Senator O'Sullivan, I've asked you already once to stop interjecting. Interjections are disorderly. Please stop interjecting. Senator Pratt. So the Labor Party initiated the extended inquiry into GP shortages in the last parliament. We heard mountains and mountains of evidence from people not being able to see a GP at all, about having to wait many months for an appointment, having to travel hours when they finally do get to see one. This is why Labor has deliberately not changed the regional incentive payments that doctors receive for working in remote Australia. It's why we recognise the importance of providing additional incentives for doctors to work in those remote and regional communities. So I find this extraordinary uh, that Senator Chandler, now that she's lost the power of being in government on these issues, suddenly appears interested in these issues. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government funds a range of programs and incentives incentives to encourage GPs to relocate and work there, in addition to the distribution priority area program. So while we've got this architecture, we know uh, that it, we have to prioritise improving it. We have uh, got our Strengthening Medicare Task Force now. This task force met last Friday, and it's tasked with finding the best ways to boost affordability, improve access and deliver better support for patients, especially for patients with ongoing and chronic illnesses. And this work, their work and their findings, will be backed by the $750 million Strengthening Medicare Fund. We know that our health professionals have worked tirelessly throughout the pandemic. They are working tirelessly now. You know, I've got two aged parents, uh, one of whom with significant health conditions, who are at home in quarantine uh, as they've recently tested positive with COVID. But they have uh, a good GP that's checking in on them, and they've also got the resourcing of the state government. We know it's critically important that we resource our doctors to look after Australians, to provide them the care that they need. This is in particular why uh, we are uh, investing some $220 million in GP practices uh, around Australia. This will be incredibly important to rural and regional Australia. We also have a plan to invest $146 million to attract and retain health workers to rural and regional Australia. This includes the improving training and incentive uh, programs and supporting the development of innovative models of multidisciplinary care. We're going to boost workforce incentives for rural and regional GPs to support the engagement of nurses, allied health and other health professionals and provide multidisciplinary team-based care, also critically important. We're also going to expand uh, the innovative models of collaborative care program across rural and regional Australia because we know that the support to retain our rural health professionals is absolutely critical. There are so many practical steps that governments can and should do to support the rural and regional workforce here in Australia. Uh, this includes, for example, a constituent case that came recently through my office where you find the only psychiatrist, the only psychiatrist in the Pilbara of Western Australia that's there to service uh, that is qualified to meet the needs of children uh, 
can't stay in Australia because she has a child with autism. Clearly, the state government is now making appeals to uh, the Commonwealth government to say these are the kinds of issues that we need to fix. And I know, sitting on the government benches, that these are indeed the kinds of issues that we need to fix, that your government was absolutely missing in action on on a day-to-day -day basis. We're here also to expand the John Flynn pre-vocational doctor program to more than 1,000 placements in rural and regional Australia per year, strengthen rural generalist and GP registrar training, as well as uh, providing Australians access to universal, prompt, world-class medical care. Something that has been ignored by those opposite for too long. We want to see our rural and regional communities right around Australia get the access that they deserve. Access, like I said, to universal, to prompt, world-class medical care. No one in our nation deserves to face a multi-year wait for vital treatments simply due to where they live. And whilst uh, I can see that those opposite recognise these issues now that they're in opposition, I'm very pleased to stand up here and debate them on it, because you were silent for eight years on, uh, on all of these issues. Not once did I come in here and see you prioritise these needs. Instead, we got the uh, glib all announcement and no end of no delivery. The proof will be in the pudding. We are early in our term and we know we have to get on and implement these measures, whereas those opposite were all announcement and no delivery year after year. We are here with a commitment in the Labor Party to building our public health care system right across remote and regional Australia. Senator Pratt, your time has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to acknowledge I, I have actually heard some very good news from Senator Pratt in, in her contribution. Um, what I heard is, and I am very relieved to hear, that the new government will be continuing the former coalition government's model of multidisciplinary care team, care ba uh, team based care, which I had the pleasure of announcing the pilot for under the former regional health care minister, Mark Coulton. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased that our coalition government policy will be continued. I'm also pleased to hear that the regional training programs will be continued, that our government's uh, Murray-Darling Basin Medical School that recognises that if you train in the regions, you're more likely to work and stay in the regions, and um, the continuation of our rural generalist pathways. I hope that includes the rural um, generalist pathways for uh, registered nurses and allied health professionals as well. What I didn't hear was whether they are going to continue the, um, what we termed in the pilot Murrumbidgee single employer model that uh, improves the working conditions and the contractual arrangements for uh, GPs who move to regional areas, which was something that our government implemented. Um, what I didn't hear from Senator Pratt, however, is how the new government's changes to the distribution priority areas is going to help us achieve increase in rural and regional health workforce. How can the new government look people in the eye and say that a doctor, an overseas trained doctor, should get the same incentives and benefits if they're going to work in Newcastle as they do if they're going to work in a GP clinic in Cessnock or in Scone? How can they say that 
putting these uh, hard fought for overseas trained doctors or bonded Australian uh, medical places in Western Sydney compared to Broken Hill or Burke. It doesn't stack up. There are already significant inequalities that, yes, our government was in place for nine years and, yes, we put the hard yards in because there is no silver bullet on this issue. We acknowledge there is no silver bullet, but we worked very hard talking to the Rural Doctors Association, the um, Royal College of General Practitioners, the allied health professionals. How can we address this issue? How can we get train more in the regions, retain more in the regions? Um, but this one policy announcement by the new government has the Rural Doctors Association of Australia now warning that they are fearful and I quote, fearful for rural communities right across Australia who are now at extreme risk of losing their doctors as they take up positions closer to the cities, abandoning their rural and remote patients who will be left with no access to care close at home. They went further and made a harrowing call that Labor's policies will cost the lives of rural and remote patients who already suffer poorer health outcomes than their city counterparts. I just this afternoon had a meeting with uh, council representatives from far north Queensland, and they told the story of how in their small community um, they have a doctor, they have a district nurse and they have a policeman. But if there is a trauma, a road trauma or an accident overnight due to workplace fatigue management, which is a very serious issue in regional areas, there is a snowball effect. Now, they would love to have extra workforce, but how can they compete if we're saying the distribution priority areas can have someone in Townsville? rather than in remote far north Queensland. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has noted that these hospitalisations in rural areas can be avoided by getting more GPs out there. The Labor Party's you, policy Senator will Davey, not do your that. Time has expired. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page three of today's order of business. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I uh, want to speak briefly to um, a couple of the assessments by the Commonwealth Ombudsman under section 4860 of uh, the Migration Act. And this goes uh, directly to the length of time that people are spending in immigration. Uh, Senator McKim, sorry, can I just confirm that's document number five you're referring to, you're speaking to? Uh, yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this goes directly to the length of time that people sp are spending uh, in immigration detention. And um, assessment number eight. Uh, of 2022 by the Commonwealth Ombudsman has the case of um, the, uh, the ID, and of course um, uh, names are redacted out of these reports, and rightly so. Uh, this is the tenth assessment for this particular person who's been in immigration detention for nine years. Nine years in immigration detention. Um, there's another case. Uh, in a report table today of someone who's been in immigration detention for more than three years who arrived in Australia with his family on a humanitarian visa. So the situation that we've got here, and I, I acknowledge we've got a new government in place and I, and I think the minister has to um, be given uh, an opportunity um, to come to grips with this situation. But the situation we have is, that, uh, is where some people have been in immigration detention in this country. I'm aware of cases where people have been in immigration detention for over a decade. 
and there are stateless people who are in immigration detention and who have been in immigration detention for years in Australia. Now, I spent a lot of time in this place, and in my view, rightfully so, talking about the horrors of offshore detention. I visited Manus Island on multiple occasions. I was there when Peter Dutton, uh, Mr Dutton from the other place uh, ordered the Papua New Guinea government to cut off the food, the drinking water, the electricity and the medical support. I actually went into the Manus Island Detention Centre uh, on the first day where those basics of life were cut off from over 650 desperate people who, by the way, uh, conducted a, an absolutely heroic resistance um, to that brutality, ordered by the Liberal government at the time and Minister Dutton. But I think that the time has come for us to start to focus also on immigration detention onshore in Australia and the depravity of that arbitrary indefinite detention. Many people are there due to ministerial whim. It's the minister who, with a stroke of the pen, has condemned them to years of detention, and the minister who could, could with a stroke of a, uh, a pen, release them. Now, these are dark and bloody days in our country's history. The immigration detention regime that we've seen, both offshore and onshore, in the last decade is a foul chapter in our country's story. And there's only one thing that's going to clean it up. There's only one thing that's going to make sure that the depravity and the brutality, and these are systems by design that are brutal. They are systems designed to deliberately harm innocent people, because remember, this is administrative detention. It's not as a result of a sentence by the courts. There's only one thing that's going to let us put a broom through this brutality to hold people to account and, most importantly, make sure this never happens again, and that is a royal commission into immigration detention. Yeah. Order. Order in the gallery. That's what we need in this country. Let's reveal the horrors of Manus Island and Nauru, the murders, the rapes, the child sex abuse, the deliberate harming of innocent people, and let's reveal the punitive, cruel nature of onshore immigration detention, where cases like this come to the parliament every week of people who are detained for years and who have no hope any time soon of being released. The solution is there for us. Let's take it. Are there any other speakers for um, the documents as listed on page three of today's order of business? The question is that the Senate take note of Senator McKim's uh, response. Is there any objection to that? All those in favour say aye. All those against? The ayes have it. Are there any committee reports or government responses to be tabled? Oh, quiet afternoon. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Chisholm. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the foot and mouth disease outbreak. How long does he get? Senator O'Sullivan. I move to take note uh, of that document and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you.
We'll move on to committee memberships. The president has received letters nominating senators to be members of committees. I call the minister. I seek leave to move a, move a motion to appoint senators to committees. Is leave granted? Yes. Minister? I move that senators be appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Okay. It is necessary to hold a ballot for the crossbench position on the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. Before proceeding to a ballot, the bells will, bells will be rung for four minutes. Order. Lock the doors. It is now necessary to hold a ballot, and by agreement, we're doing that before the 
uh, first speeches. So it is necessary to hold a ballot for the crossbench position on the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. Uh, the bells have been rung. The Senate will now proceed to a ballot. Ballot papers will be distributed to senators. The candidates are indicated on the ballot paper. And while we're doing that, I'll inform senators it's my understanding the ballot will be counted out, outside of the chamber so we can proceed to first speeches. I'm assuming that is still the arrangement. I'm looking at the whips. Have all senators voted? I'll ask the clerks now to collect the ballot papers and I advise the senators there's only one candidate. The ballot will be conducted, the count will be conducted in the chamber. I invite uh, Senators McKim and Babbitt to act as scrutineers.
order. The result of the ballot is Senator Waters 63 votes, Senator Babette 8 votes. Therefore, Senator Waters uh, will take the position on the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. We're now moving to first speeches. Just give people correct the time just to be in their correct spots. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator David Pocock to make his first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to him. I call Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are a Ngunnawal country. I'd like to pay my respect to their elders, past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge all First Nations people here this afternoon. It's a privilege to call Ngunnawal country home. Canberra, the meeting place of our nation, is usually talked about as a young city. But we live in a place that has been inhabited and looked after for tens of thousands of years, hundreds and hundreds of generations. We live in a country with an enviable democracy, a vibrant multicultural community, overachievers on the world stage, abundant natural resources, staggering, if unequally distributed, national wealth, awe-inspiring beauty, and the oldest continuous living cultures in the world. Like many Australians, I came here from distant shores. The story of Zimbabwe is one that is well known. My own, my own family's story has been told many times. This is not a story of my family alone, but of so, so many families who now call Australia home. I'm grateful to my mum and dad Andy and Jane, who are here this afternoon, for leaving all they knew to give me and my brothers more opportunity. Again, there are many others who have done this. I'd like to acknowledge the contribution immigrants continue to make to our country. I'm obviously white, uh, moon tan white, as many of my former teammates would, would remind me. And I don't want to conflate my experiences of, it, of migration with the many migrants whose experience is shaped by the colour of their skin. We are making progress as a country, but it's in all of our interests to continue doing the work to build a more inclusive society that celebrates difference and diversity. I grew up on a farm, and despite seeing the challenges of farming, like a free, freak hailstorm destroying our crops the week before we started picking, when you've got a massive overdraft. Agriculture has always drawn my attention, pulling me back time and again. Growing up on a farm instilled in me the importance of hard work and an understanding of how small and insignificant we are in the face of nature, how at the mercy of the elements we are. It also sparked in me a love of nature and a fascination with the natural world. Unable to escape the pull of our relationship with the land, I went on to study ag and have been involved in farming and conservation projects. While our modern national psyche may be more and more urbanised, and collectively we may no longer consider ourselves an agricultural society or deeply connected to the land, we still are. There is no civilization as we know it without agriculture. Our society cannot be sustained without the people who spend their life on the land, whose blood, sweat and tears and generations of knowledge help feed and clothe us. Farmers who love their land and need our recognition and support. We are part of nature and our long-term well-being as families, communities, nations is totally linked to our ability to cooperate with one another, to meet our needs, to build communities based on respect and equality, while also maintaining the health of the land that sustains us. As we know, we aren't doing a particularly good job at this, 
and as a result we're facing some serious challenges. Like many colleagues here in the Senate, I stand here wanting to take on these challenges, to find ways to build the kind of future where we can all thrive. I stand here as a result of the work of many others, of PROACT, Canberra's very own, very own Voices of Movement, led by Claire Dubay, Glenn Cummings, Laurie Dunn, Steph Harvey, Cam Reid and others. This group of Canberrans were frustrated with politics and dared to believe that they could change it. My success was due to the more than 2,000 amazing volunteers, some of them joining us here today, who joined the campaign. Despite what you see on the news, Canberra is so much more than the sum of the decisions made in this building. Yes, we're a city of roundabouts and politicians, but we're also so much more than that. We're a growing city with a strong community spirit, built on a passion for lifelong learning, good public policy, a connection to our environment, the arts, sport, defence, science and technology. We're appropriately called the bush capital, from Namudji and Tibimbilla down south, all the way up to Mulligan's Flat in the north and all the other places that we know and love. We have a vibrant and growing multicultural community. We're also home to five universities, hosting tens of thousands of students with researchers and young leaders tackling some of our most complex problems. Universities should be accessible and affordable to all who want to study, regardless of their background or chosen field. We must continue to fund research for the public good. As the pandemic so starkly highlighted, our need for this is great and ongoing. Many Canberrans work in complete service to our nation. The world-leading scientists at the CSIRO and their tireless contribution in research and helping solve the problems we face. Those serving our nation in defence, from ADFA to Duntroon, and the thousands working on our physical and cyber security. Our public servants, some 60,000 dedicated, professional, passionate people, work for our communities across more than 100 federal departments and agencies. Our national institutions that tell the stories of where we've come from and who we are. We're also a city of tradies and nurses, teachers and hospital workers, service staff of all kinds, construction workers, professionals and innovators. No matter what job Canberrans do, they care about the future of this city. They care about the people who live here and they care about making our whole country better. That's why when I was asked by people in our community to have this first speech live translated into Auslan, I didn't, he didn't hesitate to say yes. So thank you, Mandy, for being here today and translating my words. I understand that the difference between Mandy being there in the broadcasting studio and here on the floor of the chamber is the difference between accessibility and inclusion. Today we've achieved the former, but not the latter. In future, I hope we can achieve both. Our territory faces many of the challenges face in other parts of the country. We're in the midst of a housing crisis. We struggle to attract and retain the healthcare workers needed to care for our growing population. Our businesses are struggling to find staff and keep their doors open. Too many of our elderly have been left without dignity in the very facilities designed to care for them. So many people have had to fight for the support they need under the NDIS. The cost of living crisis is creating a new class of working poor and in some cases working homeless in our suburbs. People in our community face mental health challenges, often without the funds or ability to access the services they need to get help. Too many are employed in insecure work, leaving them vulnerable to the rapidly changing economic conditions. The changing climate is changing our lands, making us more prone to extreme heat and bushfires severe weather events and species extinction. Invasive species are destroying our unique habitats and wildlife. These are all challenges that are being felt across the country. We share in them, we understand them, and we want a hand and a voice in solving them for the benefit of our community and the nation. 
Here in the ACT, we've been denied rights held by the states. It's time for us to restore the right of the territories to make decisions for themselves, to ensure that our Legislative Assembly here in the ACT gets to make decisions about the future of Canberrans, not MPs from around the country whose own constituents in already enjoy these same rights. Yesterday, legislation to restore our rights as a territory was introduced into the House of Representatives. This is not the first time the Parliament has tried to repeal the Andrews Bill, but I hope it will be the last. I will work with everyone in the Senate chamber to support a vote giving us equality with the states. I would like to acknowledge the many brave, courageous people who have supported this campaign over many years. Those I spoke to ahead of the election, not least of all those who decided to speak out, including Samuel Whitsett and Sam Delaney, who I'm honoured to have here today. Beyond territory rights, there are many issues before us. With trust in political institutions at worrying lows, this parliament has the opportunity to begin to restore the faith of Australians in both government and governance. From increasing transparency to the implementation of a robust integrity commission, to reforming political donations and truth and political advertising laws, we have a real chance to strengthen our democracy and ensure Australians can trust in the decisions that are being made in their name. We also need greater protection for whistleblowers who take great risks in service of the public good. We have an opportunity to enshrine in our constitution a First Nations voice to Parliament. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is a generous offer to all Australians to enshrine a voice that can guide the treaty-making and truth-telling process. We need to move forwards. We need, we need to move towards reconciliation. Auntie Pat Anderson is here tonight. Alongside Professor Megan Davis, Auntie Pat oversaw the largest deliberative process with Indigenous people on Australia's constitution in our nation's history. And I'd like to acknowledge Auntie Pat here tonight. There is no greater challenge than facing up to the climate and biodiversity crises we face. We live in truly unprecedented times. Generations before us face their own unprecedented times, world wars, famines, pandemics, natural disasters. Many of our forebears put their lives on the line to build what they saw as a brighter future. Many lost their lives doing so. Others gave up their freedoms to build a more equitable society. Activists who were at the time vilified, arrested and even killed, many of whom we now hold up as heroes for their lives of service and commitment to building a better future. Today the systems that sustain life on earth are at the brink of collapse. The climate as we know it is breaking down and the impacts are now being felt with distressing regularity. Extreme weather, drought, bushfires, hailstorms and floods are having this devastating effect We're also seeing the impacts on the state of the environment. The sixth mass extinction event is underway. The last, the last one 66 million years ago was due to a massive asteroid. This time, we're causing it. As farmer and writer Wendell Berry said, whether we and our politicians know it or not, nature is party to all of our deals and decisions, and she has more votes a longer memory and a sterner sense of justice than we do. It's on us to make the changes, and it's not too late. In the midst of this doom and gloom is an invitation to begin to turn things around. Thanks to ancient indigenous wisdom and the latest in science and technology, we have never known more about these life support systems, what we're doing to them, and what can and must be done to halt, halt this catastrophic decline and begin to reverse it. We know what we're doing and we know what we need to do. One of the first generations with this knowledge and probably the last to be able to do anything about it. Some of our failure has been a failure of imagination, a failure to imagine how great our future 
can be. Our future can be great if we actually focus on the things that matter, the long-term health and well-being of our families, our communities, and our land. This takes courage and leadership. It seems to me that a big part of politics is, is about dealing with problems in a way that turns them into opportunities. And we have an opportunity to begin to write a new story, a better story, a story that is built on accepting responsibility for where we are and finding the courage to change where we are going. This is not about naive thinking or just hoping for the best. It's about a new kind of pragmatism where our actions actually match the scale of the challenges. While I've already thanked many of the people whose efforts and contribution helped bring me to this place, I'd like to make mention of a few others. There are the many elders whose knowledge and wisdom is recorded in books. I'm grateful for my brothers, Mike and Steve, and the lessons we continue to learn together. There's my family, now scattered across the country and across the globe. And then there are those like the Trithowns, the Sturzikas, Saunders, Nubes, Mastersons, Mututus, Clarks and O'Keefe's who have treated Emma and I like family. Rick and Tracy Laird, Brian Walker, Nick Abel, George, Robert Bump, Fanul Nube, Sia Bongaboa, the Rangelands Regeneration Team, the Bitebridge Farmers and many others. I thank you. And of course my wife, my friend, Emma, Thank you. And to my incredible team who worked tirelessly to serve the people of the ACT, whose brilliance and enthusiasm astounds me every single day. Fiona, Sam, Rory, Katia, Lincoln, Tom, thank you. To my new colleagues, thank you for your care for our great country. I hope that through debate and collaboration, we can find ways to deal with these great challenges we face and make a real difference in the lives of those we represent. Not only is it the first time the ACT has had an independent senator, it's the first time we've had someone on the crossbench with the balance of power. I intend, I intend to use that power in the best interests of the people of the ACT to achieve practical outcomes, like pushing the Commonwealth to forgive our historic social housing debt. It's been done for Tasmania. It's been done for South Australia. It's time to do it for us. For too long, we've been neglected We've been ridiculed, looked down at, or flat out ignored. Canberra is the nation's capital. I want this to once again be a source of great pride. No longer are we a safe seat. Investment now has to flow into much needed infrastructure, including community infrastructure. The days of the ACT getting less than a quarter of our fair share of infrastructure funding by head of population is over. We also need more equitable representation and that's an argument I look forward to prosecuting over my term. And we need to continue our le legacy of leadership on everything from marriage equality to the smart energy transition, which we so desperately need to accelerate across the country. I've, last, I've laughed recently when I've read some commentators calling me a kingmaker. It's certainly not a mantle I seek. Instead, I'd prefer to try and be a peace broker in the, 20, in the 47th parliament. The challenges facing us are so important. I want to be part of making sure we don't just end the climate wars, we win them. We win them and we start to lead as a country on climate action and biodiversity conservation. I'm not here to stand in the way. I'm here to offer my perspective as a representative of Canberra, Jarvis Bay and Norfolk Island in the hopes that we can make politics about people. For me, part of doing that is making sure this place and the business we do in it better lives the values of the people who we've been sent here to represent. And so finally, I would like to say thank you to the people of the ACT. Whether you voted for me or not, I'll work on your behalf for the next three years. I'm committed to being accessible and transparent. And I certainly know that you'll hold me to account. Thank you.
pursuant to orders, senators, please resume your seat. Pursuant to orders, I now call Senator Shoebridge to make his first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to him. I call Senator Shoebridge. President, for more than 2,000 generations, First Nations peoples have lived in this land, raising their children in culture and on country, according to law passed down through generations. And there's wisdom and power in this history that this parliament refuses to acknowledge. But I acknowledge it here, and I recognise the long history of First Nations-led resistance to violent dispossession and genocide. This place is on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. I was born on Darug and Garingai land, and my family and I live on, on Gadigal country. And everywhere in between and across this extraordinary land is Aboriginal land. And I look around this chamber and I see and respect the growing number of First Nations members in this place, including my two powerful Greens colleagues, Lydia Thorpe and Dorinda Cox. And I acknowledge that for as much as time means anything to us as humans. This land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. <clears throat> now, as Greens, we're here to do more than keep the bastards on us. Yes, we'll push this government further and faster on things that matter, on climate change, on integrity and fairness. More than that, though, we're here to change the system, to make it represent the many and not just the few. And you've told us what you care about, and we hear you. We're ready to make changes. We're ready to legalise cannabis. We're going to tax billionaires to deliver dental and mental health care into Medicare, and we'll fight to keep coal and gas in the ground. <clears throat> Greens and MPs and senators aren't sent here by a powerful few to serve their interests. We, in fact, come from a proud history of protest, of resistance and grassroots activism. And as a member of the New South Wales Greens, I owe a particular debt to the Green Bands movement of Jack Mundy and the BLF that began in the 1970s. Jack, <laughs> Jack saw um, earlier Senator than Shubridge, most— Just a moment, please. I would ask the gallery to hold their applause until the end. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. I think that's harsh, President, but I'll take it. <laughs> Um, Jack saw earlier than most how social and environmental struggles are inextricably linked. And I stood with Jack on that last successful green ban he was involved with to protect the beautiful Bondi Pavilion from destruction, and I learned from Jack. And Judy, Jack's partner in life and activism, Judy is here with us today. <laughs> Working as a young lawyer, I also had the opportunity to act for building workers and the construction union, part of Jack's old union. I saw directly how collective union action was essential to face down the threats to individual workers, to protect conditions, to uphold safety standards. And in that work, I had my first taste of real-world politics. I acted for the union in the viciously anti-union Coal Royal Commission set up by John Howard. And I was also sent in to oppose the then state Labor government's push to strip back workers' compensation rights, making it even harder for injured workers to live in dignity. And in fact, it was in that political stoush that I first saw Greens in action in Parliament. I saw Lee Rhiannon and one of her staff members, John Kay, listen to the concerns of working people, understand the history and go into bat for them when no one else would. And that was the early 2000s. And it was also a time of mass movements, mass movements against war, with hundreds of thousands of us marching for peace. And as we marched all across this country, this place ignored the calls for peace. And apart from Bob Brown and Kerry Nettle, barely ruffled a feather as Australia went off to another unjust war. So as a lifelong bushwalker, things were coming together for me. Social and environmental justice, peace and political action. I joined the Greens, and, and look what that's done. Uh, and in fact, it's remarkable to think that almost 20 years ago to the day, Kerry Nettle 
delivered her first speech in this parliament as the first ever Green Senator in New South Wales. Thanks, Kerry, for all your work. And today, I enter the Senate as a Green and one of a record 16 Greens elected in this parliament. And I'm also part. <laughs> And I'm Senator, also um, part. Senator Shoebridge, oh, um, everyone in this place needs to respect the rules around the chamber, and I would ask uh, that applause be left until the end. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you. I enter the Senate as a Green and one of, an, one of a record 16 elected Greens in this place. Yeah. And I'm also part of a growing global Greens movement. That's a movement of solidarity that sees our challenges collectively and realises we all shared this one planet, our only planet, and we better not stuff it up. So yes, for all those conspiracy types from the fringe right, it's all true. We do think and act globally, and then we act locally. It's all true. We're all in on it. We all have plans to replace cars with trains, bikes and ferries coal-fired power stations with wind farms and batteries, private with public. And then, when we have you distracted, we're going to sneak up behind you, tax a few billionaires, then socialise medicine by whacking dental and mental into Medicare. Hey. It's just that, unlike others, we're conspiring in the open, and it's to save the planet, not to own it. I've always found that the more I am among people struggling for change, the more inspired I am to get into places like this and fight for the future. And I'm a believer in the renewable power. I'm a believer in renewable power, and my batteries are charged when I'm out amongst all of you, hearing your stories, gathering ideas, and being directed by people's everyday struggles for decency and justice. And I get this when I work with Don Craigie, Uncle Duck seeking justice for his nephew's death on rail tracks south of Tamworth. I get it working with grandmothers against removals, fighting for First Nations families. And I get it when I stand alongside survivors of institutional abuse to demand and then deliver laws that bend towards justice. And I get it when I work alongside the Barrowville families as they take on a racist criminal justice system that discounts the murder of their children. Their struggles should be Parliament's struggles, and as Greens, we'll make that happen. It's when we stand together and we look out for each other that we can really change the world. It's when we see how much we have in common. We don't divide ourselves. We look across the globe. That's when we're strongest. And in our struggle for justice, it's inspiring to work with communities across this country that share our values. And it's why I'm honoured to have members of the Kurdish community here, and I'm so thankful for their trust in the Greens and me. It's why I'm so thankful for the support from the Bangladeshi and Pakistani communities and from all those across the Indian diaspora who are in the gallery and share our values of tolerance, democracy and peace. And whether it's the struggle for Palestinian justice or Kashmiri or Kurdish self-determination, we know that human rights need to be seen as global rights and very much the business of this parliament. Yeah. On this land, First Nations justice must be core to all that we do. Yes, that's heritage and culture, but it's also taking action on incarceration, racist laws, economic empowerment and treaty. It means ending forced child removals. It means not locking up kids. It means truth and treaty and land back. No party can claim to be in favour of reconciliation and First Nations justice while supporting mandatory sentencing laws, expanding prisons, racist policing and child removals. I've seen this happening firsthand during my work in New South Wales Parliament. Just this year, I've seen New South Wales Labor flip from supporting to opposing a Greens bill that would have prevented racist child removals and empowered First Nations families and communities. And they flipped after a 20-minute talkback uh, talk radio spray from a right-wing shock jock. In that single backflip, broken politics stole thousands of futures. That's the politics that keeps jailing 10-year-old First Nations kids in Dondale prison. That's the politics 
that strip mines First Nations land and ships the, ships the profits off to Switzerland or London or New York. This politics is deadly in all the wrong ways. We can't solve those problems by listening to the Daily Telegraph or the Herald Sun. We'll solve them by listening to the likes of Arnie Hazel Collins and her daughter Helen Eason. Because it was Arnie Hazel who taught me the truth about First Nations child removals. Hazel taught me how fax, then docs, then DCJ was taking the babies from our country. She taught me about First Nations mums in her town who still hide their kids when a white government car drives up. She taught me about the trauma to her family when their babies were stolen. And Helen, Helen, her daughter, well, Helen's taught me about strength and resilience. After years of disrespect and struggle, Helen's now running her own healing centre, doing what the government wouldn't, and she's got a whole family around her. Helen and Hazel and the many other First Nations people I've had the privilege to work alongside, <coughs> Helen and Hazel and the many other First Nations people I've had the privilege to work alongside have patiently taught me the strength, the power of the oldest continuous culture on this planet, who will never stop fighting for and protecting their families and their country. And that's a lesson this whole country needs. President, governments show us their priorities by who they shower with attention and cash and who they make wait. And in this country, young people, people on Centrelink, people with disability, First Nations peoples, peoples without a home, are all being told to wait. They can wait while a handful of mining and property billionaires are literally raking it in. And the next budget, We'll see Labor and the Coalition joining together to hand out over $200 billion in stage three tax cuts to the super wealthy, like they need it. I see economic justice as essential human rights and justice work. And that means resisting the system that knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. The system that values forests only as wood chips. The system that accepts the state of your teeth as a marker of class. The system that takes homelessness and hunger as just a cost of doing business. The system that overfunds private schools and cheats public education. And the system that's literally devouring our planet and our future just for profit. Yeah, it's true that political decisions and loyalty have been bought by donations from big corporates and fossil fuel corporations, but it's also true that the loyalty of the political class in this country is with billionaires. It's with the billionaires with the self-importance of parliament, and it's not with the people. So let's change things. Let's see every billionaire as a policy failure, and instead of firing them off to Mars, let's tax them back to Earth. Let's stop hearing how we can't afford a safe, quality home for everyone, how we can't afford free early childhood education, how we can't afford to lift people out of poverty, how we can't afford action on climate change. We can, we will, and we must. And if we are to survive and thrive, then we don't have a choice. We need to keep coal and gas in the ground. This isn't a 43 per cent issue or a 75 per cent issue. The, silence, the science is telling us that for Australia, with its globally significant fossil fuel deposits, it's a 100 per cent issue. And after the 2019-20 black summer fires, I travelled around, travelled around my beautiful state of New South Wales. I met communities in deep shock, surrounded by ash white and eerily silent forests. And it's the silence that still gets me, just these dead forests stretching on and on. And I saw towns sliced down the middle by fire. It was a window into our worst future. And more recently, the windows cranked further open, as we've seen severe storms and floodwaters inundate Brisbane and repeatedly swamp parts of my hometown of Sydney and devastate, literally devastate towns like Lismore. This isn't normal. This isn't safe. If we get the politics right, it can be halted. And over time, it can be reversed. But if we get the politics wrong, this destruction's just the start. Now, that's one hell of a responsibility on all of us. 
The truth is we are in a climate and extinction crisis and that our laws just refuse to acknowledge it. Our laws will put people in jail for graffiti but not for destroying an ecosystem. And that's literally cooked. Surely it's time to enact a new criminal offence of ecocide. Ecocide is the mass widespread damage and destruction of ecosystems and nature. It is, or at least should be, criminal, where it's done by corporations or politicians or governments intentionally or recklessly. So instead of a short-lived Twitter backlash and a revolving door taking you from politics into a six-figure consultancy, if you glad hand a fossil fuel project that screws our collective future, you should get 20 years in jail. That sounds more than fair to me. That's account accountability I'd vote for, and I'd backdate it to today. Saving the planet and delivering on fairness and transparency is surely going to require some serious renovation of this democracy. With the major parties' votes shrinking and a growing chorus of voters having elected Greens, Independents and minor party MPs to this place, they did that because they want a new style of politics that's focused on them, the people, not on us. And from my short observation over the last few days in this parliament, it still operates on a model of politics that's performative and combative. That's all about brand differentiation rather than delivering real change. It doesn't have to be that way. Talk of traditions and convention is already being used by government ministers as code to prevent us making this place more real, more accessible and ultimately more useful. Conventions are also being used to maintain the government's domination of the agenda and time in this place, in the Senate, which is bizarre when you realise they only have 26 or 76 members. It's just over a third. It's an equation that makes no sense to me. I'm hopeful that sometime sooner rather than later, these numbers will be used to provide far greater scrutiny, transparency and accountability of the executive. And last time I checked, that's meant to be a core job of the Senate. To my friends and mentors in politics, first of which is John Kay, um, we lost John in 2016. Uh, John was smarter, more principled, more hardworking than anyone else I've tried to keep up with. I chased him around state parliament for about five years and I still miss him. Having John's partner, Lynn Jocelyn, with us now, that holds that link for me. Thanks for coming, Lynn. And I acknowledge in the gallery three former New South Wales elected Greens, Lee Rhiannon, Sylvia Hale and Michael Organ. Lee, I can't thank you enough for your friendship, kindness, generosity and support. And Sylvia, Sylvia taught me about bravery in politics. I took her spot in the New South Wales Parliament. Uh, and I don't think I'll ever top Sylvia who a bit over a decade ago asked a notorious New South Wales property developer, Ron Medic, in budget estimates if he had any involvement in the brutal murder of his business partner, Michael McGurk. We all wanted the question asked. And I remember the united howls of outrage from Medic and all the other MPs when Sylvia asked it. But Sylvia knew about the New South Wales development industry and she knew she was right. And we now have that answer and Ron Medic is working his way through a 39-year prison sentence. So, I hope I can be as brave as Sylvia and Lee in my work here. And I also recognise Michael Organ as the first Greens member to win a seat in the House of Representatives. And Michael, it must be lovely to look across this building and see four Greens occupying the benches you first sat on, thanks to that Green slide. I also want to thank the team that ran an extraordinary federal election campaign in New South Wales. To James Ryan, Kilty O'Brien, Lucy Small and Aish Cowgill, who worked closely with me on the Senate run, and all the statewide team. I owe special thanks to our amazing 47 lower house candidates. They worked for months on end, making direct contact with people, persuading them one by one how different politics could be. I owe you all my place in parliament, and I hope to see a bunch of you join us here in three years' time. To my New South Wales parliamentary friends and colleagues from across the political spectrum, but especially to Abigail Boyd, who's here tonight, thank you for your comradeship. And to be honest, I have a bit of FOMO as I see my former committee,
the Public Accountability Committee slicing through the latest New South Wales parliamentary jobs for mates scandal. But I also see how the structures we built together in the New South Wales Parliament over the last 10 years are working to force accountability on an unwilling government. And I can tell you whatever else it is, New South Wales politics sure is a masterclass in scandal, corruption and abuse of power, lessons that will certainly come in useful here. <laughs> I think laughing is disorderly too. Um, my thanks too to the unsung heroes of New South Wales politics and the now hundreds of Greens councillors I've worked with. Thanks for every tree you've saved and planted, for every park you've protected, every solar panel you've installed, every meeting you've suffered through and every resident that you helped. As a recovering councillor myself, I see how that work underpins Greens politics and I thank you for it. And I also want to thank the many members of the Greens, especially those here today. Your trust keeps me going and I can always count on you to keep me busy and to loudly call me out when I inevitably stuff things up. Thanks to the party. Thanks to the members. Thanks to the movement. And to my brother Michael, his wife Margaret and my nieces and nephew, Gabrielle, Leah and Dominic, all this travel to Canberra has one big silver lining. I'll be able to spend more time with all of you, and that's a genuine blessing. My mum's also in the chamber. Thanks, mum. means a lot to me. Dr Sang, my father-in-law, my daughter's stylist Gungung is also in the gallery, just as he's been everywhere else when we've needed him. And to Chi, who can't be here but's watching at home with Lester, thank you for your love, your support, and countless, uncountable, delicious dinners. You both help make our little Sydney family very, very special. To my lifelong partner Patricia, and my daughters Jessica and Hannah. You keep all of this in perspective. I can't imagine life without you, and I love you all more than fits in any one speech. To my amazingly talented oldest daughter, Jess, who's stuck at Camp Willara doing her HSC trials. Jess, I'm sorry about the timing, and I promise to make it up to you, and you will smash it. Han, my number one youngest daughter, you are funny, bright, generous and talented. In short, you take after your mum. <laughs> and Patricia, thank you for being here today and the years of support, love and grounding. I'm sorry there weren't more facts in this speech, but here's one big fact. You, Jess and Han, are far more important to me than any of this. And when I'm working here, absent from you all, it's because of you and it's for you. So now it's time to turn those shouts of joy and those whoops of delight that followed the election, turn it into action and make this place live up to the democratic promise. Because we have a planet to save. So let's get started.
they need to just call it, you call it back on. Clark. Uh, government business order of the day number two, social security and other legislation amendment, self-employment programs and other measures bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Sorry, Senator Billy. Thank you. Can we quieten people down a bit? Can I ask the gallery to leave in silence? Uh, one of our senators wishes to speak. Thank you. So, um, before I was interrupted, I was talking about uh, the NICE scheme and uh, how important that was. It was introduced in 1985 by the Hawke government. And this in initiative is particularly important to mention because it relates directly to the bill we're debating now. Through NICE, individuals can receive a package of services that helps them to establish a new, a new business. More recently, it has also helped existing business owners impacted by COVID-19 to continue running their business or refocus their operations to meet new areas of demand. Since NICE was introduced, it has helped over 198,000 people. And as I was saying, there are a number of supports available through NICE, including accredited small business training, help to develop a business plan, personalised mentoring from a NICE provider and, if you are eligible, NICE allowance for up to 39 weeks and NICE rental assistance for up to 26 weeks. NICE can potentially be a great option for job seekers. If someone has a business idea they would like to try out that is likely to be commercially viable, then NICE provides the flexibility to allow them to put their energy into pursuing that idea while not having to apply for jobs in the meantime. After all, when someone is making a genuine effort to secure a regular income, then why place restrictions on whether they do it through employment or self-employment? While some people are happy working for someone else, there are other, others who like the choice and the control and the freedom that comes with self-employment. There are many people who struggle with traditional employment but thrive in an environment where they can be their own boss. And it's interesting to note because of the challenges people with disability face having their skills recognised, they are 40 per cent more likely to be self-employed than the rest of the population. 40 per cent more likely to be self-employed than the rest of the population. Clearly, there is much more work to be done to overcome discrimination against people with disability and to recognise the valuable skills and talents they have. But I am also glad that so many people with disability have had a chance to put their skills to use in a way that also gives them freedom and control. The success of NICE is not just in its ability to help people establish their own business. It also helps establish businesses that survive and thrive. Three months after exiting the program, 82 per cent of NICE participants remain in employment and 68 per cent were still running their business. The fact that NICE has continued for 37 years through governments of both persuasions is a testament to its success and the esteem in which it is held. The Department of Education, Employment and Workplace Relations website features many success stories about how the program has helped people pursue their business ideas. Several other success stories appeared in the booklet celebrating the 30th anniversary of the scheme. And one of my favourites, because it is from my home state of Tasmania, is that of Social Circus Tasmania. 
Christian and Stadja Florence established the business in 2012. The idea behind so Social Circus Tasmania is to engage individuals, groups, families and communities in circus workshops to build teamwork, trust, determination, concentration and playfulness. A few years ago, Social Circus Tasmania had a presence at a big event called A Day on the Beach, of which I've been patron for about a decade, although the event is now changing its name to A Day at the Park. While the founders, Christian and Sarja, had ex extensive skills and experience in circus performance, what they gained through the NICE scheme was how to turn that experience and their passion for something they enjoyed doing into a viable business. This is the value of the business management training and business planning assistance that NICE offers. Some of, the many other success, some of the many other success stories include a children's clothing business which during COVID pivoted to producing face masks when Melbourne went into lockdown, a former Australian Defence Force member who through his successful career had developed a passion for health, fitness and pushing people to their limit and he turned it into a personal training business. Someone who had a unique knowledge of locations that were not being visited by tour operators and attracted a niche market with her new tour company. And a theatre prop maker and scenic artist who applied her skills to a new business manufacturing wooden furniture and toys, including bespoke rocking horses. It's mind-boggling to think of the wealth of amazing stories that the thousands of people who have benefited from Nice would have to tell. The bill before the Senate now the Social Security and Other Legislation Amendment, Self-Employment Programs and Other Measures Bill is made necessary because of some recent changes to NICE. And these changes came into effect on 1 July 2022. NICE has now been replaced with the Self-Employment Assistance Program throughout Australia, with the exception of Nor Norfolk Island, where NICE will continue to be offered. This bill updates the Social Security Act 1991, Veterans Entitlement Act 1986 and Family Law Regulations 1984 to make it clear that the Social Security law, Veterans Entitlement law and Family law operate in the same way for the new program as it did for NICE. And it also includes some minor technical amendments or clarifications to the Social Security law following the recent Social Security Legislation Amendment, Streamlined Participation Requirements and Other Measures Act 2022. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, One Nation stands for veterans and for small business. But I want to address the root cause. This is a, this is a patch, this is a band-aid. It's very necessary, but it's not addressing the root cause. Senator Gallagher has stated that self-employment, this is a quote, self-employment is an excellent alternative to traditional employment for Australians who want to use their existing skills and experience in a work environment of their choice. We agree. Yet Labor is really anti-self-employment and soon in intends to stifle small business and self-employed Australians under gig laws that could strangle the sector. Devastated California, for example, and sent people into state. There's nowhere to go beyond the shores of this country if Labor gets its way. And I remember what Labor did and the union bosses did and some dishonest, disrespectful, anti-human multinational corporations did in the Hunter Valley. Labor joined them in enabling the exploitation and abuse of casual coal miners in the Hunter. And when I tried to stand up for them, the Labor Member of Parliament for the Hunter at the time, Mr Joel Fitzgibbon, misrepresented me and the problems, apparently to hide the problems. And that perpetuated the abuse of workers and the hurt of workers. Labor does not care about workers. Modern Labor cares about getting green votes in the inner cities. Everyday Australians are now suffering from two and a half years of COVID mismanagement and ongoing. Labor wasn't the federal government, but Labor was in power in the states, and the states and federal government worked together hand in hand to destroy the productive capacity of this country. Not only that, over the last two and a half years, but over the last 74, 78 years since 1944. Labor wants to phase out the coal industry and jobs in the coal sector and related sectors. The Labor Greens coalition in the Senate is hell-bent on doing that. 
Labor is in favour of eroding our rights and freedoms. Increasing rents, house prices, energy prices and debt. And there's a lack of much needed tax reform and economic reform. That needs to be comprehensive reform. Australia's productive capacity, as I said a minute ago, is being destroyed and has been destroyed, as is in the process of being destroyed for 74, 78 years. In uncertain times, such as I've just described, much, much more needs to be done to support small business and the self-employed. Yes, we agree that starting a new enterprise or a self-employment assistance program is a help to some people, particularly hard-working vets who've earned the support. But they're up against it in the form of the taxation system, energy prices, infrastructure, lack of infrastructure, and, uh, and over-regulation, capricious over-regulation. And all workers, not just vets, all workers are suffering because the productive capacity of this country, our beautiful country, has been destroyed. The economic environment has been destroyed. Government's job is not to employ people. Government's job is to create an environment that favours the employment of people through people taking risks with investment, people hiring workers. That's where real jobs, sustainable jobs, come from. That's known throughout developed, uh, developed civilization. We must give Australians the opportunity to be free, to be their own boss and to own a business that offers them secure work and financial independence. Free to create, initiate, innovate. And that needs cheap energy. Labor, with its mates in the Greens Labor Greens Coalition, are raising energy prices. We went from being the cheapest energy, cheapest electricity sources in the world to having amongst the highest electricity prices in the world. Not due to resources, not due to Mother Nature, due entirely to mismanagement under the Liberal, Labor, Nats, Greens circus. Not only do we need energy, affordable, reliable, secure energy, we need fair reward. That means a comprehensive reform of the tax system which stifles. And why are we, giving, why are we letting multinational corporations off the hook as of Robert Menzies' bill in 1953 and, Robert, and Prime Minister Hawke's um, legislation and the Petroleum Rent Resources Tax in the 1980s. Both sides have done it. Jim Kalali, the former Deputy Assistant Commissioner of Taxation in this country, responsible for large companies and, multi and, and international matters, said that 90 per cent, he said it in 1996 and 2010, 90 per cent of Australia's large companies are foreign owned and since 1953 have paid little or no company tax. Meanwhile, people in this country are paying, individuals are paying exorbitant tax rates and the median income in this country now is $51,000. After tax, that's around about 45, 46,000. And the additional costs of Labor, Greens, Nationals, Liberals policy on energy, the additional costs of solar and wind subsidies and climate subsidies is a staggering $1,300 per year. How the hell can someone earning $45,000, $46,000 a year afford that additional cost? That's not electricity cost. That's additional cost for solar and wind subsidies. We're sending the country broke because of the people in this building. Having the, lacking the courage to do what is right and to tell the truth. Veterans need more support and this bill is just not enough. When will Labor and the Greens do something about housing, rents, veteran suicides, agriculture, energy, inflation? Who will protect the economy and jobs? Who will create the economic environment that enables people to invest, innovate, create and be entrepreneurs. Who will do that? When will Labor and the Greens do something about this very issue? Who will restore the productive capacity of our country, the economic environment of our country? Labor and the Greens don't understand. In fact, while I enjoyed listening to Senator Ormond Payne yesterday and, and sharing her emotions freely, she was crying at the plight of the poor, 
and then congratulating Senator Larissa Waters for her 12 years in the Senate, in which Senator Waters is directly responsible for raising the costs of electricity that is destroying the poor and raising prices through the roof in terms of inflation. That's what's going on. It's complete ignorance. Contrary to that, we understand. One Nation understands the root cause and the, and the solutions to the root causes of these problems. We are one people, we are one community, and we are one magnificent country with enormous potential. We just need to become again one nation. Thank you. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, this bill uh, seeks to amend social security law and related elements of the veterans and family laws. This is in order to make it clear the law operates in the same way when participants access self-employment services through the self-employment assistance program as through the new enterprise incentive scheme. They're subtle but important changes to ensure services are streamlined and support is available to people engaged in self-employment and small businesses across Australia. We can all appreciate the importance of small business to the Australian economy communities and to families. There are around 2.4 million small businesses actively trading and employing around 4.7 million people. Mr Deputy President, self-employed people take many familiar forms. They could be a writer, a photographer, hairdresser, accountant, landscaper or lawyer. Self-employment is an alternative to traditional employment and offers Australians the opportunity to use their skills to succeed. It gives Australians freedom to use their existing experience and skills to work in an environment of their choice. Our government recognises the importance of this choice and the support needed to foster that choice. Self-employment also helps Australians who struggle to apply their skills in other labour markets or labour market settings to use those skills and succeed in their area of employment. And that's why people, especially those with a disability, who still face significant challenges having their skills recognised by employers, are more likely to be self-employed than the general population in Australia. Whether it's an Indigenous artist based in the Northern Territory or a cafe owner in Sydney, Self-employment provides an invaluable opportunity for Australians to pursue their passion and find meaningful work that is valuable to themselves, their family, their community and the Australian economy. It's really why this bill is so important. It will give self-employed Australians confidence that there is clear and consistent treatment of income-tested support within the relevant legislative frameworks. The significance of this support cannot be understated. The Labor Party has a strong history of supporting new small businesses and self-employment. Mr Deputy President, it was the Hawke government that launched the New Enterprise Incentive Scheme, or NICE program, in 1985 to help unemployed Australians create their own employment opportunities. Since then, NICE has successfully helped over around 200,000 Australians to start and run small businesses. The program provided small business training and 12 months of personalised mentoring to support Australians to start viable small businesses. The Self-Employment Assistance Program today builds on the success of NICE and its legacy. Through additional and more tailored services that allow participants to choose what support they need for their small business. The amendments will help make sure the same support made available under NICE will continue to support people in the self-employment assistance program today. Both self-employment assistance and the entrepreneurship facilitator program give participants the tools they need to create their own business and earn an income to achieve financial independence. With fewer traditional jobs available and an increased number of job-ready seekers on the employment services caseload. Self-employment assistance offers flexible services to help people who are interested in becoming self-employed and people who are existing micro-business owners and is delivered by small business specialist providers in 51 employment regions across Australia. 
the involvement of self-employment support and associated reforms has become more far-ranging and inclusive since the beginnings of the NICE almost 40 years ago. In 2012, concurrency for disability employment services participants was introduced to the program. This allowed disability employment services participants to continue to have access to specialised disability support while also accessing specialised small business support from a NICE provider. Australia's Disability Strategy 2021 to 2031 recognises the crucial role of self-employment and business ownership in increasing employment opportunities for people living with a disability. Self-employment creates opportunity amidst the labour market disadvantages faced by people living with a disability. In fact, individuals with a disability already had a higher relative rate of business ownership than those without a disability. Australia's Disability Entrepreneurial Ecosystem, a joint report from the University of Technology, Sydney, National Disability Services, Settlement Services International and Breakthrough People Solutions, published in 2020, found that people with a disability were 40 per cent more likely to be self-employed. In 2016, the highly disadvantaged trial was also introduced to provide additional support for more Australians engaged in self-employment. This trial targeted a range of disadvantaged cohorts, such as migrants, people with a disability and those from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. In 2018, the High Disadvantage Trial was amended to focus on assisting migrant and refugees and NICE providers could access these places on an as-needed basis. In 2019, entrepreneurship facilitators were expanded to 23 regions across Australia, broadening eligibility to anyone wishing to start their own business. A year later, eligibility to access NICE was also amended to support part-time businesses, to assist those with caring responsibilities or working part-time, to be able to access support to create their own income through self-employment. It also supported existing micro-businesses impacted by COVID-19 to ex access support to pivot their businesses to remain viable. In July last year, veterans transitioning out of the Australian Defence Forces and adult family members were able to access workshops and commence NICE training while still in the ADF to explore self-employment while still employed. Strong demand for support emerged during COVID-19 when there were fewer traditional jobs available and many job seekers sought to create their own job by starting a small business. Nice or new business assistance with Nice ended on the 30th of June this year, replaced with the new self-employment assistance program, which supports more tailored servicing and for participants to choose which services they need to access to support their self-employment journey. Mr Deputy President, I'd just like to also share some, some of the personal stories of this program. Uh, participants value the space the self-employment program creates to focus on developing their business ideas and learning critical foundational skills like bookkeeping and connecting with mentors. And the program also creates a safety net for those just starting out allowing them to start earning income from their new business while NICE allowance is paid. Participants can also receive income from outside the business, such as from investments or other work while receiving assistance. Successful NICE alumni include singers, comedians, web designers, music venue developers and artisan ice cream makers. But I do want to bring to the Senate the story fantastic story from the Northern Territory. It's one of almost 200,000 coming from the Nice, which really humanises the importance of good policy and small business support. In 2012, Holly Copping opened the doors to the Territory Laser Clinic. Established while participating in the Nice program, the Territory Laser Clinic offers a range of treatments, including those relating to acne, acne scarring and tattoo removal. And having experienced acne from the age of 12, Holly wanted to ensure no one struggled with the same issues 
that she did, and she became the Northern Territory's first qualified dermal therapist. Holly enjoyed using her knowledge, Mr Deputy President, and her expertise to change people's lives. While participating in NICE, Holly was nominated for two regional awards and was awarded the National NICE Association's Award for Best New Business in 2013. And she became the first Northern Territory business to win the award. Holly was presented with the award by the Deputy Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, which, which was a very, very special moment for her. And I just want to put into Hansard uh, Holly's quotes on when she reflected on how far that program had taken her and, and where it actually took her. And I quote from Holly. I can honestly say that the NICE program is 100 per cent worth the effort. The advice and coaching I received was invaluable. Monthly mentoring and quarterly visits ensured that I monitored the growth of my business. And the financial support was amazing, to say the least. I can highly recommend this program to anyone who has a new business idea." End of quote. And so that was Holly Copping uh, when she received her award. And Mr Deputy President, it's, it's really individual stories like this that show us the real impact that business support has on people's lives, particularly when it comes to self-employment and fostering small business. Small businesses are the backbone of many communities across Australia. Small business and those with less than 20 employees comprise around 98 per cent of all business operating in the Australian economy. And as I said previously, they employ around 4.7 million people, or around 41 per cent of the business workforce. Small business are diverse, operating in every industry and region, attracting a range of different owners and employees. And they can be highly agile and adept at responding to areas of the economy that are experiencing growth. Small business are continuously entering and exiting the Australian economy. As at 30 June 2021, there were around 2.4 million actively trading businesses in the Australian economy, and within this landscape, around 360,000 new businesses entered the economy and around 270,000 businesses exited. Small businesses are particularly significant employers in the agriculture, forestry and fishing, rental, hiring and real estate, construction and professional, scientific and technical services sector. So while the industry mix changes over time, Mr Deputy President, the most common sectors for new NICE businesses are hospitality, retail trade, transport and logistics and professional services. Self-employment programs such as self-employment assistance and the entrepreneurship facilitator programs have a role in helping people to create new small businesses and ensuring people starting these businesses have the ability and knowledge to survive, thrive and grow. Mr Deputy President, there was a significant increase in self-employment seen through COVID due to the lack of traditional jobs available, which is perhaps another demonstration of the importance of flexibility in self-employment and associated programs. There will be $843 million available over five years from 2021 to 22 for self-employment services, and this is an absolutely critical investment. Self-employment assistance overall is a more flexible and tailored program and allows participants to access the service components in any order based on their individual needs. Self-employment assistance providers have a greater role in promoting self-employment opportunities as well as the program in their local regions to the broader community as well as key stakeholders. These important changes streamline the delivery of services, increase referrals to self-employment and reduces duplication. The bill, as part of Schedule 1, will also ensure that if self-employment assistance is given a different name, the family, social security and veterans entitlement laws will continue to operate in the same way. Whether you're a veteran, young person, refugee or a single mother with caring duties, 
It's important we as parliamentarians extend our support to self-employed Australians who need it. Senator Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise today also to make a contribution on the Social Security and Other Legislation Amendments, Self-Employment Programs and Other Measures Bill. This bill provides clarity around two self-employment programs that support Australians to start and run small businesses. Firstly, the New Enterprise Incentive Scheme, the NEIS, a scheme that was established in 1985 under a Labor government and which has successfully assisted 198,000 people in starting their own business since its commencement. An incredible achievement. And secondly, the Self-Employment Assistance Program, which largely expanded upon and replaced the New Enterprise Incentive Scheme when it commenced on 1 July 2022. This bill clarifies that the law operates in the same way for self-employment assistance as it now operates for the new Enterprise Incentive Scheme. It makes amendments to not only the Social Security law, but also related elements of two additional important laws, the Veterans and Family Laws. The bill will update these laws to make clear that self-employment assistance payments will be treated in the same way by the law as the previous New Enterprise Incentive Scheme payments. The bill adds an additional definition of self-employment program and allows for a change in the name of self-employment assistance by the Employment Secretary to ensure the same laws will apply if the assistance is renamed. And lastly, the bill makes a small number of minor technical amendments. Deputy President, this bill is an administrative amendment to provide clarification to participants using two incredibly valuable self-employment programs. Two programs designed with the intention to provide assistance to Australians wanting to create new small businesses. As I mentioned previously, the new Enterprise Incentive Scheme was launched under the Hawke government and has helped nearly 200,000 people since it commenced 37 years ago. It's a program designed to help people move off income support by starting their own business and generating their own income. People who otherwise may have had to continue to rely on Social Security or Veterans Entitlements payments and for the past two and a half years, the COVID payment. This is a program with proven effectiveness. It was found that three months after exiting the program, 82% of participants remained in employment and 68% were still running their business. An excellent outcome and an excellent outcome for the individuals, for the real lives which this has impacted and the real businesses and opportunities that they've created. Now, on top of that, more than half of the participants who accessed the new Enterprise Incentive Scheme over the past seven years were women. A fantastic opportunity for women to earn their own income, support their families and contribute economically to their communities. The Self-Employment Assistance Program commenced on 1 July 2022 and we know it builds upon the existing services of the new Enterprise Incentive Scheme. The Self-Employment Assistance Program provides further flexibility and more tailored services to allow participants to access the support that best suits their circumstance. This includes accredited training to prepare a comprehensive business plan, advice sessions and business health checks. These services will help people to generate and validate business ideas and assist them in making informed decisions about the efficacy of their business plan. The Self-Employment Assistance Program will continue the self-employment allowance that was established under the new Enterprise Incentive Scheme. And this allowance from the government helps supplement the income a participant earns from their business to provide them with the ability to reinvest their business earnings back into that business. Deputy President, in our home state of South Australia, programs that aid the employment sector are especially welcomed and I know you would welcome them too. Although we have seen an improvement in the unemployment rate nationally, we know in my state of South Australia, the unemployment rate tends to be behind the national average. Indeed, the ABS June report showed that South Australia's unemployment rate was 4.3% compared to 3.5% nationally, now tied with Tasmania as the highest rate in Australia. Of course, these aren't just statistics, they're real people. And when we lag behind the national employment rate, that has a real impact on people in my state. I said in my first speech to this place, securing jobs in my state it requires governments to stand up and fight for them. That we can never be complacent about the need to create effective policies that address the ongoing risks to job security in South Australia. To deliver good jobs in South Australia, we need to actively forge a good economy, to forge those opportunities for people into work, into business, 
into opportunities that grow jobs because we know in South Australia a strong and resilient economy does not build itself. It has always required a degree of support, of assistance. And I'm really, really proud of the work that successive Labor governments have done to grow business, to grow opportunity and to grow jobs in our state. And I know that work now under a state and federal Labor government will only continue. Two governments genuinely concerned with jobs in our state, with fighting for those jobs, with building the conditions to make sure more jobs come to South Australia. Two governments who want South Australian workers, South Australian businesses to succeed. And two governments who understand that that must happen in partnership, that we need businesses and workers to succeed side by side and, of course, creating these fantastic opportunities for small business, giving people that opportunity to enter um, to enter that sector, to create a business, to potentially become employers themselves and to further grow and strengthen our economy and all the opportunities that participation in work brings. But back to the bill at hand, the new enterprise incentive scheme and self-employment assistance provides South Australians with an alternative to traditional work. And we know it's having a big impact on many of the South Australians who have been able to access it. I want to share a story now about a South Australian called Chloe Gardner. Ms Gardner is an award-winning filmmaker who has also worked as an actress and in management across many companies. Ms Gardner didn't have much business knowledge, but through the new enterprise incentive scheme was able to bring her ideas together and gain that knowledge required to start a business. Knowledge like financial management, legal matters, marketing, and this assistance provided and the knowledge gained from her time in the new enterprise incentive scheme facilitated the creation of her award-winning business, Kids Camera Action a business that was selected as a world-class organisation to present workshops um, in the United Arab Emirates in 2018. This business has enabled thousands of children across South Australia to learn new skills and refine existing strengths in the art of filmmaking. What an incredible contribution to these kids in South Australia and to the community as a whole. These sorts of stories are inspiring and empowering. And I wish we heard more of them, especially given how tough South Australians have been doing it these past years, and particularly young South Australians. As we know, young South Australians suffered tremendously over the past decade. Of course, there was a COVID pandemic, a, a pandemic we are still living in and dealing with now. But through its most difficult phases, through those first few years, those young people were left behind in my state by a government which didn't give their voices the prominence it deserved. And young people, let's be clear, bear the brunt of government failures often more than any other group in society. They've suffered through two years of insecure employment, cuts to education and government policy which pushed them to raid their super, their small balances of super. Will they ever recover from this raid? This is a government which pushed further and further the burden of its choices, the consequences of its choices and actions onto the younger generation, a generation whom it also denied from having a proper and loud voice at the heart of government, something I note that the Labor government will address and I note the work of our Minister for Youth and what she intends to bring forward to make sure that young people's voices are well and truly heard within the Albanese Labor government. Of course, when we think about things like the trillion dollars of debt inherited by those opposite, the burden of that falls disproportionately on young people. We know that. And it's them who will feel the after effects of government failure for years to come. Deputy President, I am proud to stand in this chamber today and speak on this bill and the additional positive policies and plans of the Albanese government that will help young Australians. Because really that's what it's all about, the opportunities to create jobs, to create opportunities for young people. And that is what we are all about in Labor. And we've got policies that will bring back secure employment and make our education system more accessible. Now, I stood in this chamber when those opposite made significant cuts to the university sector, which made it harder and more expensive for many young Australians to go to university. It was unacceptable. It was unacceptable. We want our education system to be more accessible and not less. We want job security front and centre, or we'll make it an object of the Fair Work Act and ensure the Fair Work Commission considers it. We want to, we've got a range of policies to support casual workers, to support workers employed um, directly through companies, also through labour hire, measures that will bring 
work security to, our, to workers in Australia and bring back confidence in the workforce. Unfortunately, the previous government's TAFE and education cuts meant a loss in skills and training across Australia, another thing that we are working to fix. The self-employment assistance program described in this bill provides the training required for those wanting to start a small business. But this is not everything, of course. We need to get that investment into TAFE, into training. That's why we're providing 465,000 fee-free TAFE places to train Australians in jobs currently experiencing school shortages. Jobs like engineering, like nursing, like tech and teaching will deliver up to 20,000 extra uni places over 2022 and 2023, making it easier to get a spot at uni. And for young people who want to go to uni, who want that opportunity, ultimately that's their, their ticket to a chance at a job in their chosen field. All of these measures combined with the programs explained in this bill and, and all the things in our agenda to make our economy fairer, to create jobs, to grow opportunities for young people. These are things to celebrate. These are part of our agenda as the Albanese Labor government. I think there is, uh, there is certainly plenty of work we need to do to make sure that young South Australians, indeed all South Australians who want to enter the workforce, have an opportunity to access good jobs, indeed create their own businesses. For young people to support their choices, whether it's to go to university, whether it's to do a trade, an apprenticeship, whatever it may be that enables our young people to fulfil their dreams and aspirations and hopes, that's something worthy of our government's support. And for all South Australians who want to work, to, who indeed appreciate and understanding the dignity of work and what those opportunities mean for families, I know so many South Australians value that and value that it is something in our state which is not uh, ever to be taken for granted. Our opportunities, our employment prospects, jobs in my state of South Australia are things that governments actually have to fight for. So I do acknowledge the work of our state Labor government and our federal Labor government. These are really, really important things. So I thank the Senate for the opportunity to talk on the bill and I commend it to the Senate. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy President. And uh, I rise with some degree of pleasure to actually speak on this bill, uh, another initiative um, coming from uh, the newly elected Albanese government that is firmly focused on enabling Australians and bringing jobs into being and making sure that people who need support in establishing their own work through their small businesses get the assistance that they need. So this bill, the Social Security and Other Legislation Amendment, Self-Employment Programs and Other Measures Bill of 2022, makes small but nonetheless crucial amendments to replace the new enterprise incentive scheme with the Self-Employment Assistance Program throughout most of Australia. I think um, we can underplay the importance of how things are named. And I know in the previous parliament, uh, I, I was very distressed that some of the bills that were, um, whose titles were de de determined by the government, the then government, didn't actually say what they did. Australians understand what it is to become self-employed with all the joys, with all the opportunities, with all the excitement, but also with all the debt, the worries and the concerns. But they know what self-employment is, and this is what that bill is about. The bill clarifies that the Social Security Law, Veterans Entitlements Law and Family Law operate in the same way for a new program, the Self-Employment Assistance, as for the NICE. And, um, they also, it also makes uh, a few other minor amendments and clarifications to the current Social Security Law. Self-employment assistance is vital to help those who are wanting to launch their own business and those who have launched their own business and through that experience come to a point of figuring out that they actually need to have a few of their particular questions answered. Uh, it can be one thing to be inspired to create your own business, find out a little bit on the internet and get started, but there will be headwinds. And this program recognises that and is here to support people so that they can get the assistance that they need. 
Now, clearly, it's had some impact of uh, a positive kind on the uh, the futures of those who started business in recent years. The NICE figures show that it's helped nearly 200,000 Australians be their own, best, be their own bosses uh, and put to rea into reality uh, their dreams of independence. Um, I do want to say that uh, there has been for far too long a argument um, and a unquestioned in some parts of the, um, the Australian community sense that small business is represented by one party in, in this place. Well, that is absolutely not the case. And I know that when I talk to colleagues around the chamber and certainly amongst my colleagues in the Labor Party, that very many of us either grew up in family businesses, in small businesses, or ran them ourselves. And I see uh, Senator McAllister here, and I know that she uh, grew up in uh, the Northern Rivers part of uh, New South Wales. And Seriously, without uh, small businesses that were functioning and operating there, people would be profoundly disadvantaged in terms of employment. Great employers create jobs. And the reality is not everybody wants to be an employer. Not everybody wants to set up their own business. Not everybody has the health, the well-being, the disposition, the opportunity or the capital to undertake the risk of small business. Not everybody is willing to sell their house, as my father did. I cannot believe he convinced my mother to do this, having struggled to get a house five years after they arrived at Blacktown, 17 Curran Street, fibro, two, two, a, a double fronter, no furniture. They got a house five years after they arrived in the country. And my father convinced my mother to sell that house so that he could buy a machine, a front end back, uh, a backhoe, front end loader backhoe so that he could commence his own business. Not everybody has that dream and that vision. And not everybody is willing to take on the joys and the risks. But uh, coming from a small business family, I know how important it can be to get the right advice and the right assistance when the, when, when the time is right for, that, for you, for your business. Now, the self-employment assistance is a fantastic program that helps job seekers to create their own business and earn an income to achieve financial independence. And sometimes this is born of necessity. If you can't find a job in the area that you live in and you start to figure out that actually there's a whole lot of lawns that haven't been mowed in my street, and perhaps I might you know, go down to Mrs Jones and I'll, I'll, I'll begin to do that. Well, there's a whole lot of questions that follow on from that. What's the health and safety obligations? What do I need to do to establish this? Have I got enough money for the plant and equipment? What are the protections? People have questions. Now, this program provides flexible services to people who are interested in becoming self-employed and people who are um, in existing micro-businesses. And the program itself is delivered by uh, business owners and by small business specialists. And this is provided through 51 employment regions across Australia. So if you or someone you know and love is at the point where they need some assistance with their small business, their micro business, or you might have plans to start your own business. Know that right across the country there is this program there ready to assist you. And uh, when businesses succeed and they grow, they generate jobs. And that is a fine thing to do, to create work for one of our fellow Australians. The services that are provided across these 51 employment regions in Australia include exploring self-employment workshops uh, and involve five sessions that are delivered um, over a period of one to three weeks, providing participants with all the information that they might need about self-employment and what they need to really know to start and run a business. I'm sure that some who've already started will go in there and think, oh my goodness, I could have made my life so much easier if I'd got a bit of information. And there'd be others who'd be going in with more detailed questions because they have started and they want to know how they can improve what they're doing. Small business training will provide participants with the foundation skills they need to start and run a small business. And they can access accredited training and choose to do a shorter skill set or a longer cert three or four in entrepreneurship and new business. And uh, having uh, been a teacher in my life prior to coming to parliament, it's amazing how young people who really were not interested in what school had to offer, when they find their passion, 
are interested in finding out what they need to do to bring their passion to life and to monetise it and be able to live their best life uh, employing themselves doing what they want to do. So uh, returning to study for people who might not have enjoyed school is something that is happening through this program. And it's vital that we have access to training programs, and that's why Labor's support of fee-free TAFE places are critical to the growth of jobs in this country and to liberate the ca capacity and talent of the nation by giving people the opportunity to take what they know and to build on it through further training without incurring an enormous debt that can be the, the, the thing that stops them from following their dreams. Uh, the other supports that are offered through this program include a business plan development um, that supports people to prepare a viable business plan to help their business succeed, helping them to identify strategies for success and forecast the cash flow for their business. Uh, business advice sessions are also available, offering targeted advice relating to participants' business idea or existing micro-business owners, with sessions being delivered over the course of an hour. So sometimes it is just a chat with a mentor that can really unplug some particularly sticky situations for small businesses. There's also business health checks for existing micro uh, business owners where the participant works with a provider to find ways to improve the viability of the business and they can be delivered in one-to-one, one-on-one sessions over three hours. Small business coaching is available also and that offers 12 months, 12 months of personalised mentoring and support to help participants start, develop and run a successful business. Now, the participants who are accepted into the small business coaching element of the program can also receive financial support to purchase up to $300 worth of business costs, such as business insurance. Um, as I said earlier, you know, I still am amazed that uh, my father was able to convince my mother to um, risk capital from a house to commence a business and, and go out and start digging trenches and building roads. Um, so, as somebody who grew up in that environment, practicing answering the phone for the business from age seven, uh, it's a knowledge and skill set that many of us learned at the kitchen table, uh, learned through our immersion in family uh, businesses. But for many Australians, uh, that is a commencement of the learning that needs to be further developed outside the kitchen table with other people who have mental capacities and. Uh, visual and uh, technical skills to help people understand the full potential of their business. Um, the programs here that I'm describing really provide a level playing field and provide some security and support to make sure that these businesses set up in a way that's compliant with Australian law and give them the best chance of success. I know any aspiring small business owner needs the right skills and the tools to realise their dreams and this program is designed to that end. Small businesses everywhere are the engine room of growth for the Australian economy, but they are particularly vital in the regions of Australia, like the Central Coast, my home. Uh, only a couple of hours north of Sydney, but another world entirely uh, where public transport doesn't exist and small businesses actually are the driver of our local economy. I also am the duty senator for uh, pretty well most of the western part of uh, New South Wales for the seats of Calais, for the seat of Parks, for the seat of Farrah, Hume and the Riverina, also for the seat of Lyon. All these seats where incredible business is done and incredible wealth for the country is generated is, re is replete with people commencing their own journey of small business. We need to help nurture more and more of these small businesses to keep growing our economy. They are often sites at which innovation occurs. Small businesses um, form 98 per cent of all existing businesses and they employ 41 per cent of Australia's workforce. Now that's an astounding number of Australians who are engaged in small business. Uh, either as the director of the business or as an employee. So that's 4.7 million of us are involved in small business. And for many people, small business is their pathway to the middle class and to enable them to fulfil their aspirations. Uh, and it's not surprising that in the story that I tell about my parents that I, I'll add a little bit to it, that they were immigrants 
first arriving here in uh, the end of 1960 and putting their shoulders to the wheel in, in an economy that was actually growing at the time. And they really, really worked hard to get themselves a far better life than they had left behind in England where they met and in Ireland where they had been born. It's so important that we provide all Australians with free education programs that allow them to access the opportunities that they need to fully contribute to Australia and our success as a nation. The results of the program are there for all to see. 198,000 people have been helped by the program, including 47,259 who have started a new business since July of 2015. Pleased to say that 25,249 of those entrepreneurs were women. Um, that's 53 per cent. And 18,791 were actually mature age women, mature age people, um, aged 45 years and over. Uh, the program itself also plays a vital role in helping Australians with a disability become self-employed. Now, disabled Australians actually have a higher rate of uh, rel of relative business ownership than non-disabled Australians at 11.6 per cent compared to only 8.2 per cent of the general public. And the Australian Disability Strategy 2021-23 actively seeks to increase that already substantial number. Uh, if there was more time, I would tell you about two fantastic uh, participants in this program, MAS3D Epoxy Floor Coatings uh, in Ride and Just Enough Beach Hand Poured Candles, which is from the New South Wales uh, North Coast in Yamba. They're just a couple of the thousands and thousands of companies that have benefited from taking their business and themselves through this program, through mentoring to improve the capacity of their business. And with success comes more and more jobs. Now, these are stories we should be celebrating and more and more the revamp of this program uh, will provide those opportunities. Our economy will get on, back on track through the hard work and initiative of people like those business owners who have already benefited. And Labor certainly believes in giving entrepreneurial Australians the toolkit they need to start their own business, be their own boss and grow the jobs for future Australians. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, and I to rise to speak on the Social Security and Other Legislation Amendment, Self-Employment Programs and Other Measures Bill of 2022. Uh, and this bill seeks to update the Social Security Act of 1991, the Veterans Entitlements Act of 1986 and the Family Law Regulations 1984 to provide clarity and consistency in our laws regarding the new self-employment assistance program. Uh, this program, the Self-Employment Assistance Program, which started on July 1 this year, replaced the new enterprise uh, incentive scheme. Uh, and uh, Labor is very proud um, of our history with this program. Uh, Labor recognises that small businesses are a vital part of our economy. Uh, we know that there are over 2.4 million small businesses actively trading uh, in Australia today uh, and that they employ um, almost five million workers. Uh, and the development of small business is also an alternative to traditional employment for so many Australians that can provide secure work uh, and financial independence if people are supported with programs like this. Um, and uh, while also um, supporting Australians to use their skills that might not otherwise be recognised by traditional employers to still succeed. Um, that is part of the role of uh, small business as an alternative to traditional employment for many people. Successive Labor governments have supported uh, and encouraged the development of small business in Australia. And the new Enterprise Incentive Scheme is just one example of that. The scheme was introduced by the Hawke Labor government um, way back in 1985 to help unemployed Australians create their own employment opportunities. Uh, and it's been running for 37 years. And over the course of those 37 years, 
This scheme has helped almost 200,000 Australians to start and run uh, their very own small business. Uh, and before this scheme's uh, creation, before it, it came into effect, uh, when someone started a small business, they would cease to be eligible to access income support. Uh, and that acted as a barrier to those who otherwise would have sought to take on a small business venture and create uh, their own employment opportunity. So to incentivise those who were uh, unemployed to create a small business, the Hawke government launched a trial of the new enterprise incentive scheme, um, offering participants an allowance in line with their income support entitlement providing small business training with courses designed for participants to learn foundational business skills and develop business plans, uh, and as well 12 months of personalised mentoring to support those participants to create um, their very own viable business. Um, later, in 2012, this scheme was expanded to include participants of the disability employment services supporting Australians with a disability to develop a small business, uh, giving them the flexibility and financial independence of self-employment. The educational and mentoring support included in this scheme has also been extended to those not on income support to encourage more Australians to start viable small businesses. Um, in the last few years, eligibility for the scheme has also been expanded to veterans transitioning out of the Australian Defence Forces. Um, also giving them access to training uh, while they are still employed. Uh, and it's also been expanded to support part-time businesses, assisting those with part-time employment um, who may also, for example, have caring responsibilities. So these really important expansions have increased participation in the new enterprise investment scheme. Uh, and in fact, it's women who make up 53 um, per cent of participants over the past several years in the scheme. Uh, and people with a disability make up almost 20 per cent of participants. So great outcomes have been delivered for these participants. Um, and uh, we can see that in some of the, the success statistics uh, on the program, with 82 per cent of participants remaining in employment three months after they exit the program, uh, and almost 70 per cent still running their business. Um, now, strong demand emerged for this program during COVID, uh, when uh, fewer traditional jobs were available, and many job seekers were looking to, to self-employment through starting a small business as the way forward um, during very difficult times. So this scheme also helped many businesses pivot to deliver services in new uh, and innovative ways uh, to remain viable, um, really demonstrating the key role that government can play in helping businesses adapt in uncertain times. Um, on July 1 this year, uh, the scheme I've been describing was replaced with the new self-employment assistance program. And this new program builds on the success of that Hawke government legacy, uh, dating back uh, 37 years to, to 1985. Um, with a budget of over $840 million over five years, the program will continue to support Australians to start and run small businesses, which will create uh, jobs, grow our economy uh, and improve labour market outcomes. The new program allows uh, eligible people interested in self-employment to receive free help to generate and validate business ideas, um, allowing them to make um, really well-informed decisions about whether self-employment is actually a good fit for them uh, and potentially for their families. The expanded program will provide additional services um, that will be tailored to participants, um, allowing them to choose the supports that they need um, the supports that really suit them in the small business that they would like to set up, um, such as free accredited training, um, business plan development, business advice sessions and business health checks. Uh, and as well, business mentoring uh, and advice will be available for eligible business owners that have only recently started trading 
or need assistance to adapt their business and their business model uh, in our changing economic environment. The self-employment assistance program retained the successful components of the new enterprise investment scheme while introducing changes to, to small business and entrepreneurship services um, to make them more flexible uh, and improving access for job seekers and micro business owners. So this bill will ensure that the same supports available under the, the former scheme will continue to support participants of the self-employment assistance program, uh, making clear uh, in our laws that the, the previous provisions for payments apply equally to the payments under the self-employment assistance program. Uh, and that uh, is very important to providing clarity for participants while they support themselves to establish their new business. Um, we recognise that this program has supported Australians to gain flexibility and financial security through self-employment. Uh, and we recognise that self-employment is a viable pathway for Australians to move off income support, earn their own income and contribute to their communities. Um, but what we also know, of course, is that starting a small business takes a lot of time and it requires a lot of support, particularly financial support. Uh, and Labor is committed to supporting and fostering self-employment opportunities um, for small businesses, for people who want to start their own small business. And we understand how critical small businesses are to our economy. Uh, and I must say that it was a pleasure to, to follow on in my comments from Senator O'Neill, um, who has been such a champion for small uh, business in this country. Uh, and I echo uh, the comments that uh, Senator O'Neill made. Uh, and the passion that she demonstrated um, for our government to show support to people to really pursue their dreams uh, in setting up their own small business. Uh, like Senator O'Neill, uh, Labor across the board is committed to supporting uh, and fostering people's small business opportunities. Um, we know that small business is critical um, across the economy um, but also to particular local communities and particularly regional communities, uh, as Senator O'Neill said as well. Um, they do make up 98 per cent of all businesses in our country uh, and employ around 41 per cent of the business workforce. Um, small businesses are in every part of the country, every industry and every region around, uh, around Australia. Uh, and so often small business is the real backbone of local communities. Um, this new enterprise investment scheme is a legacy of the Hawke Labor government uh, and it is really a, a, such a strong sign of um, the work that this parliament can do when we work together in a bipartisan fashion um, to support good programs because we have a legacy here with this program that has lasted for over 37 years through 14 parliaments. Uh, and that is the sort of change that Labor governments can deliver for Australians and that Labor governments will continue to deliver for Australians. Um, lasting change, change that helps people to not only keep their heads above water, not only survive, but actually thrive. Thrive in their businesses uh, and in their communities. Um, this is a program that we are so proud of because it supports people to upskill and reskill uh, and gives them the tools uh, to be successful. Um, it supports Australians to find secure work, um, whether that is in a traditional employment setting or whether it's through self-employment. Um, our government uh, will maximise small business participation uh, in Commonwealth uh, procurement. Uh, and use our purchasing power to support small business um, as well um, through uh, those procure procurement measures too. Uh, we believe in delivering better value for money, growing our local economy uh, and providing greater opportunities for business um, to create more uh, and, and better and more secure Australian jobs. 
Our government will help address skills shortages that are affecting small businesses through fee-free TAFE uh, and our cheaper childcare policy. Um, we're committed to removing barriers to getting people into the workforce, uh, as well as um, barriers for those who want to, to return to work. The Albanese government is delivering a better deal for small business by listening to their needs reviving genuine collaboration between small business uh, and government and drawing on Labor's history of working with unions, workers and industry to deliver better outcomes for all. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Acting President. I rise to speak on the um, Social Security and Other Legislation um, Amendment um, Bill. Small business in Australia has taken a battering over the last two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, and none more so than those who are just starting out. That's why it's more important than ever for government to support and encourage the development of new, new small businesses and to help viable businesses to adapt to change. Small businesses are a vital part of the Australian economy, with 2.4 million small businesses actively trading and employing around 4.7 million people. In Tasmania, the state I represent, 97 per cent of businesses are small businesses, and there are just under 40,000 small businesses employing around 100,000 people. That figure really hits home when you consider that there are around 263,700 employed people in the whole state. So nearly 40 per cent of working Tasmanians are employed in a small business. And almost a quarter of all Tasmanian small business operators are born overseas. Labor knows that giving Australians the opportunity to be their own boss and and own a business that offers them secure work and financial independence is absolutely vital. For many Australians, self-employment is a great alternative to traditional employment, allowing them to use their existing skills and experience in a work environment in which they get to shape and mould. It also assists Australians who struggle to apply their skills in other labour market settings, so to use those skills and succeed. It is particularly important as an option for people with disability who still face significant challenges having their skills recognised by employers. It is interesting to note that people living with disability are more than 40 per cent more likely to be self-employed than the rest of the general population. But it takes time and other support to establish a small business, including financial support. The new Enterprise Incentive Scheme has operated for over 35 years across Australia, and it is designed to assist people receiving job, job network or Centrelink services to develop and launch their own small business. It was established by the Hawke Labor government and was launched as a pilot program on the first day of July 1985. This scheme was very much designed to help unemployed Australians create their own employment opportunities and provide a safety net for those just starting out, allowing them to start earning income for, for, from their new business while the scheme allowance is paid. The scheme was established as an ongoing program in 1987 after an evaluation report identified it was having a positive effect on sustained self-employment. In 1988, the program was modified to allow private sector and non-government organisations to deliver their scheme, uh, services run through, the, run through the Department of Education, Skills and Employment. It provides training to, in how to develop, plan and execute a business and then allows people to operate their business with supported funding for up to 12 months. The program provides small business training and 12 months of personalised mentoring support from contracted business owners or identified men met mentors. During the 12 months, this participants are offered 
an allowance equal to basic job seeker rates for up to nine months and rent assistance for up to six months. Since 1985, the NES has successfully helped over 198,000 Australians to start and run a small business. Small businesses are particularly significant employers in the agriculture, forestry and fishing, rental hiring and real, est and real estate, construction and professional, scientific and technical services sectors. While the industry mix, mix changes over time, the most common sectors for new nest businesses are hospitality, retail trade, transport and logistics and professional services. In 2012, concurrently, concurrency for disability employment service participants were introduced, allowing DES participants to continue to have access to specialised disability support while also access accessing specialised small business support from a NES prov provider. In 2016, as part of the Encouraging Entrepreneurship and Self-Employment Initiative, a range of new elements were announced to enhance the program. These included exploring, exploring Being My Own biz, Boss workshops aimed at encouraging people to explore whether self-employment would be right for them, with 1,000 workshop places available each year. Plus, an additional 2,300 places were made of, available each year to provide more opportunities. Eligibility to access the program was also broadened to allow people not on income support to access services. This is the first time the scheme was available to people that were not job seekers on income support. However, people that were, that were not in receipt of income support were not eligible for, to access the allowance. That allowance is equivalent to the single 22 or over no children rate of job seeker payment, which is $642.70 per fortnight. Entrepreneurship faci facilitators focused on youth and mature on the mature age were also introduced in areas with high youth and mature age unemployment. In 2016, the highly disadvantaged trial began, targeting a range of disadvantaged cohorts, including migrants, people with disabilities and those from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. 600 places were allocated to providers to deliver these services. In 2018, the highly disadvantaged trial was amended to focus on assisting migrants and refugees with NEST providers able to access these places on an as-need basis. Feedback from the trial indicated participants found the flexible training much better suited for their needs. They valued the increased mentoring and coaching to develop a business plan and started operating the business. And then in 2020, eligibility to access the scheme was amended to support part-time businesses to assist those with caring responsibilities or working part-time. Ex exiting micro-business impacted by COVID-19 were also able to access support to pivot their business to, to remain viable. From the 1st of July 2021, veterans transitioning out of the Australian Defence Force were able to access workshops and commenced nest training while still in the ADF to explore self-employment while still employed. Strong demand emerged during COVID-19 with fewer traditional jobs available and many job seekers sought to create their own job by starting a new small business. Additional places for the NES program were made available to recognise this demand. Running alongside this is the Entrepreneurship Facilitator Program, which complements the Self-Employment Assistant Program by promoting self-employment. It helps people to start and run their own business by providing information and advice and by referring people to appropriate support services, including self-employment assistance providers. As of July this year, the self-employment assistance program effectively replaced the NEST and builds on its success through additional and more tailored services that allow participants to choose what support they need for their small business. This self-employment assistance 
or C program commenced in all 51 employment regions across, to, across Australia and is a larger and revised version of the NES. It retains the successful components of NES and while making further changes to small business and entrepreneurship services to make them more flexible and easier for job seekers ex exiting micro business owners to access. To access. The bill we are considering, the Social Security and other legislation amendments, self-employment programs and other measures, Bill 2022, amends the Social Security law and related elements of the Veterans and Family Law. It is designed to make it clear that the law operates in the same way when participants access self-employment through services through self-employment assistance program. The C initiative aims to promote self employment for a range of activities, including micro-business courses, business planning, business advice and business health checks. New program features include idea generation and introduction to self-employment workshops, an increased number of eligible participants and a range of flexible services. Self-employment assistance includes additional in individual support components such as a business plan development, business advice sessions and business health checks. Overall, self-employment assistance is a more flexible and tailored program and allows participants to access the service components in any order based on their individual needs. Providers also need to ensure that their services are accessible to all participants, including those with poor digital literacy from coal backgrounds and those, who, those without ac access to appropriate technology and information. So people who may have experienced barriers to entrepreneurship in the past can now engage in the scheme for, through a wider range of services. This builds on the flexibilities that were recently introduced, which allows individuals with part-time employment, educational caring responsibilities to access effective small business support. The changes made to the scheme recognise the changing nature of small business ownership in Australia by giving participants, including individuals from a diverse range of backgrounds, greater flexibility in choosing which support they need to start and run their business and how they can access it and when they receive it. It is intended that the micro-enterprises will receive the service more flexible and authentic. In this changing and often unpredictable economic environment, eligible business owners who have recently started trading or who need help to adapt their business can access appropriate business mentoring and advice. As was the case under NES, eligible income support recipients who access the program can receive a self-employment allowance from the government. This helps supplement the income a participant earns from their business so they can reinvest their business earnings in the business. Self-employment assi uh, employment assistance is building on the NEST program's legacy of success by continuing its valuable support but, but through more flexible services that help a wider range of people secure their future. We know this program works. NEST has achieved excellent results from a diverse range of participants who have accessed it accessed its services. Three months after exiting the program, 82 per cent of participants remained in employment and 68 per cent were still running their business. And it supported women's economic security with more than half of the participants who accessed NEST over the past seven, year, seven years being women. Recently, we have also seen a clear demonstration that the government can play a key role in helping businesses adapt in uncertain times. Since the onset of COVID, the NEST has helped many businesses pivot to deliver services in new and innovative ways to remain viable. This bill will update the Social Security Veterans and Family Law to make, to make clear that the self-employment self assistant payments will be treated in the same way by the, law, uh, by the laws as any other NEST payment. The same will apply if the Employment Secretary ever notifies a different name for self-employment assistance. The bill will therefore provide increased clarity for participants as they support themselves while establishing the businesses. Just one example of many exciting outcomes of the scheme is the mountain experience, abseiling rock climbing adventures based on 
at Mount Wellington in Tasmania after 10 years working for other people as a tour guide and rock Senator climber. Brown, uh, it now being 7.20, uh, I propose that the Senate now adjourn. You will be in continuation when the debate on this bill continues. Uh, Senator Polly. Senator Antic. Over the past two and a half years, Australians have witnessed the rise of the unelected and unaccountable bureaucrat. We've witnessed the power these people now have over our lives. During this time, expert health officials incessantly pushed for lockdowns, for mandates and other nonsensical restrictions, restrictions which have proven to be both moral and medical failures. Doctors with concerns about the response to COVID found that nameless and faceless figures from the Australian Health Practitioners Regulatory Agency, APRA, would suspend their licence to practise medicine if they contradicted the bureaucracy's narratives, even in private, thus dismantling the doctor-patient confidentiality relationship and the idea of trusting your doctor's personal expertise rather than bureaucratic edicts. Incomprehensible rules and pointless procedures are the bread and butter of bureaucracies. In fact, the word bureaucracy itself means literally rule by desk, which is fitting, as very often these rules are made quite distant from those whose lives their decisions affect. Over the decades, parliaments have passed more and more laws and more and more regulations. We've hired more and more public servants, therefore, in order to ensure that those uh, administrative matters are taken into account. These apartments were created to fix problems, but they are concerned with justifying their internal processes rather than delivering measurable outcomes. The system has hidden behind experts telling us to blindly trust the science and refrain from asking questions using basic logic. Anyone who's been paying even the slightest amount of attention can see that many of the so-called experts have been wrong on virtually every point in the last two years, from lockdowns to the injections being safe and effective. Bureaucrats like to keep the fear alive to solidify their own importance and therefore their own funding. And if there's one word I never want to hear again, it's modelling. When was the last model that was proven in hindsight to be accurate? It's not just the COVID experience which bells the cat on the rise of big government. One only has to look at the intrusions by government into our lives in areas like the climate, the surveillance state and the rise of the quasi-state operatives. The apparatchiks of the big government ethos in universities, in schools and woke, the, the woke corporate sector and its insidious ESG agenda. Politicians must stop simply enforcing the whims of bureaucrats and the so-called experts. We exist to serve you, the Australian people, not to control your lives. There's an old biblical teaching which states, the greatest among you shall be your servant. This is the basis for the Western ethos of political leadership. In the entire history of mankind, there has never been a bureaucracy which is sincerely and genuinely concerned about people. Always question everything. Always look for ulterior motives. Why have they allowed Australians to be vilified? Why have they allowed Australians to be thrown out of jobs and discriminated against? Because they care so much about our safety? Or is it something else, something more sinister? Nobody should ever take the risk on the promise of being granted their freedom back. This is the stuff of tyrannical authoritarianism. And I hope Australian politics realises that Australians have had enough of having their lives run by people far removed from them. This is Australia, not the People's Republic of China. We should be governed by the lowest and least centralised level of authority as possible to preserve our basic freedoms, including freedom of movement, speech and choice. It's time we scaled back the power of these bureaucracies and it's time that politicians who say they love this country to go out and prove it. It's time we drain the billabong. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I'm speaking to the answers Minister Gallagher provided, or rather failed to provide, to my questions on gender dysphoria treatment. In avoiding the answer of my questions, the minister tried weakly to say, nothing to see here. Yet the world is waking up to the profoundly inhuman medical and psychological harms that children with gender dysphoria are experiencing when referred to gender clinics. The international trend is moving away from prescribing puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones to children under 18 years. Britain's infamous and the world's largest gender clinic, Tavistock, is now closing following a review that found it failed vulnerable under-18s. Failed vulnerable under-18s. It follows the clinics in Finland, Sweden and France, suspending the availability of puberty blockers and sex hormones to children unless under strict clinical trials. 
How did we get to this place where the power of ideology and transactivism is greater than the rightful duty and obligations of parents and of the medical and legal professions to provide whole of person care for children with gender dysphoria? This woke ideological movement is suffering binary dysphoria. Apparently, for some, a binary world is not sufficiently colourful. Some parents are now forced to abrogate their parental responsibility to the power of the medical state. Fundamental facts are being ignored about children and child development. Fact. Contrary to some views, sex is assigned at conception, not birth. We all know that adolescence is a highly challenging time, marked with the preoccupation of the discovery of self. It's okay that a percentage of both genders don't conform to traditional stereotypes. This doesn't need correcting through irreversible medical treatments. Ideologically driven activists have intimidated the medical profession into silence and compliance with the affirmation model. Rather than making a stand for our children who are in distress during adolescence and need holistic or whole of person care. When puberty blockers are administered, we know that a child firstly cannot develop fertility as the latter stages of puberty do that and secondly will not have full sexual function. Essentially, this child's body becomes frozen in the early stages of puberty, with testosterone or estrogen treatment adulterating the child and committing children to a lifetime of hormones and drugs. It's unknown what, pu what effect puberty blockers have on brain development, and only now is the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne conducting research in this area. Too bad for all those children who have already passed through, through and those currently receiving treatment. Endocrinologists traditionally treated diseases. Yet in gender clinics, they take perfectly healthy children with no diseases, inject them with puberty blockers to suppress normal hormone levels to treat not an endocrine disease, but the mental distress the child is experiencing. How has this gone unchecked for so long? Why are these medical professionals not subject to disciplinary action for deliberately harming our children? What are our governments doing while this is going on? Endocrinologists know the importance of puberty to the development, the full development of a healthy human being. Today, gender clinics give medical professionals a license to offer up puberty as an option for children. The transgender lens has compromised the full care of our children. Gender clinics in Australia need to close and follow the lead of the Tavistock Clinic of anchoring the whole of person care back to localised clinics within the mental health system. Our children are making decisions that they can't possibly understand decisions with lifelong consequences. They are being sterilised and denied full sexual function and their brain development is likely compromised. They are being made sick when they are not physically sick. They are being denied the therapeutic support they need to help them with their distress. Instead of asking why has there been an explosion of girls presenting with gender dysphoria in Western countries, the medical profession has bowed down to the trans activists and grabbed the opportunity to create profits and research outcomes at the expense of our children. Inhuman. Adults gender clinics in Australia's gender clinics must not be allowed to hide behind the statement of operating to the highest standards of care. There is no care when the medical profession does not fully deal with the mental health issues that children are experiencing. There is no care when the medical professional takes physically, physically healthy children and sends them on a pathway of drugs, infertility and arrested physical, sexual and neurological development for the rest of their lives. There is no care when, health, when state government legislation denies parents their rightful place in support of their children in distress. Our children are not fodder for experimentation and advancing research outcomes for the medical profession. Our children are not profit centres for pharmaceutical companies. We are one community, we are one nation, and this child abuse must stop now. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Cicciani. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, good to see you in the chair. Um, last month, I had the immense honour of attending um, and being able to participate in the Australian Defence Force parliamentary program, which I know is probably pretty much something that you've uh, experienced yourself in a previous role here in this place. I was fortunate enough to travel to Hawaii uh, along with the member for Cowper, Pat Conahan, for uh, the exercise Rim of the Pacific. Now, RIMPAC, as it's commonly known, is the world's largest international maritime ex exercise, and this year featured personnel and vessels from no less than 26 nations. Together, participants contributed some 38 sur surface vessels, four submarines, and more than 140 aircraft. Many 
of these been drawn from the defence forces of some of our most important allies in our region, including the United States, Japan and India. Now, Australia's contribution to RIMPAC this year was substantial, featuring the flagship of the Royal Australian Navy, the HMAS Canberra. Uh, we had the repl replenishment oiler, HMAS Supply, and the Anzac-class frigate, HMAS Warramunga. Along uh, with these naval vessels was also two of our P-8As, the Persident Aircraft of the Royal Australian Air Force and a joint landing force led by the 2nd Battalion Royal Australian Regiment and accompanied by personnel and capabilities from right across a variety of Australian Army units. Those of my uh, colleagues who have been fortunate enough to participate um, in the Australian Defence Force parliamentary program will know full well just how valuable this program is. First established back in 2001, it allows parliamentarians the opportunity to experience firsthand the dedication that our men and women of, of the Australian Defence Force have to keep making our country safe, you know, putting on that uniform not just doing them and their family proud, but our nation proud. In my time in this place, I've been very fortunate to interact with these fine men and women on a number of occasions. And I've been struck by the patriotism that they share and the generosity with which they have towards us. On this occasion, of course, it was no different. And we were warmly welcomed at Joint Base Pearl Harbor, Hickman, Hawaii, by two fine individuals. Commander Dean Uren and Flying Officer Rushdie Day. And I can't thank them enough for what they did and looked after myself and Mr Conaghan for the last eight days while we were in Hawaii. As equally warm was our welcome from the Australian Consul General in Honolulu, Andrea Gleeson. As Australia's foremost diplomat representative in Hawaii, Ms Gleeson was keen to share her thoughts on how we can improve our presence in the region and deepen our strong relationship with the United States. There can be no doubting that Australian consulate staff perform essential work providing assistance to Australians abroad and promoting our country to the international community. It's not often that we get to meet and thank them in person, and I am grateful to have had this opportunity to do so. There can be no doubting that Australian consulate staff perform essential work providing Aussies when they are overseas just that important assistance when they do sometimes fall foul or just need some advice from their government. The part of my journey that really exposed me to the everyday work of our ADF personnel, however, was the three nights that I spent with Pat on board the HMAS Canberra. Witnessing firsthand the operation of this impressive vessel, I gained an even stronger appreciation for the professionalism, selflessness and courage of our service personnel. I met so many highly skilled professional Aussie characters on board, and I wish to put on the record here in the Senate my appreciation for them, taking the time to so patiently explain the various routines of the Canberra to us on board. To show our gratitude, we had the pleasure of cooking a meal for the crew, and I'm reliably advised that it went down a treat. We helped to separate the waste, <laughs> quite literally getting our hands dirty. We did all the things that our men and women in uniform do every single day, often with little fanfare or acknowledgement. Overall, I had a wonderful experience on board the HMAS Canberra, and I want to thank everyone who welcomed me and assisted me over those three days on board Canberra. Uh, thank you, Senator, and I'm glad to hear it went so well. Senator Askew. Thank you. I want to take the opportunity tonight to highlight an iconic Tasmanian tourist destination, the Bridistow Lavender Estate at Nabola in Tasmania's northeast. Bridistow is celebrating its 100th year in 2022, and I dropped in earlier this year to see the stunning purple fields during their peak flowering season. Bridistow shot to worldwide fame in 2013-14, when numerous Chinese models and actors took to, the social took to social media with photos of the farm's mascot, Bobby the Bear and Chinese President Xi Jinping was gifted one of his, on his first visit to Tasmania in 2014. Bridistow Lavender's and estate's owner, Robert Ravens, told me the farm's iconic rows of lavender had formed the backdrop of thousands of selfies for social media, 
with visitors often holding one of the business's famous purple lavender ice creams in their photo foreground. Mr Ravens purchased the farm in 2007, not knowing anything about lavender or how to grow and harvest the crop. He is a well-known and highly regarded member of the Northern Tasmanian community. As well as running the farm, Mr Ravens is a member of the Reserve Bank of Australia's Small Business Finance Advisory Panel and was the 2022 Waratah Wynyards Council's Australia Day Ambassador. The farm itself has also won numerous awards, including the inaugural Australia-China Business Council Award for Entrepreneurship and Influence in China. The 2016 Telstra Tasmanian Business of the Year and has been voted as one of eight must-visit destinations in Australia by travel website Webjet. Ridistow Lavender Estate is the world's largest privately owned lavender farm. The French lavender, harvested from the more than 650,000 plants at the farm, is used to create perfume, premium oil, cosmetics, teas, soaps and, of course, Bobby the Bear. I have purchased many such products as gifts and mementos over the years myself, as did my late mother. The Bridistow Lavender Estate is a very well-established agritourism venture that draws tourists from across Tasmania, Australia and the globe. However, the 260-acre farm at Nabola was not its original location. Bridistow's Lavender Farm was established in 1922 at North Lilydale, almost a 30-minute drive away from its current site. Keith Denny, who had previously worked as an accountant for London perfumery Cleavers, dreamed of producing the world's finest lavender. His research showed Tasmania's climate and conditions were similar to those of province, but the island state was free of contamination, which was an issue at the, at, in France at the time due to World War I. North Lilydale was deemed the best location and Mr Denny planted seed source from the French Alps, naming the farm Bridistow after the church where his father was rector for 39 years. By 1924, Bridistow was producing enough flowers to distill oil and a sample was sent to London for analysis. The Tasmanian produced sample was considered of at least equal quality to French oil and in addition it was low in camphor, the ingredient that can make some lavender scents unpleasant, showing Mr Denny was onto a good thing. This quest for the finest lavender continues today, 100 years later, with flowers harvested at the optimum time in January for peak quality and oil production. I was able to watch the oil distillation process during my visit, seeing how Bridistow's pure lavender oil is collected in the distillery. The Denny family designed the revolutionary curved rose to capture rainfall in a controlled spillway, which trapped water for reuse and reduces erosion. This is just one of the efficiencies employed at the farm. Today, Bridistow's other sustainable practices include native plantings in areas not farmed to increase biodiversity and control pests, hand weeding with little reliance on herbicides, plant prunings, cardboard and paper composted and return to enrich the soil, regular resting of production areas and rotational cropping to improve soil quality, solar panels, energy efficient lighting and skylights to reduce energy use and on-site flower drying using the sun. Fortunately, the innovative working farm I have just described can be experienced by anyone. I walked between the rows of lavender like many of the tourists who visited on the same day I did. I also enjoyed a cup of lavender grey tea at Bridistow's Cafe and listened to the pleasant hum of families and friends enjoying their holidays and planning what they would do next. I topped up my stores of culinary lavender and tea while watching visitors pose for photos with a huge bobby bear in the gift shop. Bridistow Lavender Estate really is a wonderful example of Tasmania's agricultural tourism on show. Its purple fields are a huge drawcard for the state's northern region and the Ravens family's commitment to innovation continues the legacy the Denny's began a century ago. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Many people will have known a teacher who lit a spark of passion in them or rekindled a flickering flame to its full burning potential. For me, it was Dr. Ronnie Harding. She played an instrumental role in feeding my hunger to learn more about nature and in nourishing my ability to protect it. We often had discussions about the climate crisis and how big, bold changes were needed to tackle it. Ronnie passed away peacefully on Saturday, the 18th of June. She will be missed sorely by so many friends, loved ones, colleagues, and students. Ronnie touched the lives and the hearts of whoever she met, and I include my husband, my children, and my mother in that list. She had the incredible ability to be genuinely interested in others. 
People like Ronnie don't come around often, perhaps even just once in your lifetime. Dr. Ronnie Harding was a teacher extraordinaire, my lecturer, my colleague, my mentor, and my dearest friend. We wrote a book together with another colleague exploring the complexities and contestations of environmental decision making. At a difficult period in my life, she reached out and convinced me to play table tennis with her every week. She went about her brilliant teaching and research and environmentalism and caring for people in an unassuming, matter-of-fact way, never making a big deal of the positive, life-changing impact she was having on so many. Above all, Ronnie was an incredible environmentalist, a pioneer in environmental education. Ronnie was the founding member of the Institute of Environmental Studies at UNSW, where I got my dream job teaching the Outstanding Master of Environmental Management program, which she started. It was a world first interdisciplinary program on the environment and sustainability. Right before I delivered my first lecture, I remember my heart was beating fast and my hands were sweaty with apprehension. I wanted to be a good teacher, but I was really nervous about not knowing answers to questions students might ask me or not meeting their expectations. Ronnie came to my office to wish me luck. Seeing my anxiety, she stopped to have a chat and gave me some advice that I have carried with me ever since. Advice on being true to myself, on being honest and not pretending to know everything, on not being afraid to be challenged, and above all, on valuing the knowledge others have. They just want to have a yarn, Marine, she said. When I was feeling a similar nervousness on my first day in New South Wales Parliament, I remembered Ronnie's wisdom on being true to myself, and I do that every single day. Ronnie's talents and interests were never ending. She had an arts degree from the University of Sydney and a science degree, first class honors and PhD in marsupial reproductive biology from UNSW. She was an intellectual and very skilled in the sporting field. She excelled in hurdling and long jump as well as tennis and golf. During her student days, she restored and repaired chairs. Later, she refurbished an old fisherman's cottage. Ronnie's love for travel was well known, and I would never tire of hearing about her adventures around the world, in India, Singapore, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, in South America and Europe, to name a few. She found the time and the energy to dedicate to so many other roles, including Assistant Commissioner for the New South Wales Natural Resources Commission, a trustee of the Australian Museum, a board member of the Environmental Defenders Office, a member of the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists, a member of the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Advisory Council, and so many more. I feel so honored to have known Ronnie for a few decades. I know that hundreds of her master's students and colleagues feel the same. And here are some of their words. What a legend she was. She was my mentor and my inspiration. She opened my eyes to the fact engineering is not just a bunch of formulas to stop bridges falling over. What a giant in her field. She also made me laugh so often with her fierce honesty about how she saw the world. There is absolutely no doubt that the work Ronnie did in her lifetime is going to live on in her many and dear students, colleagues and friends. And I will be one of those honoring her memory in my life and my work. Vale, Ronnie Ronald Harding. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And uh, I rise to make a contribution um, about an event that occurred in Sydney on Easter Sunday earlier this year, where I was privileged to lead to join the leadership of the Irish National Association at Waverley Cemetery to give the 2022 Michael Dwyer Oration, which is essentially uh, about the contribution of Irish Australians to this great nation and the colourful history that binds our two nations together. My oration traverse the tableau of the Irish struggle for justice and independence. Uh, and the memorial itself is a reminder of the 1798 Wexford uprising. Um, a man by the name of Michael Dwyer, along with a number of other political prisoners, ended up in Australia. Uh, and upon his death, he was buried not far from Central Station. But a hundred years later, uh, a large number of uh, his 
uh, Irish descendants and the Irish community in Sydney decided that they would reinter his remains at Waverley. And the 1798 memorial at Waverley, which is a remarkable uh, marble edifice to the efforts of those uh, rebels, as they were called at the time, patriots, uh, retrospectively by those who seek a united Ireland, um, actually gathered 100,000 people along the streets from Central uh, Station in Sydney all the way out to Waverley, where he was reinterred. Um, 10,000 people walked from St Mary's Cathedral uh, as a testament of hope and power to what one brave person in search of democracy in a particular context and time can engender. So um, it was an amazing experience and a true honour as the, the now Australian but daughter of Irish immigrants to be at that Easter celebration. No surprising it happens at Easter, which is a time of significant um, memorials uh, in Ireland about the uh, Easter uprising of 1916. But this year, uh, 2022, is actually 100 years since the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And I was particularly delighted to discuss the proud history of female members of the Irish Dáil. Um, they contributed to the debate regarding the 1922 treaty, and uh, the, each of them, uh, all of the women who were in that first door, re re rejected the treaty uh, because they thought it would plunge Ireland into further turmoil. And it is very interesting to look 100 years uh, down the track uh, that we see in the papers in Ireland at the moment a lot of discussion about what a united Ireland for this century might look like. So the struggle continues. Um, in 1922, Constance Markovitz was the first female member of the UK House of Commons um, elected from prison, and she became the first female cabinet member in Europe. Uh, Ada English, a doctor from the Royal University of Ireland, spoke out against the oath and the treaty and the very notion of being British subjects. Kathleen Clark, her husband recently martyred by British troops, opposed the treaty, saying, and I quote, there is not power enough to force me nor eloquence enough to influence me and the whole British Empire into taking that oath, though I am only a frail scrap of humanity. Margaret Pearce, likewise, spoke of her two recently killed sons, particularly Porrick Pearce, one of the most prominent martyrs of the Easter uprising. These women proudly stood up for their beliefs and for their country, um, and I was privileged to tell a little of their lives to the wonderful attendees on, on that day. Can I acknowledge the leadership in bringing about this memorialising of um, the struggle for democracy, for people who are Irish and interested in the history of Ireland. And I particularly want to thank the INA and the leadership offered there that makes this an annual event around which people gather. Um, I'd also uh, like to remind everybody that uh, the Australian-Irish connection has been very significant in politics. Ben Chifley, the train driver turned treasurer who helped shape the post-war order. Scullin, Joe Carhill uh, and uh, Jack Renshaw were other Irish Australians who are extremely prominent figures in New South Wales and nationally in politics. And now, of course, we have Anthony Albanese uh, of an Irish Australian mother building his own profound legacy as we speak. I, uh, I thank the Senate for the opportunity to put this important occasion on the record. Uh, to share histories of other countries is very instructive for us as citizens of this great country as we make our way forward to develop a stronger, more robust and more reflective democracy. Struggle is part of the journey and we honour the struggle of those who have gone before us in the pursuit of democracy. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. It was a great privilege to attend the 8th World Parliamentarians Convention on Tibet in Washington, D.C. in June. I was a guest of the Tibetan Information Office, who worked with the Office of Tibet in the U.S. and the Central Tibetan Administration to organise the conference. As I was thinking about what to say in this speech tonight um, about the convention and the current dire situation in Tibet, I decided the best thing to do was to share with the Senate most of the declaration from the convention. So here goes. Parliamentarians from 23 countries participated to discuss the situation in Tibet and efforts to resolve the Sino-Tibetan conflict caused by the People's Republic of China's invasion of Tibet in 1950 and its illegal occupation since then. Parliamentarians attended, thanked their hosts in the US Congress and commended them for the path-breaking legislation adopted in recent years in Tibet. 
The meeting took place as the war in the Ukraine, caused by Russia's invasion of that independent country on 24th on, in February, was underway and triggered striking comparisons to, to Tibet's invasion decades earlier. These invasions highlight the urgent need to enforce international law and to prioritise safeguarding the rule of law and the promotion of freedom, democracy, self determination and human rights throughout the world. The participants committed to take action to ensure collaboration among parliaments and with the Tibetan parliament in exile on matters related to Tibet, including collaboration with the Interparliamentary Alliance on China and with other parliamentary, interparliamentary organisations and bodies. And the international network of parliamentarians on Tibet will be revived. And the participants call on parliaments to adopt legislation, resolutions or motions, hold hearings and investigations to advance the Tibetan cause in line with this declaration. The participants call on all parliaments to take coordinated action and to hold their, account, their governments accountable for upholding international law in regard to Tibet, including by fulfilling their state's obligations and responsibilities under international law, to respect and promote the inalienable right of the Tibetan people to self-determination, to refrain from expressly or implicitly recognising the PRC's claim to sovereignty over Tibet, to treat Tibet as an occupied country and not as part of China, and to take coordinated action to achieve a resolution to the Sino-Tibetan conflict through dialogue and negotiation between the parties without preconditions. The participants call on parliaments to take coordinated action to affirm and endorse the exclusive right of the Dalai Lama and the Garden Fodrang, the Tibetan people and the Tibetan Buddhist community to select and appoint the incarnation of the next Dalai Lama and other senior lamas. The participants reject the false historical narratives propagated by the CRC and the CCP, which claim that Tibet has been part of China since ancient times, to attempt to justify the PRC's invasion of Tibet and the current occupation. They call on parliamentarians and parliaments to take coordinated action to expose and counter these false narratives. And the participants call on parliaments to take coordinated action to prohibit co op corporations from benefiting from forced labour and the exploitation of the natural environment of the Tibetan Plateau. The convention noted the massive environmental degradation occurring on the Tibetan Plateau and that further more than two million Tibetan nomads have been removed from their traditional lands to allow for this exploitation and resettled in culturally destructive villages. The impacts of environmental mismanagement in Tibet extend far beyond Tibet itself with over 50 mega dams planned on the 10 major rivers that rise on the plateau, threatening the water supplies of over 1.5 billion people in countries downstream. And Tibet's situation as the world's third pole results in global heating occurring at rates more than twice the world average, which will result in the majority of the glaciers on, on the plateau gone by 2050 with global repercussions. The participants express express solidarity with the Uyghurs and Southern Mongolians under PRC rule, the people of Hong Kong and the people of Taiwan, as well as the Chinese democracy movement, all of whom seek common ground to face common challenges. And the participants express their continuing support for the democratic achievements of the Tibetans, their commitment to nonviolence and their efforts to seek a resolution of the conflict with the PRC through the middle way approach. So I have come back to this from the convention into this place, fired up about the role that Australia and this Senate can play to achieve justice for the people of Tibet. And I encourage my fellow senators to meet with Tibetans when they visit parliament in September and to join our parliamentary friendship group, the Australian All-Party Parliamentary Group for Tibet, to work with us together across party lines for peace and justice in Tibet. Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Senator Still, John. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the denuclearisation imperative has rarely been more urgent than it is right now, and it is incumbent upon the government to make all possible efforts towards its achievements. Now, one of the best instruments we have against the ever-present threat uh, of nuclear weapons is the United Nations Treaty uh, for the Prohibition of nuclear weapons. The former coalition government uh, resisted signing uh, on to the TPNW for years. Uh, but while in opposition, Anthony Albanese committed Labour uh, to signing the treaty. Indeed, in 2018, uh, the Labour Party even adopted a resolution uh, that commits to signing and ratifying the TPNW in government. This is what the opposition leader at the time uh, then said. 
nuclear weapons are the most destructive, inhumane and indiscriminate weapons ever created. Today we have the opportunity to take a step towards their elimination. Labor in government will sign and ratify the UN Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I'd like to repeat that for the record. Uh, the quote was, Labor will sign and ratify the treaty. Former Foreign Minister Gareth Evans also said that nuclear disarmament is core business of any Labour Party worth its name. Yet since taking office in May, the Prime Minister's uh, historic opportunity uh, to follow through on this uh, particular moment in time seems to have gone nowhere. Save for a flimsy statement in June that Australia uh, shares the ambition of the TPNW um, and that state parties of the world should work together uh, for a world without nuclear weapons, the new government has been troublingly quiet. Uh, now, to their credit, uh, the statement was made, as the government said an observer, uh, to the first meeting of the state parties of the TPNW. But this is infuriatingly an empty gesture in the broader context of the Albanese government's unwavering support uh, for AUKUS. Now, the AUKUS pact is provocative and poses a grave risk to global nuclear non-proliferation. Questions are now even being raised about whether it violates the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, to which Australia is a party. Just this week, Indonesia voiced their concerns uh, that it may undermine the Non-Proliferation Treaty itself. That doesn't appear to concern the PM, who has repeatedly affirmed that Labour's strong uh, backing of AUKUS will continue, as well as an appetite for expanding the US alliance. That is completely antithetical to the principle of denuclearisation. Uh, the TMPW and AUKUS are fundamentally incompatible. You either support nuclearisation or you don't, and so I am forced to ask the question of the Prime Minister, which is it? The only workable answer here is to decisively denounce nuclear weapons by signing the very treaty that you yourself have vocally and repeatedly committed to supporting. That is our duty as responsible global citizens. Australia must play a constructive role towards global disarmament and we must not delay any longer. Almost 80 per cent of Australians back signing the treaty. The Labour Party's membership back signing the treaty. The Greens have absolutely and unwaveringly uh, backed the treaty from the beginning. I am calling on the Albanese government to act on the will of the community and the mandate of its own party and sign the treaty as a matter of urgency. We have the overwhelming support of the Australian community. We have the numbers in Parliament and we know that it is the right thing to do. Let's get it done. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Thorpe. Deputy President. Today I would like to talk about concussions in sport. They are much more common than we realise, and it is an issue that needs to be taken more seriously. This is also an issue that affects all levels of sport, not just elite sport. It affects community sports, and it also seriously affects our children. Concussions are not just a knock on the head. They are actually brain injuries. We need to provide better education and change our language and culture towards this issue. And we need change to ensure that our athletes do not have long-term cognitive impairment due to concussions, so that they and their families don't suffer from the consequences of playing or competing in a sport they love. A new international research paper just published by concussion experts, including from Australia, has shown we have links bet between repetitive head trauma, such as caused by concussion, and risks of brain damage and neurodegenerative disease. That includes diseases such as dementia, 
motor neurone disease and Parkinson's. Concussions can cause fatigue, mood disorders, depression and, in, and anxiety. None of us wants our loved ones to experience this. We cannot allow our major sports to drive the narrative that they have sorted this issue. Nor can we believe them when they say they take athletes' health and welfare as their highest priority. We see too many examples where athletes are expected to return to competition as quickly as possible or when athletes are concussed multiple times in a season, yet are cleared to return. What pains me most is the way that concussions can impact the health of our children. The earlier concussions are experienced and the more often throughout one's life, the stronger the impact. Already at a young age, we have evidence that one third of our children suffer depression after a concussion. In England, there is no tackling in rugby for under nine-year-olds or heading of the soccer ball for under 12s. In New Zealand, there is no tackling for under nine-year-olds. In Canada, under 11s. There is no reason that we cannot set our age to protect our children. They can still learn to play. They can still enjoy the sport, maybe even more so. We must also have independent research, not sport-funded research, where scientists and medical doctors are expected to provide sport-friendly findings. We must have a Senate inquiry to ascertain the scope of where we are at with where we are at with the science and why athletes at all levels and ages are being allowed to return to play too soon after their brain injury. We should not be afraid to address this issue. I love sports. I have grown up with sports, and to be honest, sports saved me. I don't know where I would be without growing up with the, the sports fanatic family and community that I am a part of still today. And I don't know where I would be without it. I know the importance of sports for all of our communities, particularly regional and remote communities. That is all the more reason to make sure that we can do what we can all do with the sports we love safely, so we can do them for longer, and so that we can do what we love in life longer and not be affected by injuries and their long-term consequences on us and our families. Today I want to bring awareness to this issue. Let's start a debate about concussion in sport and let's include everyone. Thank you very much, Senator Thorpe. Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, today, of course, is the 2nd of August, and it's been almost a, uh, well over a year that we've had the vaccine rollout continue. And every day I still hear from people who suffer from injuries from the vaccine or suffer through mandates or some form of discrimination. Uh, we've just recently passed about uh, through 10,000 cases of COVID in the last six months. Now, I don't know if that's not evidence to say that the vaccines aren't effective then I don't know what is. However, I'm not here tonight to talk about the ineffectiveness of the vaccine, which didn't stop transmission. I'm here to talk about how unsafe the vaccines are. And I want to explain why, and I want to go through the biochemistry. Most vaccines, so for example, the COVID, uh, uh, COVID virus has 29 proteins in it. Normally, if you de-attenuated a vaccine, you gave someone a de-attenuated vaccine, you would take out the ionised molecule uh, of that virus. So you've got 20, 29 uh, molecules, you'll take out one. Uh, and what that does, and the one you'll take out is the ionised molecule. So an ion either has more electrons than protons or likewise more protons than electrons. Either way, it's a charge. And that's what they call the active ingredient in a vaccine. It's the thing, if you've got two magnets, one with the North Pole and one with the South Pole, goes past each other, it wants to attach. 
And that's why a vaccine normally is de-attenuated, because they take out that ionised molecule so it doesn't go around jumping on everything. But what that does is it allows the uh, antibody to attach to the antigen. End of story. Now, the other thing is, because that molecule is still quite large, it's 28 um, molecules remaining in a normal uh, de-attenuated vaccine, it is too big to cross the endothelium. Right? Now, what is the endothelium? It is the small capillary between your muscle tissues and your bloodstream. And in order to cross that uh, uh, capillary, you've got to be small enough in a process called uh, endocytosis in order to cross into the bloodstream. Right? Now, what this particular vaccine does is that delivers a lipid nanoparticle. It is a very tiny particle, much smaller by a factor of a thousand than a normal virus. And what that means is it can travel from the tissue through the endothelium into your bloodstream. Now, we know that that's the way this particular vaccine works because in the TGA non-clinical evaluation report, if you go to table 4.2, you will see where they have done the distribution of the lipid nanoparticles on, on the lab rats, literally the lab rats, uh, when they injected this particular vaccine. And I'll just read out some of the some of the body organs that it went through and the concentration increases. I just want to focus for a start on the ovaries. After the first 25 minutes, it was at 0.1. By the, uh, uh, so the concentration levels was uh, milligrams to each gram. So by the end of the first uh, 25 minutes, it was 0.1. By the end of the first day, it was 0.5.25, uh, and then by the end of the second day, it was 12.26. Now that has doubled after two days, and that's, that's not the only organ. Uh, it went into the liver. Uh, it goes into the heart, the eyes, the brain, the bone marrow, the bladder, the adrenal glands. There's just about half of the vaccine and the lipid nanoparticles go into organs other than the injection site. Now, this is despite the fact that we were told that a normal vaccine goes into your deltoid muscle and that's where it stays. Well, that's not the case with this particular vaccine. And what's particularly scary about this is they knew this in the animal trials. And despite the fact that the concentration was still increasing after 48 hours, you know what they did? They stopped the trial. They stopped the trial. Now, don't you think you would run the trial right through to the point of where the lipid nanoparticles had left the body? But they didn't do that. And not only that, that's just the start of it. Because once you start gets inside the cell and start uh, creating the spike protein, that can last for days longer as well. But here's the thing. In the animal trials, they never delivered the spike protein mRNA inside the lipid. They delivered a benign enzyme by the name of luciferase, which is the stuff you see in fly flies, uh, and that lights up so that they could trace it. But as the TGA non-clinical report says, they never tested the distribution and degradation of the spike protein in any humans or animals in this particular, uh, for this particular vaccine before they rolled it out. Now, normally when you get the virus, okay, it comes in through your mucosal system, uh, and, is get, and then if your immunoglobin A in your mucosal system doesn't actually kill the virus, it'll eventually get into your systemic blood system. Your mucosal system is driven by immunoglobin A. Uh, your stem, systemic blood system is driven by immunoglobin G. Now, once it gets in there, once the virus gets in, in order to get inside the cell, it needs to rely on the antigen, what they call the ACE receptor, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme, and also the transmembrane serine protease, which is another enzyme. And that has to carry the virus across your cell membrane because your membrane is there to protect the organelles inside the cell, i.e., your nucleus, your ribosome, and your mitochondria, in particular, from the external forces. What this particular vaccine does, it's it uh, the, the lipid is catatonic. So that means it uses transfection and like you're cooking sausages uh, on, on the barbecue and you see blobs of fat merged together, that's exactly what happens with transfection. There is no uh, uh, barrier to this particular vaccine with the lipid going into any cell. So not only does it stop inside the, uh, at the deltoid, it goes all throughout your body and it can go into any cell because of the way they've designed this lipid protein lipid nanoparticles, sorry. Now, once it's actually inside the actual cell, okay, normally 
Now, this is this is a first, right? So normally, you know, you get a vaccine, you get the antigen, doesn't go anywhere near your cell. Once it goes into your cell, it then goes into the part of your cell called the ribosomes, which is which translates the mRNA. Now, that ribosome will produce a protein. Now, normally, the the spike protein in the on the virus is not the same as the spike protein in the vaccine. No, no. What they've done is they've replaced the nucleotide uracil and they've put in a new uh, nucleotide called methyl pseudouridine. Now that was shown in studies in 2005 to actually evade the in immune system and have greater self-amplifying properties. In other words, it creates more proteins. Uh, but not only did they modify the mRNA that way, they also added another 70 adene nucleotides at the end of the mRNA strand. Right, so normally there's about 30 adene nucleotides at the end of the mRNA strand. Well, they've added another 70. So what does that mean? That the spike protein lasts a lot longer inside your cell, creating a toxic substance or a toxic molecule that you know, is ionised uh, in an unregulated manner. And by an unregulated manner, what I mean by that is it relies on your immune system to kick in and come in and destroy your cells. Now, a normal vaccine doesn't do any of that. It stays inside your deltoid muscle, doesn't go anywhere because it's too big to travel. So what we've got now is a vaccine that has delivered a protein in an unregulated manner. That, so that, that's similar to a pathway of cancer, where basically you get the unregulated reproduction of toxic molecules, and then it relies on your own body's immune system to attack your cells. Right? So we're requiring, you know, where you've got some, where you've got your own body attacking your own cells. You're now creating a pathway similar to acquired uh, immune deficiency syndrome, which, you know, if it goes wrong, you do not want your own body attacking your own cells. Okay. So your next step after that is effectively a concentration. So when it comes through your mucosal system, if you've got a strong, healthy immune system, the immunoglobin A in that immune system should stop it from getting into your bloodstream. When it's injected directly into your bloodstream, all you're getting is an IgG response. You are not getting an IgA response. So when they said early on that it was going to stop transmission, that was a blatant lie. And why was it? Because anyone that understands anything about immunology knows that you needed an immunoglobin A response to kill the actual virus in your mucosal system. Because if you don't kill it in your mucosal system, you can still transmit it, right? So now the, the paper did show that you got an immunoglobin G response, and that lasted for up to 35 days in rats, uh, sorry, in monkeys. But those monkeys only weighed 10 kilograms, and they gave three times the dose of what they did to humans. So it was a, a, a greater dose of about 20 times. So you could argue that you know, 35 divided by 20 days, maybe the immunoglobin G response might have start, lasted for two days. But the other point is, is that by doing it this way, and what, what the pathways they are using was that they never tested this before they put it into humans. They never tested for genotoxicity studies, despite the fact that this was the first time they ever put genes inside a body and a synthesised genes. They never did longitudinal testing. They never did carcinogenic testing, and they never tested it for other drugs. So people who take other drugs, especially immunosuppressants, Thank they you never tested very it for much, that. Senator Rennick. Senator Scar. Thank you. Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm uh, delighted to be able to give this adjournment speech in, uh, in your presence. Uh, perhaps you're uh, somewhat of a, uh, a captive audience or captured audience. I'm not sure which is the, uh, the right adjective, but delighted to be able to give this speech in your presence. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'd like to pay uh, my respects uh, to the team at the Parliamentary Budget Office. I think that they actually do an outstanding job, and at no time is their job more important than at the time of a federal election. And they provide that service in a number of ways. Uh, they provide individual senators with uh, costing support, so when individual senators have a proposal, the Parliamentary Budget Office will assist them in terms of working out what the budgetary consequences of that proposal are. They assist parties in terms of preparing their costings. And more importantly, perhaps most importantly, they provide a service which I think all Australians should take advantage of in terms of determining and judging the impact of different parties' policies in terms of budgetary outcomes. 
And so I was very interested to read the 2022 election commitments report, July 2022, issued by the Parliamentary Budget Office. And there was something very, very stark, something very stark emerged from this report. And I'll go to the key points in the summary. And I quote, the coalition's platform, if fully implemented, would be expected to result in slightly smaller deficits over both the 2022 to 23 budget forward estimates and medium term periods compared to the pre-election economic fiscal outlook. So, so slightly smaller deficits over that period of time. The coalition's election commitments do not materially change receipts from the pre-election economic fiscal outlook. Fair enough, and I'd concur with that, makes sense. In relation to Labor's platform, it was said, Labor's platform, if fully implemented, would result in increased deficits over the same periods relative to the pre-election economic fiscal outlook. And again, that was uh, reflective of the commentary that occurred during the campaign. Then we get the discussion in relation to the Australian Greens. And I think, I think the tens of thousands of Queenslanders in my home state of Queensland who voted for the Greens need to carefully, carefully reflect on the Parliamentary Budget Office uh, election commitments analysis in relation to the Australian Greens. Because bear in mind, in their policy statement, the Greens said, and I quote, the Greens plan is fully costed and fully funded. Full stop. That's what the Greens said in their own policy uh, statement. Fully costed and fully funded. Now, maybe they mean that in a postmodernist sort of way, where matters such as truth, reason, and knowledge are all relative. And maybe it was fully costed and fully funded compared to how exotic and bizarre it might have been in the first instance. But the reality is that the Parliamentary Budget Office report shows that the Greens' uh, policies would have had an absolutely devastating impact in terms of this country's budgetary position. And this is no better summarised than on the table on page three. And again, I commend the PBO for their work in this regard. So in this table, they talk about, firstly, the impact of the, on the underlying cash balance, the net impact of election commitments. The coalition total to 2025 to 2026 is actually an improvement, or would have been an improvement, of $1 billion over that period. The Australian Labor Party, a deteriorating position of $6.9 billion. So coalition plus $1 billion, Australian Labor Party minus $6.9 billion. And then we get to the Australian Greens. Bear in mind they said fully costed and fully funded. If it's fully funded, why is it that the financial implications of their election commitments by 2022 to 23, through the Ford estimates, was minus $26.1 billion? Minus $26.1 billion. The impact on the headline cash balance of the Australian Greens policies was minus $112.1 billion. Minus $112.1 billion. This is the fully costed and fully funded Australian Greens election campaigns across the 2022 to 2023 forward estimates. Just reflect on those figures. Negative impact on the underlying cash balance of the Australian Greens policies of minus 26.1 billion. 26.1 billion. Headline cash balance minus 112.1 billion. Fiscal balance minus $41 billion. Minus $41 billion. Those are the Australian Greens' fully costed, fully funded policies. And then it gets even worse, and this is where things become challenging for the Parliamentary Budget Office, because they would like, no doubt, to be able to produce some graphs using consistent axes, X, Y axes, across the different costings. Uh, costings regimes under each of the parties. But it's impossible. It's impossible because the Australian Greens are so far out there in terms of their supposedly fully costed and fully funded policies. So the XY axis in relation to the coalition, the X axis goes from zero to one billion, 
This is the net impact of, of, of the PBI guidance on the underlying cash balance by party. For the coalition, the x-axis goes from zero to one billion. For the Australian Labor Party, which materially less uh, position than the coalition, goes from zero to nine billion. But for the Australian Greens, the x-axis has to go from 40 billion to minus 40 billion. That's the only way in which they could capture. That's the only way they could capture how bad the Australian Greens policies would have been for the budget of this country. And then when you drill down, when you drill down into the individual policies, and there's lots of good information on the Parliamentary Budget Office website. I've got hundreds of pages here in relation to the costings of the Greens policies, which I intend to go through in depth. I've only had a chance to go through three at the moment. The first was in relation to the so-called corporate super profits tax. And fully funded, apparently, fully costed. The PBO says there is a very high degree of uncertainty associated with this costing. A very high degree of uncertainty associated with this costing. And they also say a key assumption super profits tax paid has been reduced by 20 per cent to account for an estimated behavioural response by companies. Who would have thought it? Who would have thought it that if you actually increase taxes on people, they respond, for example, by taking their capital offshore with the jobs that go with them? So let's then move to the ending corporate tax avoidance policy. And we can see a theme here, Mr Acting Deputy President, in relation to the Greens policies. Under the costing overview, it says there is a significant level of uncertainty associated with each component of this proposal. And the uncertainty in particular components drives significant uncertainty in the overall cost. And then it says uncertainties arise from behavioural responses. Behavioural responses. Who would have thought? Who would have thought when you introduce draconian tax policies and measures that people actually respond? Who would have thought? And then we'll move to the third policy. And this is the this was the this was the granddaddy of all policies. The Greens policy to construct one million homes. One million homes across Australia. I don't know what if it, if it's going to be a million, why not ten million? Why not ten million? And our theme continues. The financial implications of the proposal are uncertain, uncertain again, and highly sensitive to assumptions around the speed of construction, capacity within the construction industry, the cost of land and dwelling construction, the number of households that would access residential tenancies, annual operating costs, and changes in the 10-year government bond rate. And, and again, how's this for a point by the Parliamentary Budget Office? It is uncertain. It is uncertain whether the trust will be able to achieve an average cost per dwelling of $300,000. It's uncertain. I think the PBO—and again, I, I want to commend them on their diplomatic language—they say it's uncertain. That's a nice way of saying that it's in fantasy land, absolute fantasy land. So there's a common theme there. I commend the Parliamentary Budget Office in relation to the great work and the great information which uh, they provide to Australian voters in election context and suggest that more of our Australian voters need to take Thank advantage you, of that Senator service. Scar. That was very illuminating, but your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Should eligibility for women's sporting events be based on biological sex? Over the last few years, an extraordinary amount of effort has been put into stopping anyone from even asking this question let alone answering it in the affirmative. Women have been threatened, abused, pilloried and ostracised for pointing out that the purpose of women's sport is to provide fair competition for the female sex. Many lies have been told about female athletes being more than happy to compete against males. Commentators, journalists and politicians alike have claimed that nobody cares about the issue of protecting single-sex women's sport or those that do care are simply bigots, or that the issue isn't important enough to warrant discussion, or worst of all, that even talking about women's sex-based rights is a form of violence and a form of hate speech. Yet when FINA, the international governing body for swimmers, 
asked their elite athletes whether eligibility for women's events should be based solely on biological sex, 83.8 per cent of them said yes. More than eight in ten elite swimmers agree that women's events must be for females. But how can this possibly be when we've heard the media and activists and politicians repeatedly tell us that female athletes don't care if they're competing against males? This is a lie that many have got away with only by refusing to ask female athletes for their views and by bullying, belittling and disparaging women who did speak up and acknowledge that single-sex sport is essential to allow women and girls to participate and compete fairly. Over the last three years, I have been contacted by women in sport at every level, from Olympic medalists to women playing at their local club, who have said how important it is to protect the female category, but how impossible it has been to speak out because of the attitude of the governing bodies in their sports. Two years ago, World Rugby released a detailed report based on extensive scientific analysis which found that female players tackled by male players are at a 25 to 30 per cent greater risk of serious head and neck injuries two years ago. Yet Rugby Australia last week has confirmed that it will continue to allow males to play against women in community rugby competitions around Australia. They are saying to women and girls playing for their local club on a weekend that they couldn't care less if you are being exposed to a 30 per cent increase in serious head and neck injuries. As we stand here today, Australia's three major contact football codes all encourage the inclusion of male players in their women's competitions at community level. Not just allow, encourage. While the rest of the world is starting to wake up and is realising that there is nothing inclusive or scientific about telling female athletes that they have to accept males into their sport, Australian politicians and journalists are still desperately trying to uphold a culture of no debate by denigrating anyone who publicly recognises the need for single-sex sport. Unfortunately, that's exactly what we've seen from the new Minister for Sport and her colleagues on the other side of the chamber. The new sports minister has stated that my proposal tabled in the last parliament to ensure that single-sex women's sport is lawful, supported and encouraged should, and in the minister's words, I quote, go right to the back of the shelf to gather dust. How is it acceptable that major world sporting bodies like FINA, like World Rugby, are recognising that single-sex women's sport is essential to fair and safe competition, yet the Australian government is content for our country to have laws that prevent local sporting competitions and clubs from guaranteeing female players won't have to take the field against males. Even our most decorated female Olympians speaking openly about the reality of sport, that fairness in women's sport is not compatible with male inclusion in the female category, hasn't been able to prompt reflection or a change of course from our media and many peak sporting bodies in Australia. Instead, we are now hearing the excuse being made that fairness only matters at the elite level. What an insult to the millions of Australians who play their sport at community and local level. According to this new excuse, fairness is a privilege only to be granted to the elite one per cent. Yet fairness is no less important at sub-elite levels of sport. Mm -hmm. A race can be won by a split second, whether it's at the Olympics or at a local swimming club. A local football grand final is just as likely to be decided by one point as the AFL grand final. A woman playing rugby at her local club is just as likely to have her neck broken or her brain injured as a professional player. It's the pinnacle of elitism to claim, as some have, that local sport is just about fun and fitness. All of us in this parliament would know many women and men, boys and girls, who put their heart and soul into winning games for their local club. They train two to three nights a week after work. They slog it out in the off-season, getting as fit as they can to help their team get over the line, and when they step onto the field, they are trying as hard as they can to compete and to win. For their governing bodies and their governments to say to those women and girls that they are not entitled to the same level of fairness as elite athletes is simply wrong. And if you remove that fairness from any level of competitive sport, 
the result will undoubtedly be that many women and girls stop playing. Policies like the one FINA has adopted, supported in overwhelming numbers by its athletes, help ensure that the reality of sex differences in sport is acknowledged and respected by maintaining a single-sex female category. But Australian sports aren't free to adopt policies like FINA. Australia's anti-discrimination laws would prevent a policy like FINA's from being adopted here. The Minister for Sport and the Prime Minister have made clear they are perfectly happy for Australian sports clubs and volunteers to continue to face legal action if they offer single-sex sport for women. And they are perfectly happy to dismiss concerns as a so-called right-wing issue, proving that they are really not listening to female sporting champions from all around Australia and the world. Nor are they listening to the sportswomen around this country and the parents of girls playing sport who just want their sports and their daughters' sports to be fair and safe. Australia is at risk of being left behind while sensible people and organisations all around the world are waking up. Australian governments spend tens of millions of dollars on sport every year, often on the basis of providing opportunities to women and girls in sport. And yet many commentators are desperate to prevent debate to say that politicians and say that politicians should stay out of this issue. That's absolute rubbish. That is exactly how you end up with lobby groups and Twitter activists setting the rules, establishing the culture and telling women that they're bigots for wanting single-sex sport and spaces. If sport is important enough for the government to spend hundreds of millions, hundreds of, millions of dollars on it, then it's important enough for elected representatives to speak up, as often as we must, to ensure that Australian women and girls aren't being thrown under the bus for the sake of a misogynistic and misguided ideology. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator McGrath. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Tonight I wish to expose the hypocrisy of a prominent authority on disinformation and the architect of the Teal's digital campaign. In October 2021, an astroturfing campaign named We Love Our Hostables, we love our hospitals w -L -O -H, surfaced on social media. It had a website and a Facebook and Instagram presence. The website mostly featured generic stock photos of hospital scenes, but one image featured what appears to be surgeons and scrubs holding up a sign that had been amicably photoshopped to include the WLOH logo. Cam Wilson, Crikey's associate editor, was the first to twig to this mysterious astroturfing campaign. In an article, who's spending $10,000 on anti-Morrison Facebook ads? We don't know, and that's a problem. Find it, read it. According to Crikey, the About section of WLOH's Facebook page claimed it's for showing appreciation, I quote, for our hospitals and the wonderful people who work in them. But the page's posts focused on attacking the federal coalition government for a lack of hospital funding. It is important to appreciate that in October 2021, after 10 months hovering under 100, um, under 100 COVID hospitalisations had risen to a new peak of around 1,500, with 300 people in intensive care. After the Crikey article, the Facebook page was deleted oh. and the website was amended to remove imagery and references. Funny, How, very funny. However, Facebook's ad library still contains three of the WLOH's digital ads on which it spent $12,136, targeted to audiences in Queensland and Tasmania. Now, there are several clues as to the not-so-clever creator's identity. Open source information analyst Elise Thomas noted on Twitter that the metadata of the image of surgeons holding up a sign, amateurly photoshopped, to include the logo shows it was created on the 28th of September by user Ed using the design tool Canva. The image of the logo was also created by Ed on the same day. The logo is still on the weloveourhospitals.org site, accessible via Wayback also contains a reference to Ed in the metadata. Significantly, Facebook's ad library also lists what appears to be a VoIP-forwarded phone number submitted by the advertiser on the 1st of October 2021. That number was 02 
it went dead following Crikey's story. Ed the talking horse. Mm, but guess what, Senator Scar? When this number was called, a recorded voicemail message said, Hi, you've called Ed Copper. Thanks for calling. An audio recording of that voicemail exists, and I'm more than happy to table it should senators wish. So who is this Ed Copper, you may ask? Surely he can't be this Ed Copper who in the last year has become something of a go-to guy for the media on fake news and disinformation. Ah. This Ed Copper is the founder and executive director of the New York-based Centre for Impact Communications, a non-profit research centre de dedicated to establishing best practice for social impact communications. That Ed Copper, who is the author of Facts and Other Lies, Welcome to the Disinformation Age, which has received considerable think tank, TV, radio and print exposure and has been hailed by Kevin Rudd, Wayne Swan, Malcolm Turnbull and, ironically, Bernard Keane from Crikey. An SMH profile noted that Ed Copper has worked with Greta Thunberg on her communications and advocacy campaigns. In Facts and Other Lies, Ed Copper noted that the UN body responsible for addressing dis disinformation has identified astroturfing campaigns as a potentially harmful disinformation practice. A year ago, he would know. He would know. A year ago, Ed Copper warned Sydney Morning Herald readers about the evils of digital astroturfing, whereby an organisation is passed off as grassroots and its true origin or agenda is obscured. Surely that Ed Copper couldn't be the author of a despicable, ugly, astroturfy campaign aimed at blaming the Morrison government over hospital funding at the time of rising COVID admissions. But hang on. In his book, Facts and Other Lies, this Ed Copper described Labor's federal 2016 digital campaign, which falsely claimed the coalition would privatise Medicare. In that breath, in that same breath, he admits to being the one serving them those needy scare ads. Because, guess what, Mr Acting Deputy President, and for those who are listening at home, uh, Mr Copper was also Director of Campaigns at Get Up, oh. an organisation renowned for its dishonest campaigning. And the scratchy voice of Ed Copper, the crusader against disinformation, sounds identical to the voicemail recording of Ed Copper, the We Love Our Hospitals astroturfer. So, Ed Copper, the crusader against disinformation needs to set the record straight. Now, Mr Copper is currently a director and co-owner of, co of Populaires. You might have heard of that them, where he heads the firm's disinformation practice, leading a team of digital brand damage and narrative building experts. Now, in March, Populaires was outed, Mr Acting Deputy President, as a Labor and Get Up staff campaign house responsible for the digital campaigns of the Mr Simon Holmes, the court back teal independence. Oh, I know. Something Copper now brags about to journalists, but which Populaires and Zali Stegel went to great lengths to keep under wraps before the election. Before or after a coal donation? Oh, a, lot, a lot of coal donations went there. It seems fair to say that Populaires was incubated at Olvera Advisors as a, perp a purpose-built campaign vehicle to assist teal candidates. Populaire's web page lists its purported clients, but many organisations like GetUp, for whom Populaire's principals have, wor have worked in former roles. The Smart Energy Council is listed. In the lead-up to the recent election, the Smart Energy Council, which has Simon Holmes Accord as a board member, blatantly flouted charities' laws by campaigning against coalition candidates. So Ed Copper needs to answer some questions. He needs to answer questions about his involvement in this astroturfing campaign. We all must want we want to know also, Mr Acting Deputy President, who was the client? Was it GetUp, who ran a dishonest hospitals funding campaign against the coalition in 2016? Was it the Labor Party? Was it a union? Was it one of these so-called teal independents before they decided to become a teal independent? Was, was Populaires working for this client at the same time as the teals? If it was, copper as seems likely, how does astroturfing sit with the noble aims of his Centre for Impact Communications and its status as a US Section 501c3 tax-exempt charitable organisation. Now, the US has similar laws to Australia regarding charities, and I'm going to be writing to the relevant authorities in the United States bringing the actions of Mr Copper to their, to, to their attention. 
Finally, if it was Mr Cobber, the Teals should justify their relationship with an astroturfer, particularly the member for Oringa, who seems to be especially sensitive about her relationship with Populaires, given her so-called focus on truth and political advertising. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Uh, the Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.